Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining IEEE SPS Forum on Biomedical Signal and Image Processing. Uh, so before we go ahead with the event, I would like to wish all of you a happy Republic Day, uh, 73rd Republic Day. So this is one small gesture from our side uh, to wish happy Republic Day. Having said that, let me share my screen. Yeah, so IEEE Bangalore section and along with the IEEE Signal Processing Society Bangalore chapter and uh, partnered with IEEE Mysore subsection, Mangalore subsection and IEEE North Karnataka subsection, we are organizing this IEEE Signal Processing Society Forum on Biomedical Signal and Image Processing. This is sponsored by IEEE Signal Processing Society as well as uh, we have our annual sponsor of IEEE Bangalore section, which is DOZI. Uh, so we have amazing sessions lined up. So this is a short workshop plus also uh, sessions which you will be seeing. We have uh, a lot of insights which you'll be getting on what is biomedical signal processing, major as well as image processing. Major focus we are doing this year is on AI, artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning. You'll be seeing some tutorials, some demos, as well as uh, some of the contents from all the industry experts. So uh, this is one of the field which has been, we are concentrating. I mean, I and a couple of my colleagues here present here are concentrating from past uh, few years. In 2019, we did a physical event of IEEE uh, Winter School on biomedical signal and image processing. And in 2021, which you can see on the top, uh, we also did again virtual somewhere in uh, March. Uh, where we had again 200 plus participants on IEEE Signal Processing Society Forum on video processing, video and signal uh, processing. And this year we have come back again with IEEE Signal Processing Society Forum on biomedical signal and image processing. So if you see the schedule, we have wonderful speakers. Uh, so we'll have our opening remarks by chair of IEEE Bangalore section, Dr. Deepa Shanai, followed by uh, Shailesh Sakvi, who's chair of IEEE Signal Processing Society Bangalore chapter. Then we have from our sponsors, as well as one of the uh, amazing speaker, Dr. Pawan, who will be talking on contactless vital sensing, a DSP challenge from Dosi Health. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Shiva Teja, uh, who is the principal research scientist at Miramai, who will be talking on AI application for COVID-19 pandemic. What are the things which they have come up, especially there's a nice app which they have come up known as X-ray Setu. And then uh, we have Manoj Shankar, again, one more startup known as Nemo K Wellness, who will be talking about garbage in and garbage out. So how your machine learning models will help, especially in biomedical signals in wearables. We have Srinivas uh, Kundavelli, who is uh, a principal engineering part head of Samsung R&D India in Bangalore, who will be talking about ultrasound image qu quantification, how it evolved from 2D, 3D, and now it is 4D. Uh, later, after a short break, we'll be, uh, uh, we'll be talking in terms of, uh, I'll be giving you a little bit tutorial on machine learning, how you can do. Actually, this session was planned by MathWorks. Uh, unfortunately, there was some, uh, a few of their colleagues were positive, COVID-19 COVID positive. So they have given some slides as well as I'll be sharing my experience on how I did machine learning and how easy it is to do in using some of the tools and how way you can find the data and other things. Uh, next, we have uh, Vivek Singhal, who is co-founder and chief data scientist, CellStart. He'll be talking about his application, what he has developed all over uh, uh, his career, especially being a uh, co-founder of CellStart, which is into uh, AI ML uh, models. Uh, last but not least, we have Manjunath Maya, who is also well-known in the community of biomedical engineering, who is senior uh, project manager at Philips, who will be talking on multidisciplinary clinical innovation for platform for healthcare solutions. After that, we'll have some Q&A sessions, and uh, we'll close it, and we'll call you again for next uh, uh, SPS forum, which will be keeping you posted. But uh, most importantly, this session, we want to be interactive. If you see most of the speakers, unless they're giving tutorial or uh, exhaustive demos, we have kept it only for 30 minutes, where we'll have first uh, 15 minutes uh, or 20 minutes, 20 to 25 minutes, they'll be talking. And then next five minutes, we want to be interactive. So please share your thoughts as well as some of the uh, discussions you want to put on the chat window 
or if you raise your hand, we'll allow you to unmute so that you can talk as well as share your thoughts. Uh, if you have any questions, please reach out through uh, chat window. The next thing I want to mention is again, this event is sponsored by IEEE Signal Processing Society as well as DOSI is our annual sponsor of IEEE Bangalore section. Thanks to all our sponsors for being making this kind of unique events. As I said, we have very well-known speakers in the field and thanks to our organizing team, uh, Dr. Deepa and Shailesh will be talking very soon, but I have Chengapa who took care of uh, curating the website along with Ketan. Then uh, we have a subsection chase, Dr. Purnalata, Dr. Parmesh Achari, and Dr. Basvaraj from Mangalore, Mysore, and North Karnataka subsection, uh, respectively, as well as website was managed by Nagaleka and Rashi, and they're also helping us today, especially Nagaleka, to come up with a, a kind of white paper for this entire session, which we'll be doing, which will be published in uh, IEEE SPS uh, uh, newsletters and others. So with this, this is our uh, event for the day and we are very excited to have you all. With the other 10 minutes, I want our two of our guests who have come and who have been encouraging force for us. So I leave the floor to uh, do opening remarks and I welcome Dr. Deepa Shanai to do the opening remarks. Ma'am, over to you. Yes, uh, <clears throat> good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am, loud and clear. Okay. Uh, good afternoon and uh, thank you Abhishek and team for uh, conducting such a, a wonderful and uh, highly active uh, research area workshop. Uh, this um, signal and uh, image processing of medical data is very, very important according to me and I have supervised uh, many PhD students in this area. And currently, uh, when I was about to uh, talk to my student about uh, uh, this medical data analysis, we contacted uh, uh, KMC Manipal and we wanted to have some MOU and we wanted them to share uh, their data. Uh, the two things which came out of this discussion is very nice. Uh, first one is when we were talking to them, it is very heartening to see that doctors are very well versed with machine learning algorithms. They want their um, data to be analyzed. They are tying up with various software industries so that they can understand the data, analyze the data, and come out with very good uh, insights and results. This, is, this really surprised me when I was talking to them. Second thing is, uh, this is not that good. Uh, when we wanted to take the data, uh, the data is all written in, uh, on paper using pen. That means uh, we still lack that electronic health record uh, uh, platform in India. We are, we are not recording the health uh, data. And if you uh, try to know, New Zealand has 100% uh, EHR data and all the doctors use EHR data only. In India, recently we have started um, uh, in, on August 15 to 2021, uh, our prime minister started this as a pilot project to give one ID, unique ID to each uh, uh, citizen of the country and create, start creating the uh, medical data. And think, I think this will take some time. So uh, medical data is uh, very important. And um, in order to uh, know the problems, disease and give better health and life to uh, the people, we have to do research continuously and uh, very good speakers and uh, very good topics. It is all based on machine learning, AI, and then training on various platforms, how to understand COVID data and all. I'm very fascinated with this uh, uh, topics. I'm going to attend this, but uh, only thing is the outcome of this workshop should be, uh, some of the research students should be in a position to contact the speakers and try to get help, some help from them. Okay, there should be some interaction after that. This should be the outcome of this workshop. This is not just listen to them and forget. They should uh, uh, proceed further to have some interaction and use uh, uh, our help, uh, get the help from the uh, various uh, uh, companies or the speakers so that they can, uh, the research students can carry out the research in a very nice way. Uh, this is my um, thought. And uh, let me also talk about our flagship uh, event, uh, uh, Connect 2022. Uh, Abhishek, if you can uh, project that. 
Yeah, so Ketan. we are conducting the eighth version of uh, Connect 2022 uh, from July 8th to July 10th. And um, already paper submission process has started. We have started uh, um, uh, receiving the papers. And in order to encourage the students, the fees or the registration fee is very, very less uh, for students, uh, all UG, PG and PhD students. It is just 2,500 rupees. And if you submit the papers, full papers, without any updation um, uh, before 20th February and your paper gets uh, selected, you get 40% uh, discount on these fees, not only students, all the authors. And we have early bird uh, registration also. And if you see the tracks, there are uh, 25 tracks this year and uh, your uh, VE signal processing track. So uh, all the interested researchers, if you have done some research, kindly uh, submit uh, your papers and so that uh, you can uh, present in the uh, conference. So uh, let me conclude by saying that when I got very good marks in PUC, my parents wanted me to join medical, but I was not very comfortable. Now I don't repent because I think that it is better to deal with patients' data than the patients themselves. So with this note, uh, I conclude all the best uh, uh, the team SPS uh, forum for conducting this uh, um, uh, workshop. I am going to listen. I'm going to sit through the entire uh, session. Thank you so much for giving me an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, ma'am. It's really fascinating to listen from you as opening remarks. So to endorse what you said, yes, uh, we will be coming out. Uh, so I've requested all the speakers to talk also about any collaborative opportunities or uh, anything similar, which uh, they can give some internship opportunities for our students or sharing of data or something similar. Please, uh, all the speakers, I request them to uh, enlighten our participants. And uh, we have varied kind of participants, not only just students, uh, we also have uh, PhD students, undergrad, postgrad, and also some industry professionals who have joined us. So we have another interesting person who is Shailesh Sakli, who is chair of IEEE uh, Signal Crossing Society chapter of Bangalore. So, sir, over to you for opening remarks. Thank you, Abhishek. Uh, thank you again uh, for organizing uh, this event for another year. So last year also, there was such an event uh, and I did attend a few of them, a few of the sessions. Uh, it was really good. And uh, I'm hoping this year also, it's going to be really, uh, very good, interesting topics that I see over there. So as uh, Deepa Madam was uh, um, talking about all the advancement in the image processing that we have, and there's a lot more to be done. It's, it's not, um, so India is a, a huge, it's a mammoth country. So whenever we take such, such leads, uh, such positions, uh, we end up creating a history, just like all the digitization of the, um, I mean, the UPI, I mean, um, Google Pay, Paytm, that revolutionized the entire world. So believe me, I, I stayed in US uh, for many years and um, the kind, the pace at which India picked up and adopted all these things, it was tremendous to see when, when I came back to India and I saw this everywhere, even an auto rickshaw, even a fruit vendor, everyone were having um, all the UPI payment. In the same way, um, this is going to all the things that are going to come up, the COVID-19 detection or any kind of disease detection. There's a lot that you can do with the image processing that we have. So imagine, I mean, the police, I mean, standing over there on the streets, on the roads, and identifying people who are wearing masks or who are not wearing masks. If we have such analytics, online analytics on how many people are wearing, I mean, if we can uh, penalize them based on uh, someone is not wearing it, uh, not just that, if someone, some cops are even taking a bribes on behalf of that, that also if we can catch hold of it. So there is there's a lot that you can do with this, uh, all the image processing that we have lined up and together uh, blended with all the, I mean, uh, any of the audio analytics or sensor technologies together with the image processing. I mean, this, there's no limit to what you can do over here. So I think this is a right forum over here. 
um, where we have all the industrial experts who are going to share about all the advancements that are going to that are happening in this domain. And then what else can we do um, to, uh, I mean, to prevent or to even advance it? Like Deepa Madhav was saying that the medical records, they are not on, um, I mean, the, they are not properly channelized within India. So that is one thing. If, if you have the medical records, the kind of analysis that you can do in the background based on what you get or you go and analyze somewhere. So there's, there's a lot that you can do. So uh, I think uh, this is a very good initiative um, of uh, starting this, these kind of forums where you openly come and discuss the latest advancements together with uh, all, I mean, I see many people have registered and uh, I don't want to take uh, much time on this. Uh, so thank you again for uh, giving me an opportunity um, to briefly talk about this uh, over to your vision. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Shailesh, uh, for encouraging words. I I'm sure it will be helpful. As you said, uh, the field is very vast and there's a lot of research opportunities still exist for us to ponder in this workshop or this uh, forum. So having said this, let's uh, deep dive into the first session. We have uh, Pawan, Pawan Kaushik, Dr. Pawan Kaushik, who is uh, from Dozi Health, who is also our sponsor. So, uh, Dozi is our uh, ELE sponsor. So uh, Pawan is a wonderful man. I've been interacting with him from a couple of uh, months. And uh, thanks a lot, Pawan. You just recovered and uh, you're with us. And he loves to tinker from robots to insects. Uh, during his PhD, he built uh, a multimodal virtual reality combining vision, olfaction, and wind to disrupt the decision process in insects. Uh, at Dozi, he was in the innovations team. He is in the innovations team, interfacing hardware, software, and data science to push the boundaries of contactless uh, vital sensing. So this is a little bit about Pavan. And Pavan, the floor is for you, and we are looking forward for your session. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hello? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, Pawan, please go ahead. Yeah. And audience, uh, uh, just before we go on to the first session, there are some emojis which you can use. Uh, you can see at the bottom of your screen uh, to encourage our uh, speakers to know that we are understanding what the speakers are trying to say. And second thing is, if you have questions, as I said, please post it on the chat box. Yeah, thanks, Pawan. Over to you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see, we can okay. hear you. Awesome. Hi, I am Pawan, uh, and today I'll talk about contactless vital sensing and why it's a huge digital signal processing challenge. So, but before we begin, let's go back earliest. Uh, this is the earliest record of vital science, that, uh, and Gilgamesh, which is the uh, one of the earliest hero epics of any written record. He says, when his dearest friend Enkidu is no more, he says, "I touch his heart, but it does not beat at all," and this is the onset of civilization, how we know when someone is alive and dead and we are on record. And this is important because I won't stress upon how why medical care is challenging as we are blazing through another wave of pandemic right now. I don't want to make you feel more worse about it, but it is a challenge. And our traditional way of dealing with healthcare traditionally is retroactive healthcare. And what do I mean by that? You have a healthy person and they start falling sick. Uh, and they have some symptoms which they show. And what we do is we uh, go do some tests in a hospital and based on the results, we do interventions. It is okay, it is fine, it works, but more often than not, it's too late. It's too often too late. And by the time you realize it, nothing much can be done. On the other hand, proactive healthcare is something different. What we have, you have a healthy person, they're constantly being monitored for their vitals and other cues like heart rate, breathing rate, heart rate variability, their blood sugar on a regular basis over long term. And whenever uh, we realize that you know these vitals are crashing or they're deteriorating, they go to a hospital and do uh, like a, a gold standard test and see what's wrong, and then they get medical care and interventions. Here, what happens is you catch them early. So when it's much simpler and much more uh, easier to deal with and you save many more lives and that's the way of proactive healthcare. But the problem with proactive healthcare is you can't ask everyone when they sleep at home to put wires on them and sleep. It's simply not feasible or get them pricked on a daily basis. 
And that's the need for contactless sensing because traditional sensing of continuous monitoring is you have a lot of wires um, measuring your heart rate, breathing rate, PPG, and it's really inconvenient. And you can't do this alone. You need a, a medical profession like a nurse, someone who puts it back on you. It's challenging. The other aspect of this is you have something called white coat syndrome. What I mean by the white coat syndrome is when relatively healthy patients, when they see doctors and medical professionals in their traditional uniform, they start getting they start getting anxious and they lose their calm. And more often than not, you have, they will have an elevated BP, even though they have they are not hypertensive patients. So this, along with very limited access to continuous monitoring at home, is the strong need for contactless sensing. So imagine in a world where you can take a person who's relatively healthy, continuously monitor them day in and day out without having any bias and without touching them ever. Uh, that's what we do at Dozy. So we have our sensors under the mattress and the subject sweeps over it every day. So we get like at least eight hours of consistent solid data in the same posture, same position. And when we feel like this person is crashing or they need a medical intervention soon, we send them to the doctors and the doctors will do high quality tests and do it. So that's our paradigm. And how this works is something called the ballistocardiograph. So to give you a, a sort of a douse in history, this is the first ever ballistocardiograph uh, in 1877. As you can see, it's really hard. It was on a, a carbon suited uh, drum and scratched with a fine needle. And it was very tricky. And this itself was a a pinnacle of engineering back then. And this predates ECG by a couple of years. So that's how old this is. And it is done like something like this. You have a person sleeping on a thing. So to give you a perspective, your weight, if you say is 67 kilograms, it's not really 67 kilograms. If we measure it in an extremely precise weighing scale, it's 67 kilograms plus or minus a few micrograms. You're constantly fluctuating. And these micrograms are coming because when your heart pounds, the blood gushes in and gushes out. And all of that causes a few vibrations, which a very precise weighing scale can pick up. But this is more than a century ago. So they have a person sleeping on a huge, uh, uh, something like a swing, which is hanging by piano wires. And any subtle vibrations are magnified by these lever and screw systems and they're scratched on the drum. And that's how they recorded this. And they recorded a lot of these microgram murmurs, that's what I call it. And they could quantify the ballistics of blood flow. Remember, this is pen and paper and figuring out like how many microns moving in headward direction means how much liters of or milliliters of blood moved in what velocity downward. So they all do all these area under the curve and differentials of these curves and figure out which is the systole region, which is the diastole region, how is your heart functioning. But the challenge is uh, it's a very intricate piece of equipment. So it's precision photography and you have to spend one hour in calibrating and aligning all of them and you get probably about 10 to 20 seconds of data. And again, when the person moves a little bit, like a few millimeters, the calibration is fully gone because you're measuring such small changes. You have to do this entire calibration again. So it's really, really challenging to even get data, but it provides data which no other device can. But the it fell its device, uh, demise because by the 1980s, 1970s, ECG was this tiny box uh, which could record uh, uh, remotely on site in the middle of nowhere with wires and you could do it and you can see the number of publications over time and BCG just was no longer there because ECG did the job and it was far more easier to just take electrodes relatively uh, rather than spending one hour in a calibration. But right now it's a research because um, with sensors and internet of things and artificial intelligence what was before elaborate balancing act with these fine levers machines can do it much better and much easier. And that's why we have a rebirth of uh, ballistocardiography world over. And we at here at Dozy are at the pinnacle of this, of achieving this. And we provide a huge variety of vitals of heart rate, breathing rate, uh, without ever touching the patient contactlessly. And how we do it, I'll give you a brief sense of it. And this is where we enter the signal processing front. So this is how roughly the waveform looks like, the green line. but it's squiggly, you have a lot of noise, and when someone moves, when they snore, um, when they turn around, when they get up, 
all of the, and when they talk, there's a huge vibration because we are measuring micrograms and we delete them using elaborate signal processing techniques of seeing when it's above a threshold, when, when we look at its uh, uh, spectral quality and all of them have white noise behavior. So we delete all of those. After cleaning all these dirty bits of sound, what we do is we again uh, use a bandpass filter because what happens is you not when you breathe, you have respiration which is going up and down and also have this lub dub lub dub motion. So we do a lot of signal processing filtering to get the relevant features. And for us, what we've realized is the 10 to 15 has nice features. We do that and we get something like this from the raw signal. We get, we do K-means clustering. And the reason why I have to directly go from signal processing to uh, ML kind of approaches is if you see the waveform, it's not the same. Your each heartbeat is different. And when the patient turns left, the shape of the heartbeat is completely different. It doesn't even look the same. And it's not like these ECGs where you have an need clear spike like this. So it's not easy to uh, catch using rather some squint trigger or a threshold bait, uh, based uh, peak detection. It's rather challenging because you have like so many peaks. Now, which is your heartbeat peak, which is your other peak, it's tricky. And that's where ML solves the challenges, which is hard by signal processing is we look at each supposed peak and we cluster them uh, using K-means clustering and figure out which is the most tightest in the well-behaved cluster where most of the beats are. And we see that this is the well-behaved beat and we do this every five minutes because patients keep moving all the time. And we find these beats back onto this and figure out where the heart is beating. We call this the J peak. That's how the labels are, like how ECG has PQRS, we have IJK. And we get these peaks and these are essentially the heartbeats. Now measuring the interval and dividing by 60, we easily get number of beats per minute. We get heart rate variability, uh, RR intervals. We get all of this by doing these uh, marriage of signal processing and machine learning. Now this, with this, what we can achieve is we can even catch a skipped heartbeat. You can see like you have a simultaneous ECG and BCG recording and sometimes heartbeat skips and we can catch it. And as you can see, this is the power, right? You're skipping a heartbeat besides falling in love is, it doesn't happen often, it happens rather rare. It doesn't happen once every five minutes, it happens uh, sporadically. And when you go to a, a hospital or a, a diagnostics, it's, there's no guarantee that on that spot check, you will have a missed beat. And there are so many different kinds of arrhythmia, not just one, and there's no guarantee you will catch that. But if you monitor this long enough, like over days and days and months, it's very likely that if you have something wrong, you'll actually pick up all of these things. And you can actually see if the frequency of these are increasing. And that's where uh, Dozy excels. And that's for the heart rate. Now we can also do on the breathing rate. And the breathing signal, also, as you can see, is rather challenging. So this is how the breathing signal is. It's like a bimodal, humpy shaped a curve. And traditional zero crossing triggers will basically have way too many points. Sometimes you have two, sometimes you have three, sometimes you have four. It's very challenging using traditional approaches. On top of that, when you have sleep apnea, which is many uh, healthy individuals do while they're sleeping, they literally stop breathing. And for a moment, they're not breathing. And then they suddenly <gasps> get up and continue breathing. And that's one of the characteristic uh, features of sleep apnea. And when that happens, we can't pick up respiration rate. And it's important to pick up sleep apnea. It's a rather um, serious concern when patients over time. So how we approach this is we figure out all the peaks, whether they are double peaks or single peaks, pick up all the peaks, and then we send this, uh, all these individual patterns. Again, we k-means cluster all these uh, peaks and valleys and figure out how they tightly cluster in and find the relevant maximas, which are well-behaved and tight. And these are now essentially the respiration cycles, the respiration ticks and we measure the respiration tick intervals in short time intervals and we get essentially respiration rate and we do a very good job so if you compare our respiration rate against industry standards of respiration state be it nasal airflow or chest rib belt or abdomen rib belt we match pretty well our accuracy is in the order of 95 percent to 94.9 percent so and and it's already, um, be, it, all of these research is prior published and that's what I've shown you right now. We have a high quality breathing rate and respiration, which we're tracking right now. And you can see how it has been your previous night, how it's been the past one week and how it's been the past one month. What's your average? We get all of this on an app where the person doesn't even know, they don't even see the 
a dozy sheet, they are sleeping on it and they get all of this. On top of this, we are also now seeing when they went to sleep, when they got up of sleep and their, their sleep duration and how their stress has been. Stress here is uh, based on heart rate variability where you know when uh, by measuring heart rate variability we get an index of stress when you're stressed your heart rate is heart less variable so we get all of this and our, our customers have access to all of this data this is the state of the art which we have already right now what we are pushing right now is much beyond whatever exists so this is the myocardial functioning of the heart is what you see uh, below is the ECG, the echocardiogram of the heart of literally the blood gushing in and gushing out. And this requires a very trained technician who has many years of expertise to actually get such a clear signal. Generally, you don't get such a clear signal of the blood gushing in and gushing out. That's what you see, this is Doppler shifts. At the same time, you have the synchronized uh, BCG curve, which is the dozy signal, uh, the ballistocardiography. And you can see it sort of correlates well. And you can see when the blood gushes out, we have a high signal and the blood is relaxing, you get back. But it's really hard to do any of these echocardiography in entire three cities and villages or in a PHC. It doesn't exist. And uh, you can't ask everyone to just go to a PH, uh, city and get it done. So imagine a world where a dozy is there in every PHC and everyone there comes once a month, just sleeps on it for like 10 minutes and goes. And using AI and ML, we can figure out if someone is likely to crash or someone something is wrong or something is not wrong. If we feel like, look, this person might have something, we can ask just them particularly, uh, refer them to a city or a, a nearby uh, place where there is a, a, a easy, um, echocardiogram and actually get them tested. So it's like a pre-screening and early warning system to catch people much before they fall sick. And this is not a new thing. If I go back to the old papers, in the 1939s, uh, Isaac Starr and colleagues, what they did is they measured the resting heart rate when someone is just resting on the bed. And then they made them do exercise and increase their blood pressure in the heart rate. And you can see this, and that's why they got this upper exercise. You can clearly see uh, the interbeat, for example, is closer, it's much tighter. That's increase in heart rate, essentially. You have more beats per unit time. On top of that, you can see it's much higher and taller. You have much more blood coming in each cycle. So your blood is, a uh, heart is working really hard to pump out blood and they calculate all of this. But again, if you remember what I said, they spend one hour in calibration, they have to quickly make sure when they do exercise and come back, they're in the same portion and try their best. And their entire data of this paper is literally these two slides. That's how hard this is. It's impressive, but really, really challenging. And they even calculate things like stroke volume, which are critical to uh, like assess how exactly heart is functioning. And they measure this with BCG and they measure this with uh, ETA level, which is the state of the art back then around uh, more than half a decade ago. And it matches pre pretty well. But the problem is doing this is really hard. Now imagine what we can do. Now we are building something called ultra fast BCG where we have extremely high spatial and temporal resolution. And we look at beat by beat. And if you see carefully, this is, um, let me see if I can get a pointer. Can get a pointer. Yes, can you see my pointer? Yes, a thumbs up would do the job. It's fine. So, uh, so this is the systole, the blood gushing in. And then you have the blood gushing back slowly, but from different uh, regions. And that's not synchronized. The blood gushing out is synchronous. So it's a very neat, tight curve. The gushing out happens at asynchronously and you can have these murmurs and these high frequency noise. And by quantifying uh, the, uh, the different spectral behavior of how different, uh, by using Fourier transforms, we can get a sense of how their heart is behaving in an individual beat, when the valve opened, when the valve closed, the timing of all of these relatively, how tight has these timing behavior been. And imagine doing this over like millions of heartbeats because you're doing over many, many months and years. And you can see when the heart is gradually falling and tell them, look, your heart is trying to fall, adjust your lifestyle, go to a medical professional and see what is wrong. And that's what we want to achieve, which is without ever being in contact with the patient. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, what I've just talked about right now. That is, we have vitals monitoring and alert system, which I described. We also coming soon as daily alert cards. We uh, like, how has your previous night's sleep been? And we are also now measuring blood pressure without ever 
being in contact with the patient and apnea, which is what I would like the, <gasps> the sudden uh, loss of breath uh, by the body. We are also now on the medical trials of how heart failure happens by basically, as I showed, right? We do the echo in the hospitals and see how their echo is in uh, in the OPD department and comparing with the dosing. And we are classifying sleeps into detailed breakdown into REM sleep and deep sleep. And, and further on, we are right now in R&D of arrhythmia, like because it's not a simple thing of just beat missing. It's a very different nuanced thing. It's a challenging problem. And we want to see how your blood flow has been. Like you, you have a blood clot over there. Imagine measuring the ballistic forces all through your body and seeing if you have any blood clot only near your thigh or near your um, hand and see if you have any tremors and serious seizures when you're asleep and how much effort you're putting while you're breathing. All of these are in the right now possible, which is not possible before because getting data and making sense of it uh, of such a large population was simply not possible. But now with IoT and cloud, we can do it. And we have many publications, uh, all of them in esteemed journals about many of the things which I've spoken about right now. So now if you go back and step back a bit, as I said, like if Gilgamesh in, in 2600 BC would say, I touch his heart, but it does not beat at all. But now imagine if we could, comes back to 2022, he would say, I do not touch his heart, but those he says, his heart is sick. And that's the sort of thing we are talking about, of figuring out people and saving lives uh, in a continuous fashion of many, many people. Thank you. And this is not a work of one person, it's the entire team by many, many people who make this possible. And we also have ongoing collaboration with BMS, where many students are interning with us and building many of the things which we talk about future R&D pipeline right now as we speak. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask and you can also contact us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pavan. So do we have any questions from the audience? You can post it or you can unmute and ask. You can raise your hand with Lalo, you can unmute. Yeah, there is someone who has raised their hand. Yeah. Sibini. Yes, uh, myself, yeah, uh, myself, Professor Triveni Prashad Banerjee from uh, West Bengal. Uh, uh, Praveen, uh, it's very nice to see you and uh, very nice presentations actually. Uh, thanks uh, for the uh, opportunity, IEEE sections, Bangalore sections. As a member of IEEE uh, Signal Processing Society, it's a privilege for me that I'll be uh, part of this actually. So very uh, nice presentation. <coughs> uh, I just want to ask one question, uh, Praveen, please, that uh, is there uh, how we are finding this nodes actually? How we, as you are saying that <coughs> this is a clustering, clustering technology. Probably you are uh, uh, giving something. So real time data has to be monitored uh, every each and times. So people, so those are actually in that positions. Uh, in suppose uh, sudden peaks are coming. So you know very well that if some heart, uh, certain heart those are actually the heart problems if there uh, has some regular interventions is going on due to the monitoring systems so if the person is coming a uh, uh, little bit of breathing problems are we getting that informations in our is the systems can it be possible for detect <clears throat> those minimum uh, rate that is the incipient types of uh, Incipient types of signals fluctuations. Incipient fluctuations of the signal. Is it possible to be recovered from there? Is there any technology is there that we can uh, get it uh, a reverse of that incipient fault? Is there if there's a fault signals is has to be classified this fault signal as well as the real signals? Is there any classifications technology is there or? Is there, it is already been, uh, it is only that uh, capturing the real data and just <clears throat> taking into account of matching the data. That is that I want to know. Can I questions as clear or? Yeah, like, 
so can you summarize in a sentence like uh, the part which is unclear because uh, you made valid points about uh, challenges during fluctuations but if you can tell what was the question uh, question is great. basically is there that signal that i are capturing real time uh, is there if that fluctuations is that as a incipient types of faults is occur somehow incipient faults means that is the suppose we are uh, gathering the data that data has to be uh, if i matching the data that i as per your presentation i understand little bit that uh, we are matching the data signal data with the uh, with our match patterns probably no uh, no 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 exactly so that's not really true we are not really doing template matching because of the very fact that bcg is so variable it's so sensitive that if you're heavy if you're light if you're a thick mattress if you're a thin mattress all of them will affect the shape of the signal we can pick up from a 18 inch mattress to a 1 inch yoga mat so it and the point of the shape is different if you're heavy and if you're supine posture if you're sleeping left all of them will change so we are not doing any template match that's exactly where ml comes in and it finds out what is the most common template which is there that's where the k means clustering comes in we figure out the most common pattern in that 5 minute or in that a uh, small brief window because even that changes over time of a single patient and so it's not really template matching so we capture how that uh, template is at that point in time and figure out the heart rate and the breathing rate so we are not doing any template matching we are getting the templates instantaneously live on the cloud every 5 minutes or yeah. uh, at different time intervals yeah pavan we yeah. have lot of questions sure. as well as so i'll start uh, prioritizing it Sure. and i request who are unmute please uh, be very precise so we'll go with shrinivas and then with uh, some of the questions in the chat sure please shrinivas uh, please uh, yeah hi pavan this is shrinivas here very good presentation so in the in the past when i worked with the philips research uh, the entire idea is that uh, um, when you say heart sounds or murmurs the language which used by the cardiologist is that s3 s4 sounds uh, does it relate to you because i didn't hear that terminology being uh, elucidated yeah. here so the challenges we face is to detect this s3 s4 sounds and categorize them as mitral valve prolapse or mitral valve regurgitation could you touch up on that because i missed out in this story yeah great question so uh, there it was my uh, liberty to use murmurs so it's not the technical medical terms murmurs which doctors use it's not that uh, you're right that was just an alliteration of m uh, the thing is we we don't measure near field sounds we measure something called the far field sounds we are we are like in many cases 6 inch below the mantle so we'll never get the near field sounds of what you're talking about but that's exactly where we are working progress we go closer to the subject and have a high resolution sensor and all through the body so that's the hope that we can pick up those features so when you see these slides for example you can if you observe carefully a uh, consistent motifs of valve opening and valve closing of when it happens and it happens so we have these very high frequency small energy but uh, features which you can pick up so we are it's a, still a active r and d process to figure out all of those but we'll never be as close to a stethoscope simply because that's directly in contact we want to be also contactless we don't want to affect their comfort as a sleep on a daily basis so you may say like look there's so many tons of spo2 and watches which do it all the time so how are we any different the difference here is enforcement you i am not right now not wearing a watch despite having a fitbit it's simply because i forgot to charge it today and that happens all the time we are humans with this you just sleep and it works enforcement is not a challenge so they don't have to worry about it that's the key reason why we are trying to stay away from contact because it becomes challenging in terms of getting data for long times yeah thanks pravan thanks uh, so we have few more questions let's do more like a rapid fire round so does the person need to lie down or even sitting is possible uh pavan you are muted so lying down works best uh sitting works subpar it's not optimal but lying okay. is the best can it be Line fixed up. on the backrest of a chair that's connected question i guess we do we do get that data it does work uh, we even patients when they have they sleep on an incline they are not always sleeping all the time we do get data uh, if you keep it under your hip also we get data ideally it's lying down but we also get data when it's on an incline it's possible okay there is very very generic question from shweta i'm a research scholar uh, karnatak uh, nice presentation sir how to analyze eeg data it's very generic i don't know how to answer it, how you will there are many many courses out there which will do it you have to understand a good understanding of how the brain works how the body works 
and at the same time how signal processing happens so okay. it's not a short answer sorry yeah uh, if a person this is from sayed if a person who tends to have a lot of sleep movement how does that affect the accuracy and result of the device assuming a lot of noise signals a great question so if there's a lot of motion we can't pick up so it's standard signal to noise ratio if there is motion there is no way we'll pick up the heart's beat we won't but we can actually quantify how much you're moving in the night like how much of restlessness you have we actually have something called the restlessness index of what fraction of time are you moving so that's also a key number so that suggests that something's wrong with your body that you're moving all the time in the night so we won't get data in the movement period but before and after movement we do get the data okay the next question is from am khan does the environ i guess environment have any impact on the data how should be the region where data is collected so uh, since it's sort of a sealed environment temperature and pressure doesn't really affect us that much at all what changes mostly is as the previous question about the subject's motion itself and if there's any vibration in something for example some people are on an air bed if the compressor uh, is on the bed then our noise is clouded but in general most people don't have air bed so it's not a problem so uh, general sorts of vibrations if it's not present you're fine yeah makes sense uh, the last but one question is which sensor do you use what is the distance so we work at a variety of distances from less than a centimeter to up to 18 inches so it's a huge thing uh, uh sensors we use uh, piezoelectric uh, sensors to do the job okay uh shashikala who has raised hand she has a question which says can there be possibility of auto correction if there are minor irregularities or smart contactless can we call it a smart contactless belt uh what do you or mean sensor? by correction that wasn't clear like uh shashikala you want to unmute and quickly ask that Shashikala, yeah. Shashikala, we can't yeah. hear you. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think you are able to hear me now. Yeah. Uh, first, uh, congratulations, uh, Pavan, uh, uh, Professor Pavan. Wonderful uh, presentation and take care of your health first. That's what I heard. And uh, second, uh, what I'm trying to uh, uh, question uh, over here is. if at all there is irregularity if at all there is not time to rush for anyone uh, for uh, immediate correction to be done is there any possibility for you to uh, know the possibility for uh, any minor uh, precautions to be taken or anything can you use anything related to uh, some instructions over there uh, for yeah. smart monitor yeah so now this is where automation is taking over the job of the human and we don't want to do that we are not doctors the device can't be doctors and we don't prefer ai is telling what the patient should do we only uh, do what humans can uh, humans can't do best which is data logging and the ehr all of those things is what machines can do best we log those we send the data providing care telling what to do next that's something which doctors do best and we should not take their positions because machines can't do that job so we let the doctors do what they are good at and we just record the data and give it to them so that's what we do we try and we generally don't go into the suggestions of what to do next yeah thank you, thank you. Thank you. thanks yeah thank you ma'am so pavan uh, i have two quick question which you should answer in few words so what is false positive rate by dr oh. suhail yeah so it, it depends on the feature we are looking at our false positive rate um, it's actually quite tight in heart rate and um, uh, breathing rate it's like less than uh, 2% or 3% we are very tight in those cases because it's also a continuous number it's not a category so and does that answer your question if we yeah, are yeah. quite tight in these things uh, we have so, prior papers also will tell you this next is rakshit is asking how is the identification process of the patient done because anyone can sleep on the bed need not be the patient himself right that's yeah. a great question yeah. as of now we can't we can't tell if a patient a or patient b is sleeping uh, uh, because fingerprint we are still working on approach of fingerprinting where we can tell if this patient a or patient b as of now since we are mostly in a medical setting and it's a one person bed it doesn't matter this is the patient the medical professional says this is the patient and we just deal with it we don't try to guess who is the patient yeah we can't do it right now short answer yeah So thanks a lot, Pawan. I <coughs> I guess there will be even more some more questions. That's what I requested all our speakers to be short, so that more discussions. I'm really loving all the sessions until now. Yeah. So uh, Ketan, 
yeah so thanks a lot pavan this is a small token of appreciation from us and as well as something physical will come to your doorstep so thanks a lot for giving us a very good insight and many of them are liking and uh, i want our audience to show the emojis also there is clap and there is thumbs up everything so please use that very judiciously and very you know as much as you can Yeah. uh thanks a lot papa yeah. and also feel free to contact us if you need anything any internship please uh, feel free my email id is there pavan@dozi.help so feel free to contact us yeah thanks a lot papa so next we have uh, next uh, speaker uh, which is uh, dr shivatej kali uh, kakileti uh, he is speaker for our previous sps forum as well as winter school so he is a principal research scientist at niramai health analytics so uh dr sivtej uh, he is having 7 plus years of experience in aml for medical imaging he is one of the founding members and principal research scientist at niramai co-authored 18 plus international publications two book chapters and 16 international granted patents seven in us as well as nine in india wow he was a recipient of dad wise fellowship 2014 and offered uh, mitax global inc fellowship in 2014 granted phd degree by fhml uh, of a master's university in the netherlands and uh, he has his btech from uh, iit guwahati prior to niramai he worked in the healthcare analytics group at xerox research center india as a budding scientist for one and a half year so uh, shivtej over to you and we are excited to listen to you again Thanks, Dr. Abhishek, for the introduction. So, let me share the screen. Can you see the screen? Yeah, yeah, we can see. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the IEEE Signal Processing uh, Society for giving me this opportunity to present on this topic. So, I'm Sivateja. I'm principal research scientist at Nirama Health Analytics. Today, I would be briefly talking about uh, different artificial intelligence solutions which we developed at Nirama for the COVID-19 pandemic. So, I'll be covering about uh, three main solutions which we have developed. First one is um, the breast cancer screening at home. Second one is X-ray Setu, which is an AI-based chest X-ray interpretation uh, system using WhatsApp. and third one is fever test which deals with automated covid-19 screening breast cancer is one of the leading cause of cancer deaths among women all over the world if you see the statistics every year approximately 600000 women lose their lives to this disease and when you see the statistics in countries like india 160000 women were diagnosed in 2018 and 50% lost their lives so the survival rate is uh, merely 50% early detection is always key to the survival at niramai what we have done was um, in order to develop a solution that would put our uh, countries like uh, india we come up with a low cost affordable uh, thermal imaging based solution with this solution we can detect cancers much before a lump is felt it is non contact non invasive and privacy aware which means we don't have to touch the patient we don't have to see the patient at the same time we don't use any kind of harmful radiation which could again uh, increase the chance of uh, breast cancer unlike uh, the traditional imaging which has limitations of age and uh, this solution can even work for women of all ages and it's portable and it can be carried uh, in a backpack and we have done a lot of screening camps uh, going to rural locations so with this technology we have uh, close to 24 international uh, patents and um, there are 10 us granted patents as well on this technology but uh, with covid-19 it has devastated the healthcare so what we have seen in covid-19 is that the number of people who are going for health checkups or number of walk-ins into hospitals has significantly reduced which means uh, there is there are high chances that we detect the cancers in later stages even with uh, without covid itself the mortality rate is 50% so with these uh, less screenings the numbers are expected to go worse so what we thought was can we come up with some solution which could help the patients who really uh, required the diagnosis 
instead of going coming to hospitals, can we reach their homes and then do the screening at home? So that way, the idea of home screening has uh, evolved. But one of the main challenge is that if the patient is walking into a hospital, we have a control on the environment. We have control on the imaging. But when we're going and visiting uh, a patient's home, there are many environment variables. So we thought how we can make sure the images which we capture are proper for analysis. So for that, um, we had worked on different quality checks so that this ensures the imaging is proper as well as guides the technician for proper image capture. So one such common problem which we have seen uh, in the field is that in breast thermography, uh, which is nothing but the temperature values uh, that emits from the human body, for uh, detection of cancers, we have uh, we usually capture five images as one view alone is not sufficient uh, to capture the entire heat pattern. We capture these five views. So many times what happens is uh, the technician, when they are saving these images, they will label this image as right breast, even though it is the left breast of the image. So this would cause uh, in inaccurate uh, report analysis. So we have developed uh, a simple deep learning architecture. We have used a pre-trained ResNet architecture as a baseline model. And then we use our in-house thermal images data set uh, with the help of transfer learning. We try to identify the view directly from the image. So what, uh, in any case, uh, the technician uploads or labels these images uh, incorrectly. Now this architecture will tell them that uh, these images are incorrectly labeled and if they want to auto-correct it. So that is what uh, we have introduced. The second one is uh, the, uh, another common error is the focus. Because this is a thermal camera, focus is important to get the actual temperature values. On the left-hand side, you can see an unfocused image. On the right-hand side, you can see a focused image. As you can see, the unfocused image is might not be good for analysis. Whereas focused image, uh, we can see the accurate blood vessel structures or the um, high thermal heat patterns. So, so we thought, can we identify whether the image is focused or not? So if you see, when we do simple edge-based detection like Sobel operator or canny edge detection uh, techniques, if it is an unfocused image, we will see the edges of the body are disconnected. Whereas if it is a focused image, the image will have sharp boundaries. So we have a sharper boundaries for the body contours. So using this simple logic, we had come up with a focus classifier, which tells whether the image is focused enough or um, it is not good for analysis. Another um, quality check or another aid for the technician, what we have developed is a segmentation of breast region. So these are the images which uh, we capture typically in the field. And since we are focused on the cancers in the breast region, we need to segment this breast region before the analysis. So if you ask the technicians to crop, it is uh, more subjective and also sometimes erroneous. So what we have thought is can be automated. But the challenge with automation is that we don't see any strict boundaries. Though we see the body contours um, of the breast, but we don't clearly see any contour on the upper boundary or the side boundary of the breast region. So for this, uh, we have trained a deep learning architecture by feeding the actual images and the corresponding breast region as the output. We have used a VNet architecture, which is similar to UNet uh, encoder decoder architecture. And then we have trained this architecture. So when we used a custom loss function, um, we got a result. Uh, we got the results which are very close to human expert. Because what happens is, even if you ask uh, the human expert to crop, two human experts to crop the breast region, person A will crop uh, one region, person B will crop another region. So when we had given 100 images to both these persons, and then when we measured the dice index, which basically tells the similarity between these cro uh, cropped regions, we found the similarity is only 91%. And when we measured uh, this deep learning architecture performance uh, with respect to the human segmented uh, breast regions, the dice index is also around 91%. So 
So this tells us uh, whatever the architecture has learned, it has similar performance as human expert. So these three quality checks has gained us uh, enough confidence to release uh, into the field. We released the service in the mid of 2021. And till now we have done 200 plus home screenings in Delhi and Bengaluru. And we have identified 20 potential women who needed further follow-up for um, breast cancer checkups. So this is one uh, application on how AI has helped in bridging the gap um, between the patient and the healthcare uh, service, which is required in uh, during COVID-19. The second such use case is X-ray Setu. 65% of uh, Indian population live in rural areas where there is no access to expert uh, radiologists or where there are no access to proper artificial labs. So in most scenarios during the COVID first wave and second wave, the artificial test is often delayed. And it is also less reliable with variants. And during this uh, delay, doctors are confused what kind of treatment they have to give to the patient. And it is also observed that critical COVID cases affect the lung regions. And early intervention can reduce the need for ICU or the need for O2. And that since we're talking about rural India, we need to also check, um, develop some solutions which are accessible and easy to use uh, for these uh, criteria. So for that reason, we have developed this AI-based uh, chest X-ray interpretation system via WhatsApp. So brief uh, video I just play. Just let me know if you can hear the audio. For some reason, it is not playing, but let me go to the. So, this is developed uh, in association with the uh, Park, Niramai, and IASC. So, the solution is uh, simple. So, when a, um, when a radiologist gets an x ray, so they will be capturing the image using the mobile phone and they WhatsApp to our uh, XSA to WhatsApp number. Um, and this will be directly sent to technician who would do the review. So this is aided by um, some of the automated steps, which I will be describing uh, briefly in the later slides. And once this uh, review is done, this is sent to the AI analysis. And the AI analysis will interpret the image, X-ray images and generate the probability of COVID along with other radiological findings and the suspicious locations as well. Once this is done, this would be directly sent to a doctor. So this way, uh, this service, uh, we made it that, make sure that um, the report will be given to doctor within 15 to 30 minutes. So this helps in immediate and faster diagnosis for the patient. But in order to build uh, such a system, there are challenges. Because when we, when we started, we only had very few data sets and these data sets uh, doesn't include any of the Indian population. So we had to um, create a solutions uh, which using uh, different international data sets as well as in-house COVID data set. The other challenge is since we are using WhatsApp as the source of data, WhatsApp has an inbuilt compression system which reduces or which compresses the images. So we had to make sure that with this compression also, our results would be accurate. And because of low data, one of the common problem would be overfitting with the training data set. So how can we develop such an accurate AI system, even with small data sets is uh, one thing which uh, was very challenging. 
and it is not important it is not sufficient to simply say whether the patient had covid positive or not but we need to identify where the probable infection region is as well as other radiological findings um, which would help the doctor in taking a decision so these are the main uh, problems which we had and to solve this we had used a deep multitask learning model so as you can see on this uh, right hand side it consists of three architectures with resnext as the baseline architecture so these three tasks what you are seeing are solving three different problems the first task what you can see here uh, it solves the problem of classifying the x ray image into 15 classes including covid 19 and the second task talks about classifying the image into pneumonia and non pneumonia as well as the where is the pneumonia region and the third task talks about classifying whether the image has viral pneumonia or bacterial pneumonia or it is completely normal for all these classification tasks the baseline architecture is resnex 101 since these are three different tasks with three different ground truth we can leverage the available x ray data set it doesn't have to be whether the patient has covid or not it can be any kind of uh, lung data um, just x ray data set all we need is uh, some kind of baseline features which would be useful because essentially what we are trying to do is we are trying to interpret an x ray image so this resnext uh, 101 acts as a source of giving a good features for different classification tasks so when we trained this architecture with three different uh, data sets and three different tasks so we ended up uh, getting good results on covid-19 at the same time since we are there is one task which is automatically predicting the probable infection regions it has helped us in better localization of where are the infections so once we get this architecture gives us the probabilities of uh, different uh, lung infections but the next task is how we can localize where is the source of this infection so for that we have used class activation maps so we have taken this uh, probabilities and then we have back propagated to see which which pixels in the image contribute to the decision most with that we are able to localize uh, close to 15 uh, lung abnormalities and these lung abnormalities are generated as a part of report and shared with the doctor so that when they look at this x ray they have an assistance ai assistance uh, which could uh, help us in taking confident decision so this is one such use case of uh, um, class activation map as you can see in this image the radiologist has marked this green region as the potential source of uh, potential uh, covid-19 infection region and the annotation generated by the accessory system highlights this red color region which is close to what the radiologist has marked as the probable infection region so this one of the main reason which we have seen uh, this happening is because of multitask learning so when we had learned directly from the covid-19 uh, data itself the explainability results were not that great because the data was slightly overfitting to the data and the predictions what we predicted are completely outside the lung region but because we have trained with different data sets which are of different sizes the learning is better at the same time the explainability was better and even we use this uh, bounding box uh, coordinates that also has helped us in predicting the region better so when we tested this on an open source covid-19 data set it has resulted in a sensitivity of 98.86% that is we hardly missed uh, only one case in 100 um, positive cases and specificity of 74.74% we had an aoc of 0.9316 and we also tested if um, the low resolution whatsapp image is uh, causing any issue or not so we have taken a data set we have passed through whatsapp and then check the results and 
we hadn't uh, seen any change in the AUC or the explainability of the algorithm. And when we had uh, looked at the subclass accuracy, even that was uh, the results were very encouraging. It has a mean accuracy of 74%. This is over 14 classes and a sensitivity of 75.37, specificity of 74.48 and an AU ROC of 81% we had. Now the inference is one part, but before going to inference, there are uh, multiple quality checks, which we need, which uh, we had to keep so that the report we generate is foolproof. So for that, um, one common thing which we have seen is that when we release this service to the public, to all the doctors, some doctors wanted to test. So they had sent X-ray, instead of X-ray images, they used to send some random images. It could be traffic image, these kind of things. So if you don't have any checks, the ML algorithm or the A algorithm would interpret and give some random diagnosis. So for that, we had one classifier. The job of this classifier is to first classify whether it is an X-ray image or not. If it is not, we immediately send a um, message to doctor saying that uh, we only take the X-ray images. For this, we had um, used uh, two uh, APIs or two um, algorithms. There is one AWS uh, recognition um, API, which basically classifies, given an image, it identifies what are the objects that are seen in the image. So it can uh, pick up even the X-ray images as the object in the image. So we have used that initially, but later one of the problem with this AWS recognition software is that it is not able to differentiate whether it is a chest X-ray or whether it's a CT scan. So for both these uh, for both these images, AWS recognition software gave it as just X-ray. So which is also um, which also could result in inaccurate result. So we had developed a SimCLR based classifier. What it does is it tries to compare between uh, different X-ray samples and tries to classify whether um, it is a just X-ray image or not. So once the SimCLR classifier classifies it says as a chest X-ray image. The next task is whether the image is good or bad. Because often what happens is that when the doctor is taking the images from a mobile phone, we might see high contrast images, or we might see a portion of lung region got cut, or it can be blurry or shaky. So in these scenarios, we need to identify whether these are good or bad for processing. So we had developed one more classifier, which is an ensemble of uh, multiple classifiers to tell whether it is a good X-ray image or a bad X-ray image. So if it is a bad X-ray image, in order to give a customization message to the doctor, we had a captioning architecture. What it does is uh, it takes this bad X-ray and then sees why it is a bad X-ray image. Is it because of the brightness or is it a, about the angle? So we had trained this architecture for seven different um, error codes. And with these kind of error codes, uh, it gives a custom message to the doctor saying that uh, this is the reason why the image is bad. Please retake and upload. Once uh, this classifier also says it is good, in that scenario, it directly goes for lung segmentation, which is the segmentation of the breast region, and then feed it to the inference uh, analysis, which we uh, briefly described. But in case uh, the lung segmentation is of low confidence or even the good bad classifier says it's uncertain, we even sent it to the technician to get to have a double check. And once this is done, uh, once the technician, uh, based on the feedback of the technician, this again goes to the inference engine. So we have released this entire service uh, in uh, July last year. Till now, uh, we had uh, close to 10,000 uh, different X-ray images that are being submitted to the platform. Some of them from outside India as well. And the peak load, what we have seen is in June is around 4,000 images per day itself. So the next application is on fever test. Since there is a requirement uh, in many public places to have a 24-hour surveillance monitoring um, for COVID-19 uh, symptoms, such as fever or 
also to ensure that everyone is wearing masks. There's a requirement uh, for this. But one of the challenge, the typical way of um, doing this analysis is we analyze the video data and from the videos, we identify the uh, humans and the, their faces. From the face, we try to get the temperature value using the thermal camera. But the problem with this kind of setup is since we are using RGB for the analysis or the visual image for analysis, it is dependent on the lighting conditions. So these systems uh, didn't work well in case of low lighting conditions. So what we thought, can we develop uh, this using uh, a thermal imaging itself? The advantage with thermal imaging is it, is it measures the temperature values from the subject. They are independent of uh, the amount of lighting we see around us. Also, it can make the entire imaging privacy aware. That is, when we are uh, doing the analysis, we don't have to work on the visual images or we don't have to save the visual images. So that is way, that way it is privacy aware for the people who are walking into these public places. But one of the main challenges is lack of data sets. When we looked into the uh, literature or when we looked at the open source algorithms, we couldn't find any of the existing thermal data sets uh, which we can use to build the solutions. So we had uh, went and then we had collected uh, the data set. Even that data set was not enough. So what we had done was we had proposed a different augmentations on the existing data sets. And we used that data set as well as uh, the in-house data set to train a face detection model. So for the uh, face detection model, we have used Yolo V3. And when we feed these uh, thermal images with this uh, trained architecture, it was able to identify the face region very accurately with uh, an uh, mean IOU close to nine, greater than 90%. But one challenge we have seen was uh, when we feed the raw thermal images directly, those uh, are not working well because many times in these kind of uh, thermal screening areas, we would see a strong background object. Uh, maybe it could be a bulb, it could be an air conditioner, some electric source, because of which the facial characteristics reduce. So we have um, developed a new pre-processing technique, which takes this image and then it converts such a way that the face region is enhanced more for the face detection model to work. So once this face is detected, uh, there are different heuristics uh, which are proposed in the literature to identify the person has been high temperature or not. One common feature or one accurate feature which uh, the literature says is finding the maximum temperature on the face itself is sufficient for classifying whether the patient has fever or not. So we had used that metric and then we classify the uh, participants or the walk-ins as uh, fever or not. And once we get these faces, we feed it to um, classific a mass classifier, which is a mobile net uh, architecture to tell whether the patient is having a patient, whether, whether the participant is wearing a mask or not. So with this kind of setup, uh, we had deployed these in different locations in Bangalore, and we had close to 30 de uh, deployments with more than uh, 50,000 uh, walk-ins into the screening system. So broadly, these are the main applications of AI, which we had worked over the last uh, one and a half year. And I hope this covers the overall I mean, different applications of AI. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Shift H. Uh, so do we have question? I got the first question. So audience, if you have question, please post on the chat window or you can raise your hand. We will allow you to unmute. So we'll take a couple of them. First one, it says, is any hardware required or used to access A2? That's right. by Sharada. Right. So for access A2, what we have done was, uh, this is a just WhatsApp app. So we had given a number. So there is no hardware requirement for it. But if you're talking about the X-ray machines, uh, the algorithms are trained with uh, X-ray images, which give an output of uh, 2,000 by uh, 3,000 uh, pixel X-ray images. But we had uh, 
tested it on different data set, but uh, we haven't seen much of a dependence on the resolution. Because you know, the WhatsApp uh, itself compresses its images and the architecture we use, it um, only takes uh, 224 by 224 as an input. Yeah, so there is another question. Before that, uh, I would like to unmute uh, Shreen Mas. He has a question. Uh, I Shiv, this is a very good presentation. So my question is on topic of the, the breast cancer screening, which you proposed there. So I understand it's a screening device, not a diagnostic device. Is my summarization correct? Yes, so it can be used for both screening and diagnosis. As you know, in screening, we would need less false positives, whereas right. uh, in diagnosis, we want to be more specific. Okay. So, so what my, we have, yeah. Sorry, my follow-up question is that uh, based on the heat map, do you also categorize the standard way of telling the bi score also? Do you present that score? Right. So instead of bi scoring, um, we had something, a similar terminology we use, which is called B-score, uh, Bharati score. Uh, which also gives uh, a similar grading system like zero to five. Zero means it is inconclusive, one and two are normal, three is borderline, and four and five are highly likely to have malignancy. But the terminologies are slightly different because uh, the BIRAD scoring is defined based on some of the metrics, whether there is a mass in mammography or whether, um, whether the lesion bound, how are the boundaries depending on it. So this B score we have come up uh, is based on thermal characteristics. A quick follow up. Uh, then, uh, since it is a screening device or a diagnostic, which you mentioned about, so I'm curious like during the initial stages of cancer, then how does the, the, the what do you call angiogenesis or the, the right. typical vasculature? I'm curious because even I use ultrasound technology to find the vasculature, it is quite challenging. So, would you want to comment on that? Like, how quickly you can get diagnose those signatures? Right. So if you see the literature, even from the medical experiments, one of the main uh, factor which happens during cancer is angiogenesis. So in the angiogenesis, uh, what happens would be there will be formation of new vessels or pumping more blood in the existing vessels. Both these requires high metabolic activity. So they generate more heat and they would be picked up with the current thermal sensors, which can measure even the minor temperatures up to 0.05 degrees centigrade. So what we have observed, even the early stages of cancer, we can see this vascularity in the thermal images very clearly. So, but even though we see these vessels, the boundaries are not so uh, um, stringent. So it's not easy to segment them. So we had to come up with the different enhancement uh, techniques to delineate these boundaries and then analyze this. So this, uh, um, we had one in one patent, uh, which basically segments the vascularity from the thermal images. And then based on this vascularity, it tells whether the patient has cancerous vessels or normal vasculature. Yeah, Shivatesh, we have a few more questions. Uh, one is from Vaibhav. Uh, he says, which is ideal architecture for detecting COVID? Maybe deep learning architecture he's looking at. What we, uh, that's a good question. There's no direct answer for it, but it depends on the amount of data set we had. So we tried with a direct uh, classification of COVID or not using just COVID-19 data sets that are available outside. But the problem is uh, the data sets are in the orders of 10,000 or 5,000. So when we train these standard classifiers like uh, ResNet and DenseNet, which are prominently used, even though the AUC values are good, the explainability is uh, not so great. So that's when we found this uh, multitask learning is helpful. So the architecture which I presented is called multitask learning. So this we found it better compared to DenseNet or ResNet architecture, which are used for COVID-19. Yeah, there are a couple of more questions. Maybe we'll take it quickly. Uh, so for encryption, decryption, is any hardware used or it was done by software? So we haven't, uh, so WhatsApp has uh, an inbuilt um, encryption and decryption software. So we haven't used any of them, but what we had done is uh, WhatsApp also does compression also. Even though you upload one MB image, it compresses the image and then sends you only 250 KB or 64 KB. In fact, I think it compresses up to 70% um, of the image. 
So yeah. that was the main challenge which we had. So for that, uh, we had during the train um, training of our models, we had used ISO compression and JPEG 2000 compression as an augmentation during training. So the next question we have is from Syed, could we develop existing non-contact thermometers for detecting high temperature to detect COVID using AIMF? Yes, so uh, non-contact thermometers or non-contact uh, thermal cameras? I guess uh, it says uh, thermometers, non-contact thermometers. So, Fever is one such feature, actually. So it is very hard uh, to tell based on the fever temperature itself whether the patient had um, COVID-19 or not. So even in the thermal cameras also, we face a similar issue. Even though we can segregate some population, not all of them would have COVID-19. So for that, we had to develop another filters, like uh, respiration rate is one filter which we have developed. So we try to measure the respiration rate from the thermal cameras and based on their breathing pattern, we try to classify. So to broadly answer the question, fever alone is not sufficient. I think we had to use multiple sensors or multiple inputs to accurately classify COVID-19. Yeah, we have Tribeni who has a question. So, so can you be quick, please? I have one question. Sir, we can't that, hear you. Uh, what are the features you have been uh, taken care for this identification of X ray image that you have been mentioned? Uh, I couldn't hear you. Yeah, I Am I audible? See. Yeah, what is yeah. the frequency of X ray images you have taken? That's what he's asking. So, could you elaborate the question? Sorry. Uh, what is the frequency of X-rays in a sense during the X-ray capture? I guess how many X-ray images you have taken to finalize for each patient or something, I guess. Okay, so if it is the number of images we take, uh, we only capture uh, one image. Uh, we only take one X-ray image per person. Okay. Uh, yeah, Shivtej, uh, thanks a lot. There are a lot of compliments which is coming on chat as well as uh, Ketan. Uh, so thanks a lot for a wonderful presentation again for coming to us on SPS forum. And uh, there's a small token of appreciation which uh, we want to show on screen. Ketan is trying to come up with this. Oh, his screen is anged. Anyways, I'm sorry for that. But you will get, uh, I mean, it will come to your doorstep. Uh, so thanks a lot, Shivtej. And uh, we are very fortunate to have you again in IEEE SPS Forum. Uh, so we'll go to our next speaker, who is uh, Manoj. So just a second. So Manoj, uh, he's... Uh, Manoj Sankar, who is co-founder and director at Nemo Care Wellness uh, Private Limited. He's budding entrepreneur. Uh, yeah, Shiv Tej. <laughs> yeah, so he's budding entrepreneur working in healthcare and medtech space. His interest spans the areas of smart variables, the internet of things combined with machine learning and user experience design. He has published uh, two international journal papers and six international patents files. Look, he looks forward to disrupt the healthcare industry and gaining exposure through innovations and product developments. He aspires to become a product leader and is a uh, staunch practitioner to design thinking. So with this, I leave the stage to uh, Manoj for his uh, looking forward for your presentation. It's uh, so for audience, it is something very interesting product which he will be discussing on for babies and others. So over to you, Manoj. Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, we still can't hear you. Manoj? Uh, is it audible now? Yeah, 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 perfect, yeah. Yeah. We can see your screen as well. 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Dr. Bishik and uh, the entire AAA uh, Signal Processing Society for having me here. Uh, the speakers before me set the stage up. Uh, I am uh, going to leverage uh, that. Uh, my topic is going to be on garbage in, uh, will be garbage out. Uh, more trying to emphasize saying uh, what can we do in the medtech domain with data but if that data is not fine, what could be the issues? I just wanted to throw some light on that because that's something that we've been trying to uh, solve while building our product. Uh, so uh, just trying to throw light on saying why should uh, engineers be even talking about medtech? Uh, there is a scarcity of uh, doctors, as in we know this uh, ratio that is there. Uh, we need 2 million more uh, doctors to bridge the gap uh, between uh, the existing scenario of availability of doctors to what should be our ideal uh, doctor to patient ratio as per WHO. That is just on the numbers. Even if we get the numbers, what's the guarantee that we will have the best quality of uh, care? We're not going to have everyone trained on day one. How many of doctor houses are we going to have in that 2 million uh, new doctors? So that is setting the stage up for saying why technology today, uh, especially uh, as uh, technocrats, we all need to pay attention uh, to the biomedical uh, process. A little light on what are the problems that technology today is being used across in AI, ML uh, use cases, murmurs, the S1, uh, S2, uh, the systolic, diastolic murmurs that are there. Uh, a lot of work has gone in, in people trying to classify uh, these uh, very standard problems because we have patterns, standard pattern recognition problems. Uh, these are uh, been around, we have enough data samples uh, our machines uh, can do a very good job at uh, stratifying and classifying uh, these murmurs across with very high accuracy, as good as doctors who have 15, 20 years of experience. Only a doctor who's listened to so many of these signals can actually do this. And this is what our machines are capable of and augmenting doctors' capabilities. Uh, we've seen that there's a boom in the healthcare industry, especially uh, uh, places like uh, drug discovery where uh, almost 12 years have been pushed forward uh, uh, in by using technology saying we are able to do it much faster than what our traditional uh, times where we've seen that healthcare acquisitions are growing, uh, interpreting patient medical history, improving diagnosis early and uh, uh, accurate diagnosis has been the trend in AI and healthcare. They have been listed. Uh, several companies that are doing uh, healthcare in the AI space uh, globally, and we have several Indian companies coming on that as well. So clearly data being the new oil, something that the stage is set on, radiology is picking up. Uh, one reason why I put this up is uh, it was a little uh, different in my head saying when they say structured, unstructured data, most of our imaging, those things go into our unstructured form of data, but they have standardization, say your DICOM format. Uh, that is why they've also become the hot spaces because there's already a format to your data. So building on top of these is uh, a slightly uh, more robust and there is a mechanism. And these have been hot spaces uh, to start off with because of uh, the pure structure and accessibility of data that is there, it played a huge uh, role in COVID-19. We had uh, 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 Sai from, uh, Sai from uh, Niramai talk about uh, the whole issue of uh, breast cancer and how they went in. Uh, so the numbers are huge. Uh, we see the advent of technology coming in uh, to help these places. We have Google's own project, uh, uh, the Google patient, where they want to collect all kinds of data about you everything, including your medical data and kind of predict when something can go wrong. So these are the kind of projects that are going on globally. So I wanted to throw some more light specifically on wearables. Uh, uh, we have health monitoring wearables. We had uh, non-contactless coming in earlier. Uh, we have uh, a lot of wearables uh, going during the COVID times, especially picking up for therapeutic cases as well. Uh, we see activity trackers on the rise, uh, people uh, using this data to uh, take uh, decisions. So head to toe, we have uh, data covered. We've also had wearables for proximity detection and uh, finding out if you've come in contact with someone with COVID and then track your vitals. So uh, wearables from head to toe, we have all possible measurements that are possible uh, today. Uh, this is the kind of infographics. This is the hot new businesses. We had glasses at one point, glucose meters, non 
uh, non-invasive uh, monitors. So all of this is really uh, where the space is. But let's talk a little about the problem. Uh, the black box problem where doctors really want to know saying, I want to know what is the metrics on what your AI is really uh, predicting there's a disease state or no. So there's the whole concept of explainable AI, which goes in, which, which seems to be the biggest problem that we seem uh, in, uh, in going for uh, uh, AI systems. But for us, what we understood is one level below that if you give in garbage into your system, you're going to get garbage out. Typically saying, if you have any kind of uh, data that is either skewed, uh, is noisy, uh, uh, has a bad quality, uh, your output, your prediction, everything is going to get affected uh, the same way. So it's not just if the model is skewed, you're going to get bad results, but even if your data is bad and you have an amazing model, it's still going to eventually fail. So that's one key understanding that we had for me. Just let me give you an example uh, of the scenario here. Uh, imagine uh, you are uh, not keeping well and you go to a pulse ox. Imagine it gives you bad readings, right? It could be because of your skin tone, bad position, motion artifacts. It could cause panic. It could cause a lot of a threat, it could be a psychological issue, simple of simple use cases where this is a consumer-based product that we're looking at. Uh, this uh, is there at every scale that we are talking about in medical products. This is one of the most uh, advanced use cases today as all of us are aware of this. When we go to wearables as such, uh, there are several drawbacks or issues that are there uh, with uh, our uh, signals that come in. The first of them being uh, traditionally pulse oxes are uh, transmittance type. So when we take uh, the reflectant type, the one that we put on our hands, the, both the sensor, the light source and the receiver on the same side, there is a phase shifting that happens. So if you see a traditional signal, you see a dichrotic notch onto the right, but the picture that I put on uh, the slide, you have the dichrotic notch on the left uh, right, So there is a phase shifted signal with the reflectance type. This took us a while to understand. And it was very intuitive because all my life I worked with variable signals. So this was very intuitive. We had uh, one of our interns come in and say, uh, this signal looks different or it looks mirror image. That's when we kind of understood saying when we compare against a template or existing algorithm, uh, we are going to find that there is going to be a phase shift. It starts with that if you start noticing. Uh, and if you're talking about real-time applications, we're talking about a much smaller window, as in uh, you need to uh, figure out within a window of say 500 sample points that is this signal good or no, or do I discard because you do not have the memory capacity on a wearable device to store and then figure out do a back, back propagation. You just have to discard the signal. So you have a very small window. So your algorithms and your techniques need to be uh, very uh, uh, high on uh, efficiency as well. The third aspect, motion artifacts. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why wearables especially are going to have a lot of noise introduced uh, today with the advent of uh, IMUs and uh, motion compensation techniques that have come in, uh, there is data fusion that happens. Uh, we have uh, dedicated processors. Again, uh, there is uh, extensive resource utilization that happens. We have a dedicated processor only for data fusion and one uh, dedicated co-processor for uh, pushing the data and uh, taking care of the RF peripheral. Uh, so motion artifacts is one other big cause uh, that is going to take in. Uh, one uh, another important factor that even the Western, the bigger players today are coming out and putting out is uh, these pulse oxes were never calibrated for someone with brown skins, darker skins, let aside. It was not tested or calibrated for all skins. Studies are coming out today uh, which is again a big issue because uh, predominantly the populations uh, here, it, it's a light uh, technique, right? It's light sensing technique. It is dependent on the skin tone, uh, on the level of uh, pigments that are present in the skin, especially we're talking about melanin. Uh, so there is a level of calibration that needs to go in, especially with your skin tone. Uh, perfusion is the amount of blood that is flowing. If there is low perfusion, by default, you're likely to have uh, bad readings. Uh, that uh, your readings are going to be faulty. Uh, so in our predictions, we have this concept of confidence, right? With what your uh, model says, even to know what a value is red, 
to even read a value you need a confidence interval here uh, that is going in based on your um, uh, perfusion uh, that is there so you're not just reading spo2 but in the back end you are uh, doing so many things for one parameter as simple as an spo2 which is across uh, everyone's homes today right we have these monitors but this is a level of computation that goes on in the background uh, this is uh, even more uh, disadvantages is this is a signal of a newborn. Uh, so we deal with newborn babies. I'll little in little down line. I'll talk about what we do at NemoCare. Uh, but here, uh, this is picture of a neonatal signal, right? This is coming in from a standard monitor. Uh, this is the kind of signal that uh, we get. The first thing is there is no dichrotic notch in a newborn. Up to the first 48 days, there are no dichrotic notches. It is almost like an inverted sine wave. And second is, this is the kind of motion artifacts that you are going to uh, get. So even after filtering, a lot of the signal has to be uh, windowed off or silenced off uh, before it can be computed because your values can go haywire. Uh, even after using fourth order filters on an offline processor, the best that we can get is we still uh, lose close to 500 points on uh, the set of samples that are coming. So uh, there is almost like instant feedback that has to go in. A very good set of uh, pre-processing has to be taken care of, bandpass filters uh, going in there, uh, known frequencies based on what kind of signal you're dealing with, feed, neonate, uh, ECG, PPG. These standards are known, but you need to customize it for your particular use case and your sampling data from your device. The next part is the motion artifacts, the data fusion that we do using our IMU sensors. Uh, the data, again, there is a shift in baseline uh, that starts off. Uh, there is uh, amplitude shift, frequency uh, frequency shift is not mainly because of motion artifacts, but amplitude shifting that happens uh, because of motion artifacts that come in. A uh, very important factor to remove these in or at least blank out the signals because uh, these can lead to false alarms, especially because if they go out of range and typically what a nurse or a doctor uh, in a hospital setting would want to use this for is reliability of the signals. They want to know that uh, the values are correct. Only then we want to use this system. So in that kind of a setting, you need to be very accurate with the kind of uh, signals that are coming out of your system as in the values that are getting shown. Uh, so in that case, motion artifacts uh, is one uh, very critical factor that has to come out. Traditionally, it was tougher because you had probes, probes could move system or somewhere else, right? So in wearables, the advantage is uh, the sensor and the motion sensor, uh, motion uh, component, motion uh, sensor and your PPG sensors or ECG sensors are together. So as a unit, you know when the motion occurred compared to your traditional system of having the probes, only the probe could move your system could be stable. So it's become more advantageous. But like I said, you need a coprocessor dedicated data fusion unit uh, and also you have just one uh, I2C uh, channel. You, you're doing a, a sharing of uh, the uh, lines. You're just switching between addresses and reading at very high frequency. So your, uh, your data from your motion sensors also at a very high uh, data rate. You're talking about very high data rate. Your uh, light sensors or your ECG sensors are also talking at very high data rate. So you have dedicated resources to just uh, fuse the data. So this plays on the computation, which again goes back onto the battery form size, which, which is other issues of making a compact uh, system. But one issue that really has to be taken care of because everything can go haywire. You don't know if the patient's actually having a high heart rate or it was just motion artifacts. Uh, one way that has been uh, taken care of, we do it uh, extensively and the bigger players also do this. Uh, it's very proprietary to every company. Nobody talks about this. Even the white papers just talk on a high level. Uh, we've tried digging up a lot on uh, even their patterns, but not much is there. It's more like a trade secret because this is what makes a system stand out. Uh, one main technique of signal quality indexing is a template matching. Uh, you know what is a true, uh, say for example, PPG or ECG, one uh, signal as in what it would uh, look like, what the template would look like. You match it. And if your uh, with uh, your uh, window has matching signals uh, with a very minimal deviation, then it's accepted. If the deviation is too much, the signal is dropped. That is the most basic uh, of uh, signal quality index methods. Uh, it predicts a confidence 
level of saying at 90% your signal is accurate that's what it means which means if my alarm comes out saying uh, there is low provision uh, what is uh, what is the confidence with what my system is saying that there are custom metrics uh, like i said people use uh, skewness uh, people use perfusion index use a combination uh, one example is there where they, they use discrete cosine transforms uh, try to take certain parameters and match the parameters to check for noise but signal quality index is very key for any real time signal processing system where people look at the data in a real time to take decisions on them in a biomedical uh, system so uh, now getting into what we do at uh, nemo care uh, we are a startup focused on uh, newborn care uh, we were born out of the biodesign process where we did uh, a fellowship uh, to understand what problems were in the newborn space close to 8 million new uh, low birth weight babies are born every single year 400000 of them lose their lives and uh, these uh, numbers were very alarming we went down to district hospitals specialized newborn care units uh, this is how babies are put there today this is our resource constraint setting uh, the top end district hospitals babies lying next to each other sharing uh, monitors no monitors in most places uh, left to uh, monitoring by the nurses visual capacity imagine if, if even the baby had an episode of high heart rate or uh, temperature dropping they had to just on their rounds figure out the baby is not fine or the baby next to it uh, gives out an alarm so this is the conditions that we saw uh, we developed the nemo care raksha so the device that you see uh, on the left it's the size of a 10 rupee coin Uh, does all the monitoring capabilities that our vital stats monitors do? Uh, multiple of these devices would be put into uh, on the babies in the uh, wards. Uh, they push the data to the cloud. Uh, from there, we have a real-time dashboards with scoring tools. Uh, we have a centralized remote patient monitoring with decision support systems where early warnings and predictive. monitoring is possible for all authorized users so from one single point they know which baby is keeping well uh, so we brought in a closed icu system all the leads that are there on the baby's foot and within a bubble wrap we're pushing icu grade monitoring down to bedside so it it promotes kangaroo mother care breastfeeding now the mother can really bond with the baby as well and the baby is monitored with high level of uh, confidence all this data is pushed to the cloud continuously the nurses are monitoring uh, these babies uh, the device is all that you see on the right and that circled in uh, red all same capabilities completely wireless we had to ensure that we keep uh, a good balance between edge computing all the issues that we spoke about had to be taken care of at uh, the tablet level which is our gateway as well and uh, some of them at the cloud level when we do a historical level uh, longitudinal analysis uh, so the crux of what we do at nemo care is whom to treat which baby needs uh, attention right now when to treat timeliness saying our devices started with real time capturing saying when uh, systems when the baby is falling sick temperature uh, heart rate respiration rate uh, perfusion index heart rate variability Uh, all these parameters are dropping based on the threshold set then conditions and eventually we are getting down to understanding saying it's time critical so we got in into predictions now saying when a baby is likely to fall sick which baby needs attention we are seeing trends on when a baby is getting infections when a baby might fall uh, sick with a uh, pertain uh, particular use cases that we have identified uh, so that is the kind of work that is going on with clinical validations that are completed we finished our safety studies at narayana hidalaya in bangalore and have deployed across six states right now uh, in india for uh, larger uh, adoption of the device what to treat is the crux which there's a fine line saying we are augmenting the doctors capabilities definitely we are not looking at saying Uh, we are fulfilling all the capabilities that uh, the nursing or doctor staff can do within a hospital setting but what we are trying to do is uh, what could be the possible differential diagnosis that needs to be done here based on the data that was never there uh, which was always done in the west saying they have trends they have these ehr systems they have enough intelligence built on that our mission was to start off saying let's build the data piece which is missing uh, the algorithms 
are uh, somewhat known. Even the doctor's intuition is what we're trying to augment today with uh, the capabilities of our wearable device and eventually become a platform where we have more devices and more use cases that will come in. And some of the limitations that uh, we wanted to talk about also was uh, there's no data sets when we started uh, uh, this uh, so even references of PPG signals there was one on PhysioNet which is mimicry you need uh, access uh, it's again there is a skin tone issue those are transmittance type uh, there was no reflection type data and uh, you don't get the complete data sets uh, with the test that you need for a current time you're talking about at least 10 years of older data that you have so we started creating our own data sets very soon we'll become the largest repository of neonatal data uh, no simulators available at all uh, from Fluke to Rigel, we tried everyone. Nobody had simulators for reflectance type. We started working with uh, vendors recently, built our own neonatal based data within the simulators, starting get, uh, getting up with that, building use cases because uh, we saw a gap we needed. We started building it. Uh, we were uh, uh, funded by global agencies uh, to start off this work. We are really grateful for that. We had the bandwidth, so we started off with this. Uh, skin tone calibration globally is one issue we think we will be solving and putting uh, the Indian context on a global map, especially uh, because there is a lack of uh, very custom data. And, and we're, why we are stressing on this is the biggest of players is talking about it on their tweet saying we are doing cultural skin tone based studies. Now, uh, it came intuitively because we did. It was not racist of us, but uh, <coughs> it happened very intuitively when we started off. We had diversity on our data that we collected and started collecting initially as uh, well. The last biggest challenge is the tiny form factor. When we're talking about units, uh, premature babies, uh, uh, we're talking about hardly one kg. 10 rupee coin size is something you can imagine. Right? That's all we have to fit in uh, because uh, we've also done uh, some level of uh, prediction to know saying, uh, even uh, there might be issues at the motion sensor level. So even that data has to be compensated for, fused for. So uh, some level of uh, ML at the edge also for certain use cases, uh, all the way to signal processing capabilities, uh, ensuring the form factor small. So uh, dealing with all these complexities, I think uh, is a challenge, but that's where the opportunities also uh, lie for us. And uh, we have been doing uh, fine. We've, four and a half years into this journey now. And uh, uh, with the support of global partners, the government of India, we've been fortunate enough to do fine. In the next three years, we uh, hope to impact the lives of 1 million newborns and uh, be the household name for uh, neonatal care in India and uh, globally. Uh, if you want to get your hands dirty, the opportunities are there. Uh, you saw a bunch of startups talk uh, before this and uh, post this as well. Uh, if you're looking out for opportunities, please do reach out. Uh, we do encourage uh, young minds coming and joining us on our mission. We have worked with students across the country uh, and professionals. Uh, looking forward to anyone reaching out and extending our support as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Manoj, uh, for a wonderful presentation, giving us an overview of uh, some of the research opportunities, challenges, and what uh, Nemo Care is doing. There are a couple of questions popping up. So uh, where where you get device, PCB, and fabrications of casings is Ravi Arora is asking. Is it yeah, so as in India so, so the design uh, sorry? Is it in India or China? Is what is uh, it's in India. So it's completely in India. Uh, so we are completely made uh, manufactured in India for uh, today, as in uh, end to end is completely made in India. There have been longer lead times. We are facing huge delays, uh, but uh, we are setting up our entire supply chain. Today is completely manufactured in India. Okay, so if we have, if you have any questions, please post or you can ask. Raise your hand. I see Srinivas has a question. Uh, hi. Uh, so my question is that since you mentioned about uh, neonate care, so I gather that during the preterm, basically the, the neonatal jaundice is such a big problem. And you also voiced out a word called kangaroo care. So how does the jaundice gets evaluated and how, uh, where does the phototherapy comes into picture? Do you, are you so, looking into those parameters? So that's also? one of our use cases. So like I said, we are light based. We do multispectral imaging. Uh, so the only problem is uh, non-invasive bilirubin is a challenge in the sense saying, uh, on the specificity and sensitivity. Uh, 
it's not a claim that we do it's not one of the things that we claim up front today but eventually we are getting there it's all about clinical evidence that's there uh, today uh, they go in with the standard methods input the values uh, we don't uh, directly claim for that because it's straightforward it's established enough uh, the whole uh, market is set up there by default every baby is going into uh, jaundice therapy today uh, it's about identifying which baby needs a transfusion and that's where hemodynamic monitoring comes in very critical it's not about saying should i give the baby phototherapy that is not the bigger problem transfusion and deterioration that is where our device comes in more handy today so holistic approach on risk scoring is what we focus on uh, like i said what to treat we are building that use cases one by one uh, because even the philips monitor today to be honest on uh, the uh, non invasive uh, Bilirubin monitoring is not picked up within an Indian context. They're okay with just pricking blood and taking because we're talking about a very price sensitive market. Uh, they're like babies turning uh, uh, yellowish. I'll put them under light. So that didn't seem like a bigger concern today for us. And as a startup, we're not trying to chew everything. Uh, we're trying to go with cases that are there. But the more critical thing what we can do today with the existing setup is: is the treatment helping the baby? Is the baby progressing? Is the hemodynamics that is your cardiac output uh, your temperature stability is that helping which is the base metabolism that is what we are focusing on today yeah manoj uh, there is one more question uh, from ravi again is data set open for public uh, so if someone wants to work with us we are happy because what we realized is uh, we are not able to build all the use cases uh, we are just starting off uh, earlier in the next say april we were thinking of putting out calls for researchers saying anyone keen to work on our data sets we are happy to do it because we are not able to think of all the use cases and our bandwidth is more focused on the commercial aspects today but on the r and d segment we are happy uh, to do that uh, on a particular request it's not open today as yet we've not uh, commercial i mean we've not made it into a complete open set yet yeah thank you manoj i guess uh... you should be receiving some more emails from many of our uh, audience who would like to work with you i mean i'm i'm really thankful to all the speakers who are opening up uh, because this is very niche area and it's very tough to get data so one thing which we have realized i have been working from first uh, one decade or more and first thing is uh, any researcher or any of them i meet they ask us do i have access to data how do i do that i mean thanks to you and also our previous speakers i'm sure even future speakers are open for collaboration so with this uh, ketan uh, if your screen is fixed yeah amazing yeah thanks a lot manoj and uh, for your wonderful session and enlightening us uh, so uh, we'll go to our next speaker who is uh, shrinivas uh, just just a second yeah so we have with us uh, uh, shrinivas Uh, who is principal engineer and part head at Samsung R and D India, Bangalore? He had started on imaging R and D team at Bangalore since April two thousand fourteen. Uh, master degree from Bits Pilani and uh, bachelor degree from uh, uh, in electronics and communication. He is senior member of I Triple E, reviewer for many of the I Triple E conferences, uh, including EMBC, I two MTC, and SPI Medical Imaging. He has filed thirty patents and has twelve patents granted in the field of biomedical instrumentation, optics, signal processing, ultrasound imaging, bioinformatics, and content management. He has more than twenty plus publications in peer-reviewed conferences. Uh, yeah, and very uh, great guy to talk. Also, I was I had very good experience talking to him. So, Shrinivas, over to you. Okay, I think given this online nature, first thing I need to utter is, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, let me share the screen. uh is my screen visible gentlemen yeah but uh, maybe on the top you can see display settings uh that you have to change it because we are able to see to uh, the way you see not the audience okay uh, then uh can you help me on that on the top yeah display settings there yeah uh should i say only presenter view and slide yeah. show yeah uh, uh. i can't enable that okay Okay. Is this Google Slides or normal? Ah, uh, it's a uh, Microsoft PPT. Okay, maybe you have to end and restart again. Yeah, that that's end. better. Okay, yeah. sure. One moment, gentlemen.
yeah now it's perfect how does it look like now yeah it's perfect yeah okay uh, firstly happy republic day to everyone so i think i already one and a half hour has passed through uh, i urge the audience attention it will be a sort of a quick uh, teaser in the work which we have done so far so and um, and first and uh, thanks for the opportunity for in this forum to present and i was discussing with uh, dr abhishek saying that there is lot more content for me to share so i will look forward for another opportunity where i can go in detail a uh, lot of content maybe there are some multimodal content is there there are a uh, 4d content and the dl content is there probably we can have uh, for the spawn off in separate sessions so this presentation uh, what you can expect is the entire evolution when i use the word evolution uh, is all about how is more of a personal journey so when i mention some of, some of the timelines here they may not be the industry uh, timelines where at that time the technology got matured but more or less i was following this domain quite closely for quite a number of years across philips and samsung so how did i go through this entire journey of from 2d to 4d and now the journey is all about real time now so uh, the audience can expect like uh, what sort of uh, technology is being offered and what is happening in this kind of a uh, image uh, quantification i will demystify all these terms in the subsequent slides and uh, i look forward in this uh, presentation to collaborating opportunities so you can reach out to me on the linkedin and post whatever questions you have and i will definitely will answer back and let's continue the dialogue here with that premise uh, i just want to uh, present from the primer here i understand that lot of undergrad students are there so i don't want to throw up some jargon here so quickly so when i say ultrasound system yeah you guys know this is typically ultrasound system which has got a transducer probes basically it works on a ultrasound frequency which is not in the audible range and when i use the word called image this is what you get when you scan an image uh, on a abdomen or a, on a or on the uh, heart or things like that so when i use the word image i'm referring to this image on the screen like this and when i say transducer so this is a device which actually facilitates in capturing that and when i say ultrasound system this entire uh, modality comes into picture there and some of the definitions when i say 1d 1d uh, we have seen that uh, it is all about heart sounds so in ultrasound evolved primarily with a doppler it was a simple technology like um, just a transmit and receive so it is a 1d sort of thing so uh, in the in the beginning of my career i just used to listen to the heart sounds and i used to segment them and then over the uh, period it has evolved into 2d so you can get a decent image uh, uh, on the screen now now you can what what you what i present on the screen is a fetal heart you can see it quite a de decent it has captured there and 3d is the next evolution it happened and there we can now completely see the uh, fetus very decently and the the 4d is all about 3d plus time one can see the real heart wall in motion so these are the de definition which i'm going to use and uh, uh, how we have went about in this journey i'll explain that and i also have used one word called quantification so the entire purpose in medical domain or in general and ultrasound in particular is yes i could able to get a decent image on the screen uh, that uh, the the sonographer here the one who scans image is called sonographer um though in other in mr and ct is called radiologist so the expectation is to see that yeah i've seen the image i could able to diagnose is good bad or ugly but also i want some kind of a matrix there so that's the word we use called quantification so one could use the uh, available calipers on the system where one can use some kind of scale to measure but is quite time consuming it takes lot of time and is very inaccurate suppose i want to measure a 3d uh, of a, some kind of a in, uh, anatomy of interest it takes quite a time and is more of approximation i would have applied some kind of simpson rule to capture that and there is a lot of inter observer variation so the evolution is all about hey i could able to see the image now can you pop up these data in a re, in a more accurately more automated way so that i don't spend so much of time in scanning it in typical uh, uh, um, diagnostic centers the diagnosis uh, the sonographer scans the image and it is quite a big queue is waiting outside and you can't spend that much of time time to compute those metrics so the entire idea in ultrasound domain is all about can you pop up those metrics in a in a real time or more accurately in a more presentable form so typical workflow because before i jump into the content 
so what happens typically? So I uh, typically a patient comes and you do uh, using the transducer, you scan the uh, scan the body and you get an image. Uh, it's a very raw image. It's something I want. To, maybe I should have I should have demystified it. It is in RF data. Then you do pre-processing. There are a lot of steps to do pre-processing to bring back to the baseband uh, domain. And then the interesting stuff is that what is my interest? Which part I need to segment it? Then segmentation happens. Post segmentation, I need to do some kind of feces extraction or selection because what is that of interest to me? What is that I need to measure? And then I need to classify here. It could be a measurement, or it could be some kind of a rating saying that uh, uh, malignant or um, it is uh, benign and things like that. And you can present the re uh, report in a, in a, as a report. So these are the terms which I'm going to use. So now my journey is all about my, my saga, how it went through. So in 2011, at that point in time, maybe 2009 to 2011, we were still battling with, <coughs> sorry, 2D segmentation. So that is the time. What exactly the 2D segmentation? I already explained to this audience what is 2D data looks like. So the goal is all about, hey, I get an image on the screen. Uh, and then the clinician will say that, see, the one which you are seeing on the screen is all about the breast cancer data here, the breast lesion there. So the clinician will say that uh, I could be able to see uh, there's some kind of anatomy of interest, but I would want to observe it in you even more uh, minutely or more closely. So the tools available uh, in 2011 was that clinician will create some kind of a, a region of interest, some kind of boxing he does. And then what happens, then you do some kind of an image processing. This is a, one of the major step in 2011, because at the time the transducer has not evolved that much. We still are battling with uh, 64 uh, crystal ones or even 128 was a big luxury. Uh, these are crystals in the transducer. So to this audience, the more number of crystals, the better the resolution. So the lot of effort is to go from the, from the image processing guy is to, to enhance the image. And then you segment it, the entire interest of the, uh, the clinician is to that, can you, can you mark a contour for me so that I can better understand the characteristic signature of it? And then you do feature extraction. And this is where the actual uh, meat of it happens to make a report of it and write a summary for the treatment. But typical uh, segmentation pipeline in a very simplified form is that you have a region of interest. And as I said that um, the technology was not that evolved. So there's a lot of effort is to go in noise reduction and then we used to apply techniques like histogram equalization. So I'm using this as uh, one of the recipe, may not be, this is the exact, the form happens in others, but I, I would have, I have want, gone through this journey for myself. So I've done a noise reduction, then I do a histogram equalization. Then I do some kind of a contrast enhancement between the foreground and the background. And then I used to apply this kind of fuzzy enhancement techniques. And the, and the summary was that I, I, I want to get a segmented output with a clear delineated boundary so that the clinician will can say that, hey, the lesion has some kind of signature. It has got some kind of homogeneity and things like that. And then he is to predict something. And then the journey evolved. So maybe something is repetitive. So uh, mostly these things used to happen in a offline mode. Uh, when I say offline mode, the clinician is to scan the image and post scanning the image, these techniques used to get applied. So I'm talking about 2011 where it is nothing is real time, you scan an image, and then you apply all these techniques in an offline mode. Then the noise reduction techniques is all about median filtering. So forget about ML, things like that. We are still in those era of uh, applying a classical median filtering to reduce the speckle or uh, noise uh, reduction there. And then uh, the histogram equalization happens and then you get a, a pretty clean image there on the screen. And yeah, so the entire idea of a contrast enhancement is all about to find a, a decent boundary. And so you can appreciate that once you apply all these techniques, you get a decent boundary of the lesion and that we should segment and present to the screen, so to the user. So this is 2011, I'm, I'm, I'm repeating again. So the techniques to segment uh, the borders is active contours and uh, some kind of a level set methods were available at the time. We used to use those to uh, create these contours and present to the uh, clinician. And then as things evolved in, in 2011 also, now the clinician has done this, but he wants to know uh, further one thing like more of automation. So subsequent uh, interest of, 
of interest was the clinician will do a prior annotated ones or you should teach us like this is what is my ground truth and let me see what what your algorithm pops up so we used to uh, apply uh, our our segmented output to the clinician one and used to uh, uh, derive some kind of dice metric and say that see, hey you can accept my solution because it's coming quite closer to the way you would have segmented without these kind of techniques being made available to you so that was a scenario in those days and then subsequent evolution was that we used to use adjunct data to do a breast cancer evaluation this is quite challenging problem so we used to have something called elastography so to demystify what exactly is elastography is that first you take a 2d image and then subsequently you also take a elastography image is basically a stress by strain sort of a image so a softer tissue will has a higher strain and a harder tissue has a lower strain and using this data one can now have an some kind of adjunct data or a parallel data and you can use the both data of segmenting uh, the 2d image and the elastography data and give more uh, value addition to the clinician and say that i will predict the score for you now this can be more of automation the clinician can spend his more time on the clinical score of score 3 and score 5 above if it is score 1 and score 2 this gets typically automated and then can be parked aside because it's not that serious case as such then the hunger grew the technology evolved and then we enter in circa in 2014 now we have 3d data an amazing world have evolved so similar kind of a dreams were there like uh, you have a 3d data and then i would again want the quantification i want you to segment it so as i said to you i have uh, i i shared some of the latest papers to you i didn't want to go back in my history and suggest papers these are the papers which i published last year so the audience can take note of it and uh, in subsequent forum we can have a wider discussions on these techniques and uh, what which i applied but for for uh, i just took a rice sampling sort of thing and uh, taken a simpler example where there was no dl technique applied it was a very simplistic one and i've said that how i applied this technique to do a 3d evaluation so i will refrain from using any medical terms but uh, pardon me in case i use here and there uh, on some of the words here so now i have a 3d data so the clinician can see the world uh, in a very better way but now his qu query is that hey now i want you to identify all these follicles so what exactly follicle quickly these are the eggs in a ovary can you count it for me the clinician earlier used to use 2d images and used to manually count in 2011 to 2014 but as a the 3d data world hey this is looks very automated job this takes a lot of time why doesn't the system does this in background or more in automated way so the expectation was to identify all these kind of uh, eggs and present the data but the hunger didn't stop there hey, why don't you also present it as a more a segmented way like can you present it as a rendering i as i said all the ultrasound data is more of a gray scale image can you present it so the rendering techniques also evolved i not only segment the 3d egg i will also present it in a more uh, intuitive way because the clinician's interest is especially in a fertility domain is to find out the one golden egg if uh, because in, there are a lot of assisted reproductive centers are there in nooks and corners so his goal is to find out do i have a one golden egg of a considerable dimension if it is there then i will go for a artificial uh, uh, insemination or embryo transfer things like that so he wants it, the data to be more present uh, in a more um, guaranteed assurance to him saying that indeed i measured the egg in a correct way so the steps were uh, the detected we used to do initially a detection where i need to, i used to identify the the x and then i used to segment it and then once i segmented in the 3d thing i used to uh, uh, create a, um, a map for it and then present it is using the latest nvidia technology or whatever graphics card you have and for the clinician for further evaluation i will show an example of the software which is marketed in the currently like you can appreciate there's no audio probably i hope people can see the video isn't it maybe uh, hello yeah so you can see on the screen that uh, the some of the techniques were the clinician himself draws a crude hand crafted uh, boundary and he expects you to segment it automatically uh, in case he has a particular doubt 
Then we have presented a technology called AutoPlus, where all these kind of eggs gets at one shot segmented and presented. The next evolution was that uh, there is an ovary around these eggs. So can you segment that and present because this has further helped us in di diagnosing the ovarian cancer also. So this, uh, this surface in indentation also gives a very good uh, uh, diagnostic marker. So these kind of things also evolved over the 3D data. And then uh, uh, to TomTom, Tom, our approach has given a very good detection accuracy. Why I claim so. Uh, even the egg size of 2 mm, which is very difficult to even see on ultrasound screen um, for an expert clinician to identify. Um, our technology can identify those kind of uh, eggs. And then this is done on a commodity hardware. It's not that we are running on a, some kind of uh, mainframe servers and things like that. So that's what happens till 2014 and 2015 uh, using the 3D area. Then we have got a better transducers. Now it's 4D. As I said, 4D is all about 3D plus time. So the immediate use case which we which we found was that, hey, uh, how about uh, quantifying the heart walls? I have seen, I've heard the audience, uh, some of the speakers talking about the murmurs and the uh, heart defects and things like that. So we are talking about um, a technology where the clinician can, with a lot more confidence, can look at the heart walls and can see that. Um, and, and can, can clearly diagnose whether there's a, a regurgitation or a, um, or a mitral wall prolapse. And also this technology will help him that post uh, the wall replacement, how does it look like? Does it snugly fit? Or is there any paravarular leaks are there? So our technology has given that kind of uh, um, assistance to the clinician to identify all the four walls of the heart. And the way we went was that, it, um, as I said, this requires a part automation and pass part user intervention. When I say part user intervention, I say the clinician has to say that this is the right uh, frame, uh, here you go. And then the automation starts and says that it tries to find the, um, the nodes of the wall and then it, it segments that and presents the heart wall there. But we also went one step further and we say that in case the heart uh, wall uh, by our segmentation is not that accurate, the clinician can himself can handcraft them. Maybe we can we have provided in the tools where you can drag and drop and say that you know what your segmentation stopped up to here, but I I see that it, it is there still further down. So we would have we have given all these uh, facilities to the clinician so that we don't want to play God here, and the clinician can handcraft that, but still it has reduced lot of workflow effort for him, and then it segments the heart wall and pops up lot of parameters onto the screen. And it all is done within less than one minute. So this data, which is earlier is quite cumbersome to compute, now is available to the clinician in less than one minute. And this data is available to the screen. So we applied this technique for all the four walls. So that I have already explained. I just want to quickly show how this application works. So you can see that this is all still offline gentlemen. So the clinician loads the scanned image. Some of the images are done through trans esophageally through via esophagus it goes and it captures the images and loads the images onto the in you know, offline mode and then ask our software to quantify the walls and then there you go it detects those hot heart walls and the clinician can be quite confident you can say that yeah there is a heart wall leak is there it is not closing when it's supposed to close there so now i need to prescribe some kind of a um, stent rip, uh, wall replacement or some other adjunct uh, medical diagnosis for it. And you can see that on the right, there are a lot of metrics are there which will enable him to accurately can go for which uh, stent would be appropriate for this kind of a subject. As you know, one size doesn't fit all. So uh, this is far more forthcoming and it is a step ahead to see that in future, one can have a customized stents also available to the, uh, for the su subject of interest. So this 4D data, I can see the wall motion happening. So uh, I've seen some of the uh, speakers speaking about heart murmur. So once they come for the expert, uh, they use this kind of a technology to really can accurately diagnose that and go for a stent rip, uh, wall replacement surgeries. And then the journey is all about in 2020 is all about real time 4D. Uh, so what is all about real time 4D is uh, Yes, there is the 4D data. Yeah, you are able to segment it and quantify it and measure it for me. But can you do it in real time? What I mean, what I what the clinician expectation is that 
as I scan it, uh, can you pop those information rather than I scan it and then load the image back and then they get the data. So we did, a, uh, you can see some of the publications in 2021 uh, uh, they, where I applied these kind of a real time techniques for multimodal application where I have a MR data, I have an ultrasound data. Uh, I use a, both of the data and I can in real time can suggest and help the clinician to do a, a biopsy far more accurately. So it happens in real time. And yeah, I don't want to go through these papers, but I will have taken one example where I've applied this kind of real time technique for a fetal phase. So fetal phase is first of all, it's a very interesting technology where uh, it's, it is more of a solves the emotion need of a, of a, uh, of a prospective mom to see the fetus in 3D visible to her. And also for the clinician, it has a lot of diagnostic information is there. There are some of the, in early stage, in first trimester or second trimester, where one can diagnose the fetal head and can diagnose Down syndrome. Is there a cleft lip, uh, some kind of a lip, lip where it, can, it has broken? So one can early diagnose that. And using this kind of technology, one can even identify polydactality, means are there five fingers or more? So this kind of additional information, one can get it quite early uh, using this uh, fetal phase detection techniques. And uh, some of the techniques available in the in, by release by some of the existing body of knowledge is all about, I segment a 3D, uh, I can se segment a fetal phase, but I'm never able to reconstruct the fetal phase because it looks like still a, uh, if you recall some kind of an alien, uh, sometimes mother gets shocked to see that kind of face. Probably you need to supposed to completely fill it and present the 3D fetal face. So what we have done is that as I as we scan, we capture the uh, 3D ultrasound data and we have applied, uh, here we have applied uh, NN unit. The audience uh, must be aware of the unit technique and uh, the NN unit is more of a, a no new, new uh, unit. It is all about is more of adaptable in nature. The network depth gets adjusted by way of, uh, it learns, it's self-modifiable, it's, it's, it evolves. So we apply this kind of NN unit techniques and uh, on, a, on a fetal data. And uh, our goal is to, uh, we train the features for us is nothing but the eyes, nose and the lip. And uh, using these features, uh, 3D data of ultrasound is quite uh, complex, like it has got entire amniotic uh, fluid and umbilical cord, but one needs to go slice by slice and find the right frame, first present it to the clinician, and then segment that uh, 3D fetal phase, reconstruct it and present it. So if a typically clinician does this job, it would have taken quite an amount of time for him to do that because it requires quite expertise expertise to know the orientation based on the femur bone or the, uh, or the hand, things like that. But this happens automatically in real time. So as I was mentioning to you, uh, this is NN unit. I don't have time to extend all of that, but I've shared the paper uh, uh, reference to you. It has got published in ISB. Uh, audience can go through that and can suggest that where else you can use this technique. They can pose a question to me in offline mode. So we, are, we use the NN unit technique and we use the, our 3D data as I said, the, the features primarily were the eyes, nose, and the lip, and the end output would be something like that. And we use this kind of fetal mask on the 3D data, and the subsequent steps will completely sculpt out the fetal face. I, I can't show some of them, uh, entire 3D face and present it to the clinician. So I have walked you through from the 2D to 4D to real-time 4D. And uh, what is the key takeaway uh, to the prospective uh, our audience or the PhD students who want to say what exactly is happening in the ultrasound. So this would have given you a, a typical flavor that where the technology is evolving. And the key takeaway is all about like, we used to work on 1D, a primary a Doppler data. And here we are on a 4D. This has not happened overnight. The parallel technologies were also the transmitter technology also evolved. This is like one crystal technology, transmit and receive. This is all about number of crystals have increased. Now we have 256 crystals and you have a volume probe where the mechanized uh, probe will just shift the uh, ultrasound uh, crystals in a manual mode. Now we have a technology where it is a matrix. All the crystals are in a, in a two by two form and you can get all the information in a, in a one jiffy. So the MIPS have increased, the graphics capability has increased, the transducer capability has tremendously moved ahead. And the era of image enhancement to now we are applying ALDL. We are, we are not even aware, we, we don't want to even know 
what exactly is anatomy of interest? You, you say this is a region of interest, segment it, and I will learn from that and segment it. Earlier, if I have to segment, uh, let's say, heart wall or a, or, a, or a lesion, I need to train, I, I need to learn the signature of that um, ultrasound image. But now it is all about, you just have to create a, have a ground truth for that. And the AL, uh, I'm just trying to simplify things here. The AI DL has moved the bar quite forward and you can get the entire segmentation and the, the new frontier is all about, yeah, you segmented it, now present it in a more, using the graphic capability in a more realistic way. It should look like lifelike. You can see on the screen, some of the images are not the ultrasound, the way it looks. It has got a lot of image enhancement has done. It looks like the real fetus, if you can rip open, maybe the bad word, if you can open up the, uh, yeah, the uh, abdomen and see, one could see in real time the skin signature of that tone. So the technology of rendering has been now moved to far more realistic way. We call it a realistic view rendering sort of thing. And that's my take. Uh, I hope you got a complete summary like where the technology is evolving. And uh, I'm prepared to take questions here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Srinivas. Uh, it was really amazing talk, starting from 2D, 3D, 4D, and a little bit of 1D also. Uh, so audience, do we have any questions? If you don't have a question, I have because I spent two decades in ultrasound. I'm still trying to understand the ultrasound signature. If you're able to understand it, then I have a question for you. <laughs> Okay, then I made my things clear, I guess. Yeah, we got uh, a question. So great presentation, sir. Even though there is significant evaluation of technology in ultrasound, there are still some missed out heart thickening problems identification. What may be the reason? Mangla is asking this question. Uh, I missed the last sentence. What, what is still being missed out? Heart thickening problem identification. Yes, I, I do agree on that. There are a lot of uh, those, those challenges are there. So that's precisely I'm saying that as a technology evolved, uh, as you can see the wall, we are going at a level of wall in real time segmenting it. So one could even can go next level and can even present the thickness of the wall also in corresponding to what you see. Yeah, that is still a, a open area which can be tackled as a technology evolves. I agree. Yeah, do we have any other questions? What are the major challenge handling ultrasound images? So, uh, as I said, initially ultrasound is all about grayscale domain. That precisely my profile pic is all about grayscale. Using just the black and white, one needs to able to uh, find it, uh, the real signature of it. Whereas in CT, MR, you can get far more preci precise anatomical segmentation and data. So ultrasound suffers with the challenges of uh, noise and there are a lot of internal reverberations. Maybe these words, I'm just throwing it without proper giving introduction about ultrasound physics, but we have noise challenges, they have internal organs. Some of them are deeply embedded down. So yes, there are those challenges needs to be circumvented uh, and the image quality, there is no limit, still has to be improved. I think that's the next one, next stage of evolution. Okay. Uh, there's one more question from Aparna. So what does she say? Thank you for a nice talk. Uh, what do you think is the future of multi-dimensional ultrasound imaging with handcrafted algorithm? What does she mean is non-AI, ML or DL? Other than that, the regular algorithms which we use. Uh, so uh, I've shown in the previous uh, thing where I have shown some of the things like handcrafted where one can use the markers to segment the contour of it. But I think that we have surpassed that one. There is because we don't have, the clinician doesn't have a time to use those tools. Can you do more automation? So earlier era, we used to apply those kind of uh, features, but I guess now uh, the hunger is to automate more. So it is on a downward trend. Yeah. So Ravi Arora says congratulations on patents and he wants to know any topics for biomedical students for their final year projects. So first, welcome to ultrasound. This is a very interesting domain. There are a lot of, uh, any diagnostic center, probably you can, using your university or something, you can collaborate. You can collect the 2D data. First of all, it is an amazing uh, starter to start with because um, most of the com computer vision uh, enthusiasts will work on a, a DSLR sort of images, but you start, 
really want to understand the beauty of these noise enhancement techniques, I would say, I would urge that one needs to work with ultrasound images. I think that is a good starting point, gentlemen. I hope I answered it. Yeah. So uh, Tribini has a question. She wants to talk. He wants to talk. Yeah, Tribini, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon. Hello. Uh, actually, uh, that I want to ask that you have implemented that unit probably uh, for the 2D to 3D. Uh, what are the actually you have faced the complexity and uh, implementations in the uh, which are the actually models uh, you have been simulated in which platform that unit? Because it has been very uh, tough to be uh, simulate and train the data in Google Colab or some somehow it has to be it's very tough to be because it was to be upload the all the images and it has to be trained and get the data. So what is your suggestions best size possible suggestions that how either because the image size will be very high quality. So if it has to be trained with the unit structure because itself it has a deep learning methods. So how you can uh, tell me that is there any uh, uh, what are the actually real time what you have faced the challenges and how you can solve that actually can you can give me the enlightenment something yes so i would uh, this will did not uh, i can answer in one or two sentences because all the references which i have shown tribeni uh, i urge these are available in ieee explore and spi digital library uh, there are some pointers are there there are something proprietary i urge you to go through those and if doesn't solve or answer your query you could uh, reach me out on uh, linkedin I will definitely try to substantiate further. Yeah, Shrinivas, a couple of more questions. Is it possible to detect chances of cerebral palsy early in fetal effectively using ultrasound? Uh, so I think the next evolution in ultrasound is all about uh, doing this kind of a uh, biomarker sort of thing. But at this stage, one can detect the Down syndrome quite accurately. Cerebral, cerebral palsy, um, I'm afraid uh, uh, it is still a little further down. I think we can do the Down syndrome. There, there's a chromosomal uh, defect uh, is there on the chromosome 22. I think it is trisomy it is called. So probably that can be detected using the image uh, as a biomarker. Cerebral palsy, I'm afraid it's still further down. Yeah. Uh, so Navdeep is asking, do ultrasound scanning cause muscular pain in the region of the scans? I will want to uh, give a clear... Uh, Thing saying that the ultrasound doesn't cause any kind of a harm because when you release a typical ultrasound system or a transducer, it goes through a lot of uh, evaluation about biocompatibility. It has not, no published literature in the past 30 to 40 years has any kind of side effects. So that's precisely the reason why it is being extensively used in as a non-ionizing radiation, uh, radiology equipment for a lot of scanning. So in musculoskeletal, it does even more phenomenal job. But there is an interesting point by the, uh, the one who has posed. By increasing the ultrasound frequency, one can use it for therapeutic, but that is uh, a debate for another day, another presentation. One can use ultrasound frequency for therapeutic, therapeutic value also, where it can cause some kind of a, uh, pain relief and things like that, but yeah, separate topic. Okay, there is another question. I guess you have already answered. What are the commonly identified major fetal abnormalities? I think I have uh, more or less explained yeah. that at this moment, the major goal in, in, everywhere in the world is to see that is my fetus of its correct size or uh, it does it fit to the proper percentile? Is the head orientation proper on the ninth, uh, ninth month where can I go for a cesarean or a normal delivery? These are the challenges currently being confronted and that needs to be propagated more. Uh, I guess those are the questions which the audience had. Uh, yeah, Ketan. So thanks a lot, Srinivas. And uh, I'm sure uh, we'll be organizing a couple of more sessions of this kind uh, yeah. for our audience and uh, varied audience. I mean, you see how interactive they are. I'm very happy with the audience as well as all our speakers. Special thanks to you for giving us insight about all the ultrasound, how it evolved and what are we at. Uh, I had one question, Srinivas, before we close the session. So uh, the software which you told, which you demonstrated using those videos and all that is available or is it something which is proprietary and we don't have access to that so See, i have these, some random images i want to upload and check uh so i'm afraid those things are not available that's precisely you need to work as an intern or work with samsung research to access those kind of features but uh, there are some other technologies available from ultrasonics where one can get the rf data and can do offline research so that that uh, dr abhishek will uh, 
connect and explain to you how it can be done. But some of the, all the software which I've shown is very proprietary and uh, yeah, it's released in the market. So. Sure, sure. Yeah, thanks a lot again. And uh, with this, uh, we'll close the session of first half. Uh, not first half, I mean, majority of the sessions. Next, we have three more sessions. Uh, we'll have a small break. Uh, so, Ketan, can you please display that? Yeah. So we have a small break now of around 15 minutes and then we'll be back exactly at 4.30. What we'll be covering is at 4.30 is uh, some of the tutorials on how you can do machine learning in a medical image processing, signal processing very quickly without, uh, even though without a preliminary knowledge is required, but even with less preliminary knowledge, what you gain from today's session, how can you quickly do machine learning using uh, some of the softwares and how you can find the database. So this is what we'll be learning. With this, we'll be taking a quick uh, 10 to 15 minutes break and come back at 4.30 uh, for three more sessions. And then we'll wind up for the session. Thanks a lot. You can stay back, uh, just go and come back. Uh, well, good evening all. Uh, so as we are on dot 430, uh, we would get started uh, with the next session, uh, which is from Dr. Abhishek Appaji, uh, who would be uh, sharing insights on tutorial on machine learning for uh, biomedical signal and image processing. Uh, Dr. Abhishek Appaji is currently associated with uh, uh, as institutional coordinator for R&D and associate professor at BMS College of Engineering, Bangalore. Uh, he obtained his Bachelor uh, of Engineering in Medical Electronics uh, with a university rank from BMSC, uh, Master of Technology in Information Technology and Masters of uh, Engineering in Bio Bioinformatics from University Vishweshwaraya College of Engineering, Bangalore. His PhD was in Mental Health and Neurosciences from Maastricht University, uh, Netherlands. And it is also noteworthy to inform that he is also serving as guest faculty uh, at Maastricht University, Netherlands, uh, post his PhD. Uh, Abhishek is also a senior member of IEEE and has <clears throat> been, uh, served as various volunteering capacities across uh, societies and chapter of IEEE. And currently he is also a treasurer of IEEE Bangalore section. Uh, with this, I hand over the virtual podium to Dr. Abhishek and um, for his talk. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Changappa. Uh, so let me share my screen. So I have uh, shared a couple of links. So what we'll be doing today is a uh, couple of, uh, I mean, in my session, we'll be doing three things. First thing is uh, MATLAB, uh, who were supposed to, MATFOX, who were supposed to come and uh, do the session, but uh, they've shared the materials as well as licenses, which is there in the chat window. So you can just go through, uh, the first link is online license link for all the participants. You can go and access the license if you already have license. So for example, I have license from BMSE. I'll be using that to demo it. But if you have uh, already have, please go ahead and use that. If not, you can use the license, which will be valid for around uh, one week or so for you to understand what we'll be doing. And uh, second link is MATLAB Drive link, which is similar to Google Drive, where you can go there and uh, use the codes as well as some example uh, topics, which is the which is uh, around uh, deep learning and machine learning. Some of the examples. So first thing, I'll be showing you some of the presentations which MathWorks have shared, and I'll be uh, showing you some of the slides of there. Second thing, I'll tell you how to search for data, which is the famous repositories for biomedical or non-biomedical, where do you find those data? And third thing I'll be showing you is a demo on how to do uh, machine learning very quickly and very fast without much of, uh, even though if you are starter, beginner, it's very super easy uh, for you to do how you will be doing that. So first, uh, first, let us start with the slides. So altogether, it will be around 30 to 40 minute session. Uh, so first thing I would say is just, uh, uh, I hope you can see my slides. Yeah, so uh, this is MathWorks account. If you have, you can go ahead and do it, uh, already have. If not, you can create an account, it's for free. And you can use the license, uh, which is, uh, uh, which is sh shared in your link, which I've seen. And then this is the drive link, which is already shared again in the chat, and you can use that. Uh, 
so what will be i will be covering few of the topic not all the slides uh, this slide deck also will be shared in the group on whatsapp group you can go ahead and check that later which is given by spandana from mathworks and uh, uh, so this so this is more of traditional programming what we do is data and program you have you combine that in a computer and you'll see the output if you want classification but uh, more of machine learning and deep learning we have data uh we just see what's the output which means labeling is already done and we try to get a program which is known as model so program is nothing but it's a model and uh, uh you know the difference between all together we can call as artificial intelligence which means that uh, humans if you are mimicking what humans are doing that's artificial intelligence and under that there's machine learning and deep learning machine learning is using some statistics and some programming uh you will come up with the tasks which are which humans can do more of learning for classification and regression classification into say male female uh cancerous non cancerous and so on and regression can be prediction so i want to know what when will covid 19 die there was a prediction very recently from one iit professor who said r value r square value man it will uh, in another 14 days it will be on p so that is what is uh, regression so prediction is regression and then there is a subset of machine learning which is deep learning which doesn't need any features so machine learning you have to extract the features and then feed it to your uh, model and it will classify help in classification or regression whereas deep learning it doesn't need any kind of feature extraction it is directly uh, does the feature extraction within itself but only constraint is you need a huge amount of data to come up with a good accuracy this was in late uh, 2000 2000 that 2010 or something where deep learning became very famous though you know neural networks existed from long long time ago some of the artificial intelligence which we use day in day out in our life uh, detecting objects and there's uh, many of the uh, deep learning models available online you can just go through that and find out how it is widely used for uh, uh this one i mean even as i even this adobe reader which i'm using it actually gives me this see if you if i just click on this it says cars sitting on bicycle description of this and all those things so even your adobe is using your deep learning i'm some of the machine learning algorithm uh there are some links which i would uh, suggest you to go through and look at it it's all hyperlinked i'll be sharing the slides soon and you can go and see how it is developed in uh, matlab and how they have uh, given some of the examples okay it's it's there in many of the fields not only necessary in biomedical but many of the fields electrical electronics and so on so forth and uh, one of the important slide which i want to show is uh, uh, for signal processing how it is been evolved uh, you know machine learning as i said it can uh, it is regression and classification but before that we can classify into two types of machine learning type learn i, I mean supervised learning and unsupervised learning supervised learning is you already have labeled data so you know what is the input data and you know what is output data and you will develop a model based on that whereas unsupervised learning is you know only input data but you don't know what's output data so i'll just plus uh, one of the famous unsupervised learning is clustering so based on some similar features you will classify it as saying this is cat and this is dog because you wouldn't have labeled whereas in supervised learning you will already label it saying this is cat and dog and then you will see given new data and then for training you will give the labels for uh, testing and validation you may not give labels whereas uh, if you want to predict something you want to predict uh, uh, compute compute day ahead system load uh, how much is our forecast or what is a covid 19 what is the load on the machine and things like that that is nothing but prediction is regression so here if you see uh, but classification is more like you want to classify whether a person is sitting or standing or sleeping based on accelerometer input or gyroscope input or it can you can just say this person is male and female based on some of the features which you give so that is nothing but classification clustering is nothing but see if you see here also i mean clustering easy thing what uh, your machine learning does is it will see the colors and cluster saying this is one cluster this is second cluster third cluster you you know in even if you are a student you would have uh, gelled along with one single group and that is one of the cluster there will be another group which is another cluster there will be multiple groups so based on some similar features similar bandwidth or similar frequency there will be cluster that's called clustering 
uh, there are multiple algorithms which uh, you can uh, uh, have in uh, both regression and classification. Same algorithms you can use. Like for example, I can use SVM support vector machines for regression uh, or support vector regression, and I can use for classification support vector machine for classification. There is discriminant analysis, near base, nearest neighbor root, uh, linear regression, GLM, SVR, GPR, ensemble methods, decision tree, so on and so forth. Whereas for clustering, there is again similar kind of it. One of the famous one is K-means clustering or hierarchical clustering, Gaussian mixture, hidden Markov model. So all these are different types of uh, which we are doing. Uh, we will see in uh, uh, in uh, when I show you the demo. Okay. So main thing, if you see, even if you want to do machine learning or uh, uh, deep learning, what we usually teach in engineering or uh, something similar courses is that we tell them data cleaning or data preparation and how do you acquire the actual natural intelligence. So, for example, if I want to say this thing is cancerous, this is not cancerous. So, how will I acquire the data? I go to doctor, I talk to them, take the data within the head of the doctor and put it in my machine. That's more of data preparation and cleaning. And how they are doing the classification that you do by using AI modeling which will include uh, how do you design and there is hyperparameter tuning, which means there are some tunings which have to do within the machine learning or deep learning. And then you do testing or validation. Uh, we usually stop here. There is not much beyond that is how you, how do you put, say for example, there were many students, even the uh, Niramai also showed mass detection, right? So there were my students also who did mass detection, but how do they deploy in real time in college or in public place in Metro station? Uh, that is more of deployment, what we are talking about. Do you want to deploy? Uh, even uh, uh, there are students who just do uh, deep learning to find out uh, whether it is cancerous or not. They'll do deep learning to segment a part of the uh, tumor or something like that, automatic segmentation. But how do you implement this? That is deployment, which many of our colleges, we, we are started teaching it. And another part of uh, AI or machine learning is Inter, uh, interpretable AI or, you know, how do you interpret? So whatever AI, how is we, how are we going to learn about AI is, it's a black box. You just combine the black, uh, and you just give out input and you get an output, classification, regression or anything. In between what you have is a black box. What's happening in black box, nobody knows. Now what people and what scientists and researchers have been doing is inter, interpretable AI or explainable AI. Your artificial intelligence or your machine learning or your deep learning model should definitely tell what kind of AI, how the operations are happening. What are the features which is being extracted automatically if it is deep learning? Uh, you know, machine learning, you give features, but deep learning, we don't give, but we should know why this is showing this much of accuracy and what features is more important. That is more of interpretable or explainable AI, which you can see many of them are talking about it every day in, day out in many of the se seminars, webinars and so on. Okay, so uh, you can see a real ECG signal is there. There are codes available already and uh, the database which we'll use here is uh, uh, PhysioNet. You can just, when I share this, you can click on the hyperlink and try. So uh, features have been extracted and then it will classify with this normal ECG or uh, abnormal ECG. Okay, you can just go through these slides. I'll be sharing it with you. So more specifically, what is deep learning is, uh, uh, it's more about, as I said, uh, the model which you see on the right side, you have input layer, output layer, what's happening in between, you won't know, and all the features, the input layer is just the data, raw data, uh, or images you're giving, and it will tell you what uh, classification it does, okay? And there are blocks and all, we'll not go in depth in it, because that's not scope of this particular talk. But uh, there are multiple uh, convolution, neural, multiple neural networks, which is evolved over. It's already available for us to explore. And uh, you need not really sit and do everything yourself, but everything is available for you. You have to just use it. There are transfer learning algorithm. Already there's existing uh, model, which is available. You have to just pick it up use it for your data, that's called transfer learning. Uh, will it work? And you have to just tweak a little bit of hyperparameters here today. It's not so easy the way I'm talking, but it is possible if you know the theory behind it. Okay, so uh, another uh, thing I want to show you is, uh, 
i'll be showing you some of the uh, uh demos but uh, you can just go through this from mathworks and there are some courses which they can use and uh, it's it's free also there are some courses but if you want additional courses you can just go ahead and uh, uh, use it for uh, if you have licenses and these are some of them which is already there for example uh, uh, for finance robotics there are some things but what we are interested today is medical imaging 3d brain tumor segmentation and breast uh, uh, cancer tumors classification those things are already available as one of the example uh, content so this is what uh, is a little bit uh, uh, teaser for you about what is machine learning and uh, deep learning how do you use that and so on and so forth the next thing which i want to share is uh, about uh, uh, the repositories so first thing what uh, we usually do is uh, uh, i'll just increase yeah yeah so first thing what every one of us want to do is uh, to understand if uh, Uh, where can i find the data set so even when i started my phd first thing is uh, when i went to guide then i had to acquire data myself around 300 patients data and then do some analysis put machine learning uh, do some uh, other image processing techniques publish papers and get my phd so it was a long journey but for me unfortunately the hypothesis which i had proposed i didn't have anything ready made data for me to work on but now if you see there's huge amount of data which is available for us even medical non medical data if you want to do some machine learning deep learning image processing signal processing and so on and so forth very famous data sets uh, for example which we showed was uh, physionet is another data set so it's it's very famous data set which is available from mit and uh, there is lot of uh, freely available as well as uh, you know data set which is uh, uh, you can see the list of data set on the screen and it is freely available for all of us to download and do some tweaking and all this is majorly on ecg uh, that is electrocardiogram and related signals and uh, you can just uh, take this there is also some eeg data which you will find in physionet uh but another one is a uh, major one which we'll be seeing is best thing is you know kaggle is one of the uh, important platform where you can find out the data sets it's more like very unique one and uh, if you become an expert uh, uh, understanding coding and all what you can exactly do is just go ahead and uh, use your data set here and then uh, you can participate in a lot of uh, uh, competitions which they do so you can search i want for classification you'll get lot of them on classification no i want for nlp natural language processing you'll get that or you want something on uh, say um, computer vision you'll get it you want data visualization you'll get it no i want specifically on ecg then you will get all the data sets of 42 days such that which you'll get on ecg Uh, or you may say i want on retina there are multiple data sets of diabetic retinopathy other uh, retina fundus we uh, adapted uh, uh, oct optical coherence tomography stare oct retina all of them so this is more like consolidated one at one single point of place you have to just log in and you have to download you need not pay anything for the downloading the data set only thing is one thing i want to warn you if you want to work on any of these database a uh, problem is once you are part of it and you have downloaded there will be thousands of people who are also downloading it and they would have already done lot of analysis on this and published the papers also and they would have participated in competitions which kaggle would have done so for example this is very recent updated two days ago is on omicron daily cases i want to know by country so it can be what kind of data it can be csv data because it's a huge it can't fit in excel or it can be image database it can be a uh, signal database it can be excel sheet it can be text or it can be dot data and all and few of them who are already working and who are uh, uh, already doing something they would have also pushed their code on the kaggle for you to you reuse and do some thing but remember ethically you should be uh, ensuring that you won't be uh, exactly doing and publishing it your reviewers will catch you that you should be aware of it okay so this is something which is kaggle very nice and very lot of database you want on medical image also you will get there's lot of image as well as signal databases like ct medical images somebody wanted covid 19 x ray image right viber was asking so you want so that is also available here it's not that uh, chest x ray uh, anything there's lots of such database as well as code you will be getting 
Okay. So next thing which I want to show you uh, for machine learning is UCI machine repository. So this is UCI machine learning repository. This is available. This is little older one, but the new website is uh, will be coming very soon. But the beta testing have been released beta version. So this website gives you some of the data set which is there. So uh, you can just donate your data set, they'll validate if you have given everything and then it will be published in the website. You can say you have donated a data set which you have acquired or it can be something popular data set which is already available for download and see the date when it was acquired. We will be using this Iris data set for our tutorial when I'll show you some of them. And this is again new data sets which is recently put. Uh, this is on uh, 3, 12, 2021, third of, uh, uh, December 2021, and these are very recent data sets which you have. MNIST is like handwritten digits. That's also updated, and you see there are 10 label classes, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, Okay, these are some of the database, so, and most of them you'll see, you'll be surprised to see that you will also get medical database. For example, I want uh, medical, I can just log in. I mean, I can just search. You'll get uh, medical image tamper detection, and if you want, just uh, see heart, you'll get heart disease and different kinds, spect and spect and so on and so forth. This is also, but this is, remember, is for machine learning, not for deep learning. You won't get much of images, but you may get some of the data which you'll get it, okay? So this is UCI, uh, uh, Irwin, UC Irwin uh, machine learning repository, which is very famous for us to actually search and see all those things. There are some filters as well, which is available for you. You just want images or you just, let's clear this and then you want tabular sequential time series text data sets what kind of it is you want life science then you will get all the related medical data sets here okay so it's very easy for you to uh, do or you want for tasks something of classification regression and clustering you just go here and do it it's super easy for you to find out and then i want to work on lung cancer then do it and you saw even uh, Shiv Tej was talking about breast cancer data set, you can get something here, okay? And the best thing, uh, like anything we want, first thing we do is go to Google. Uh, there is a, even one, like how we have Google patents for patent, we have Google images for Google, we have uh, Google, uh, 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 Google Scholar for articles. Similarly, we have Google data set. It is called as data set search. It's uh, data set search dot research dot google dot com is the URL. Uh, I can paste it for you. I, I guess most of you have learned. This is very recent one. It's not the too old. So what you have to do is you have to just click on. I mean, you have to just search like how you search in Google. What kind of database you need? You just say if you want COVID nineteen, uh, it just gives you all the database. You know how much database you've got. Uh, 100 plus data sets found. So WHO has something, uh, the Statistica has something. You, can, you have to just go here and then click on these things. You will be getting what kind of data you have to just explore and you will see all those things. And it is also connected to Google Scholar. You can say, uh, see some articles who have published using these data sets, okay? And you can filter it by how, uh, what platforms and what topics and all those things. Uh, if not, I want something related to ultrasound. Just click on this, uh, just give ultrasound, you'll get uh, lots and lots of uh, database like breast ultrasound, fetal plane ultrasound, transcranial ultrasound and all those things. This is more like a Google for exactly Google, which has come up with this uh, data set for what you have got. And remember, when you do this, you have to just go and explore the particular website. It's like in Google directly, you won't get everything. It's a search engine. This is also exactly a search engine for data set. You have to just go here and then explore at Kaggle, log in and do it. Or there may be some formalities for you to follow, which you have to do and then access the data. Like if you want NASA data and so on and so forth. Okay. I gave you some insights about where you can find the data set if you want to work on some of the uh, ready-made things. But remember all this public data sets or you have limited access data sets, these have been explored or beaten to death many of the data. Like if I, I'll show you one of them, which is Iris, which has been used since ages for pattern recognition. Even today also for tutorials, that's very easy for people to understand, we use that. Okay, 
So let's come back. So this was first portion. I told you about a little bit of AML using slides, which I'll be sharing on the WhatsApp group. Second thing is I told you a little bit about uh, UCI machine learning. Uh, I showed you about where are the data sets you can find, Physionets and uh, Kaggle is one more and then all those things and so on and so forth. So there's a question which is coming from audience, which says, is it possible to have our own data set? Yes, exactly. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, uh, we should have our own data set, which is very, it's not easy. Say if I want some, I'll tell you about my PhD. When I wanted retinal images to, to do something uh, related to psychiatry, I had to run around and get collaboration. So I collaborated with Nimans and later got the data set. Before that, I had to take ethical committee clearance. I should have a machine to acquire it. So I had to buy, buy a machine. I had funds fortunately and so on and so forth, then reimburse the patient and so on and so forth. So it's very uh, tough for uh, uh, for us to do all those things uh, because it's too uh, time consuming and you have very limited time. If you are master's or bachelor's students, you just have one year to do your project, six months to do your project. Will you be having bandwidth? PhD at least three to four years, you have bandwidth to acquire data for one year and then the analysis for another year, first year literature survey and so on and so forth. But it's very tough for us to do if we are doing some analysis by ourselves. Okay, so Ravi has question as well as Surabi. I'll uh, talk to them. Uh, I'll answer these questions at the end. I got the questions, but I'll answer them at the end. So uh, let's go to Iris. Uh, uh, this is one of the database. What is this database? See, this is one of the database by a person known as R. A. Fisher. In 1936, he had his own classic data set, uh, one of the earliest data set which we have used for classic classification. This is like age old data set. And even today, many of them use, even in my class, I use this whenever I'm telling machine learning, uh, I'm taking machine learning class. So what is this iris data set is? If you see, this is the iris flower and this data set has some features. What are those features? So sepal length, length of the sepal, next to sepal width, petal length, petal width, and uh, these are the database. Uh, it has those values. And the class is three types of classes. So I'll just show you uh, this one. Uh, Iris data set. I'll show you the images. So yeah, if you see here on the right side, what you can see is what is sepal and petal. So this is sepal and this is petal. So alternately, you can see sepal and petal. And these are three types. What is the sepal length and sepal width? Petal length and petal width is being tabulated in one of the Excel sheet. And uh, uh, second thing is iris versicolor and iris setosa, iris virginica. is three of the classes which want to classify. So when we calculate the sepal length, petal length for all the three of them, and we want to find out which class it belongs to. Uh, is it versicolor, I mean, versicolor uh, type of uh, flower or setosa flower or virginica flower? So you have to extract that. So similarly, if I want to do for ECG classification and all. So what I'll do uh, if you have seen the ECG. So this is ECG a signal. So what I'll do is I'll just take what is the QRS complex I have, what is the height, what is the width in simple terms, what is the frequency and what is the amplitude. I'll take, I'll tablet everything like for example, PR segment, QRS complex, ST segment, PR interval, QT interval. All these things I'll calculate, put it in one Excel sheet and upload it to either Python, Matlab or any of the software to do machine learning. So because this is very basic course, which I'm trying to do, I'm just uh, helping you out to understand how it works uh, so that you can do it faster. So once you extract this feature, we are not covering that in this tutorial. We are just showing you how we can run this very fast away. So what I'll do is I'll take this database, which I've already showed you here, that is Iris database. I'll download it and I'll upload in my MATLAB uh, because it's easier and faster. I'm showing because Python needs installation. I have to tell you what is Python coding at all. This is more of GUI base, which I'll be showing you. So what you'll do is once you log into MATLAB, I've already logged in and you, I already have a license, which uh, you can also access the license I've already showed you uh, in the chat box. So I'll open MATLAB online. This is online uh, feature. What is the uh, online is I can sit at home or even in college anywhere I can do this. But only problem is you can't run heavy uh, algorithms on this because it takes more time because it's been computed on 
uh, on cloud. And it looks exactly like how it is here. So what I'll do is, uh, um, this is command and all. It's just very easy, I'll just show you. So I'll store my data in a variable A equal to, I'll say iris underscore data set, which is a pre-built inbuilt data set of uh, uh, MATLAB. And I'll just store it in one of the variables. So that is A. So if I double click on this, you should be able to see this. What are these database which you have? So this is uh, the first one is petal length, petal width, and uh, this is uh, sepal length, sepal width, something like that. Okay. So or I can use the data which is already I have, and I can use that as well. So once I do, once I have this data set, then there is a command known as classification learner. Okay. This is one of the inbuilt command which of the MATLAB, which will open a GUI for you to do some of the classification. Only problem in this uh, uh, place, uh, what we have, uh, because we are doing online, it will take little time for you to open up and all. And you will get a tab, uh, something which you are able to see on the screen and you have to just click on new session. Once you get on a new session, you should be able to find out what kind of input you have. So already it will take extraction of these things. Uh, A is my data set variable because you have already loaded on your workspace. Then you have to check all these four columns uh, because all of them are input. You want output, see here, all of the columns. I have to take, uh, I guess, uh, the one second. Let me take A equal to A. So I'll just open this up again. Yeah, see the way it is written is this way. Okay. And here, uh, the fifth class I want to create is, uh, uh, is it uh, one, one means it is one class, say uh, it is uh, Iris, there were three types, right? Virginica and other types. So one is one class, then other one is two, other one is three. I'm just labeling the data, that's it. Okay, this is randomly I'm doing. If you download the actual data set, you should be able to do that. So what I'll do is all the data set, I'll start labeling it uh, some random values. I have 150 such data. So I'll just copy paste it so that uh, Yeah, it's getting copy pasted, I believe. Okay, never mind. I'll just put uh, one, two, somewhere in between so that uh, it's just for demo. So I have three classes, right? So I'm just labeling one of them as one, two, and all. Randomly, I'm doing it, but you should do it uh, the way it is in the data set. Once you download, you'll get the proper data set. Okay, so I have all these things. Then I'll start a new session here. Once I start a new session, it will ask me, tell me what is your input and what is your output. So I see all my inputs is this. And uh, what is my input variable is uh, A. And my response is last one, column five, which is nothing but what type it is. Then I'll click on start session. It will do, uh, it will have all the uh, features here. And here, if you see on the top, let me zoom this little so that you can see. Yeah. So here on the top, you can see all the types of machine learning algorithm, decision trees, discriminant analysis, logistic regression, maybe support vector machine in the types of support vector machine, nearest neighbor, kernel, ensemble average, neural network classifier, so on and so forth. Okay. And then what I'll do is I'll use these features, either all linear, all all whatever you are able to see here it will take time so i'll not choose all i'll use all quick to train which is very faster to train i'll use that 
and uh, what features i want do i want sepal length sepal width uh, all those things i can individually select those or i can deselect them and keep it also if i don't want one of them because when you see uh, when you learn machine learning you'll understanding each feature engineering how do you do how do you remove a feature and things like that and you can also show what is your uh, um, predictors also using these things okay and it's very easy just uh, it's already loaded and uh, i'll just say what do you want uh, how do you want to sort your outputs that i'll show once you get an output so i'll click i've clicked all quick to train and then i'll just click on train it will start training and you can see that within few minutes you should be able to see all the outputs because it's online it will take little extra time maybe a minute or so if i have done the same thing in my system it would be faster my data is really uh, not that clean because i have two classes is only very less so it's giving more accuracy and things like that but you would get even if you have clean data set you will be getting accuracy of 90 95 and all okay so it has completed classification and if you see it will highlight these are the things which is very good and it is giving you proper accuracy uh if you see here one thing i want to say is see there are multiple algorithms which has been implemented almost nine kinds of algorithms are implemented and in this it will highlight which one is good tree is good that's why it's highlighted and next is knn in this medium knn cos knn cosine knn cubic knn this is giving 92 rest all are giving less than 92% and you would get a confusion matrix here confusion matrix is true positive false positive when you put in a matrix you will get confusion matrix and uh, you will also get true positive rate false positive rate all those things here and if you want you can get a scatter plot also in this so this is something which you can uh, really use very fast away and uh, you can use it so i just want uh, uh, some of them uh, just instead of this i want something else i can change and i can find out how my pattern is varying i just want you to show on the zero i don't want uh, i just want zero and one it will show zero and one and things like that you can do individual analysis also based on your uh, whatever you are doing so what you have to do you have to just see what numbers only thing i want to give caution is don't blindly use it understand why knn is giving you better accuracy why tree is giving you better accuracy why not others and is it right type of data you are feeding here uh, this uh, particular classification learner so to summarize what would you do in uh, this is one example in matlab you can do something similar there are many gui's available for you in python and all those things because i have to show you installation and all this is super easy one so i just showed you a uh, super easy one so that you can just understand so in uh, in short what is that you should be doing is uh, you can also save the model if you want and in short what you should be doing you should load your data in your workspace then uh, type the command classification learner select what is input and what is output what is your label that is response and what is your input and then go ahead and uh, do quick learn so that it will give you quick training if you want some individual one you can just click that also as you saw as you saw there is no much of coding and things like that okay so with this uh, uh, let me see some of the questions which we have and if you have any other questions also please feel free to uh, do that so as mohammed i have already told it's you can use your own data set you have to just feed in your matlab or python and then do it so why go to matlab when we have anaconda and google colab or kaggle okay so to answer this question uh, to be uh, to ensure that uh, i'm not promoting matlab or anything i mean this session matlab was supposed to take but they didn't couldn't come so i want uh, i want to ensure that uh, you get the message but you can use google colab you can use uh, pycharm and anything all of them are powerful and it's very easy google colab is free you just go and if you have a gmail account it's easier for you to use google colab for limited uh, uh, processing power and all those things yes please go ahead and use whichever you want and uh, what is difference between running a code in google colab and using pycharm software so uh, 
pai charm software uh, or google collab i am not sure i've not used pai charm software but yeah google collab um it's it's again cloud based one and you can easily run it as well as uh, it's exactly like your python if you have installed on your computer here you are trying to do on your uh, online in cloud so shall we use this data set for phd research instead of real time from radiologist yes so somebody is asking uh, can we use this data set for phd research instead of real time from radiologist see as a engineer we have to come up with a novel algorithm rather than we trying to use the existing one so what i would suggest is if you are doing your phd if you are getting a data set from radiologist again it will be very limited first and first getting a stuff which we have already discussed starting of the session second thing is if you want to use that also yes you can please go ahead and use it uh, uh, but you would be able to implement machine learning deep learning may be tough because the volume you may not get if you are getting a volume that's amazing i would really say uh, you are very fortunate to get uh, such a huge data set but if you are using any of the data set which is available online check related papers what they have published and do something different or novel different analysis different algorithm and so on so forth so somebody is telling uh, do we get the recording of the session yes you would definitely get it and uh, for doing phd is it necessary to have our own data set or is it okay to work on publicly available data set yes you can do your own publicly available data set but no, what novelty in terms of engineering you are getting is something which you have to do yeah ravi kiran is answering uh, pycharm runs on local machine but uh, collab runs on google server yeah so uh, dr raghavan says ge ultrasound machine siemens output are they based on these dl ml and ai technology i am not sure but uh, yes uh, uh, off late all ge siemens or uh, even uh, cern or any of them they are trying to use deep learning machine learning and uh, all those kinds of algorithm to input and see we are uh, it's very easy uh, for you to use those algorithms but they have their proprietary algorithm which many of the times they won't reveal but if you go online and search appropriate forum you should be able to find out exactly what algorithm they are using if they published a paper and so on so forth it's super easy for you to find out uh, what kind of algorithm uh, that paper have been used you can try to implement the same algorithm for your own data uh surabhi says how to train our own model in matlab software yeah so as i said instead of using the iris which i showed you you can put your own data only thing is if you are using machine learning you should have uh, extracted the uh, data for example uh, if you are working on say cancer and using uh, some ultrasound you are trying to predict where is the cyst so you should extract the features of cyst what is the radius of the feature cyst cyst and what is the uh texture of the uh, what is the length what is the width what dr ashin was was discussing right something similar you should also be able to extract those features put it in one excel sheet or uh, text and label them how i was trying to label 1 2 3 and all so similarly you should label and then feed it to your model and it will train it for you you have to just press click on some button but if you want to hard code also it is available in matlab i'll send you the uh, ppt in the whatsapp group and you can go ahead and do that yeah so do we have any questions before we go to the next session okay yeah looks like okay so we have one more question do you want to take it up dr abhishek yeah quickly let's see can we use data augmentation to increase the volume yes uh, yes mohammad data augmentation is nothing but especially when you are working with deep learning you need a huge amount of data so what do you do is you try to do data augmentation techniques what is data augmentation techniques you try to you have one image say one image of my face right now and then i will rotate the image i will scale the image i'll reduce the scaling of the image i'll do little bit of rotation i'll do some changes in the image uh, that is nothing but uh, it's very important uh, 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 for you to increase the data set then you can do all those data augmentation technique and still use it but remember many a times this data augmentation techniques will lead to overfitting or underfitting so you should take care of that if you if you are doubling the data or doing three times four times the same data then again the validation of your uh, 
uh, algorithm, the accuracy may come very high, but when you publish, try to publish a paper there, I'm definitely sure they'll ask you a question, you have done data augmentation four times, then uh, how sure that your algorithm work on your set of images. But yes, data augmentation technique is already known for all of us to increase the volume of the data, size of, the, I mean, number of data sets. So last one, do you have medical radiology support for this much nice talk, please? Yes, I do work with medical, uh, I, I mean, I work with many doctors. Uh, uh, so my collaboration with Nima and Skim, Stacy General Hospital, many hospitals, and uh, who are also research as well as they'll try to work with us. So we go to doctors, ask them the problem, try to get images, give them solution, which we have, I especially am doing it from almost 10 to 12 years. I'm talking to doctors, finding the problem and trying to give a solution. Yes. With this, thanks a lot for your patient listening and thank you, Chengappa, Ketan. Now, so we yeah. we'll go to the thank next you. talk. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. Uh, I am sure that uh, the insights and the tips and tricks that you shared in your talk would have definitely trickled the minds of the young researchers and also have gave them some insights to work on MATLAB and also other tools. Uh, so moving on to uh, our next speaker, uh, we have with us Mr. Uh, Vivek uh, Singhal, co-founder uh, and chief data scientist, uh, Salesstrat. Uh, Ketan, can we have the slides, please? So, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Vivek is an entrepreneur and thought leader in artificial intelligence and deep tech industries. Is an eminent data scientist and researcher with expertise in AI, machine learning, data science. Uh, Mr. Vivek has spent several years in India, USA, working for top MNCs and startups. Is also co-founder at Salesrat, a leading artificial intelligence startup that specializes in developing cutting-edge AI developer tools and APIs on the cloud for millions of uh, developers worldwide. Uh, previously, Vivek has been a serial entrepreneur and senior technology leader with strong experience in India, US, uh, in AI telecom and emerging uh, technology and leading MNCs such as IBM, AT&T, uh, and other uh, several startups. Uh, so with this brief intro, I welcome Mr. Vivek. Um, Mr. Vivek, over to you. Uh, okay, so thanks, Ketan. Uh, thanks for that uh, intro. Much appreciated. And thanks for inviting me. Uh, I hope uh, I can present an interesting session. You're having some remarkable sessions as I was seeing uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, who is a mentor and collaborator at BMS uh, College of Engineering. So, uh, so thanks for giving me this uh, speaking opportunity and hope to present an interesting session on the AI disruption, if you will. So that's where uh, my topic is, right? So let's get going here. Uh, just a brief intro. Uh, I think the intro was already done. So, uh, you know, I am an entrepreneur and running an AI startup uh, incorporated in US Delaware now, but the team is in India. I'm in Bangalore also a visiting faculty at BMS College of Engineering. Uh, so let me uh, get started here. I'll share my screen. So I hope you can see my screen and uh, let's make it interactive. Feel free to ask questions and whatnot, right? So uh, I'll try to present uh, in two parts. Uh, one is a bit of a theory, uh, but also a hands-on, uh, which makes it more interesting, right? So uh, let me just get started here. I think I have about one hour. Ketan, I have about one hour. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we can see. So, okay. Sounds good. So, thanks. Yeah. Let's get started here. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, AI, uh, I mean, uh, Dr. Abhishek was presenting a very nice session with machine learning algorithms and MATLAB and uh, other general concepts. So, you know, AI is uh, that technology uh, which is disrupting the world as we uh, speak. And uh, this is a quote from Sundar Pichai, our very own Indian CEO of Google. Uh, awarded with the Padam Bhushan Award today, along with Satya Nadella by Government of India. So, uh, just a plug on our startup. So, we are a, 
uh, developer tools platform. We did start with an AI training focus and a webinar community, which is almost 15,000 strong now on Meetup. And uh, we have uh, morphed or uh, evolved into a global developer tool startup. And, and that was the reason we chose to incorporate in US, uh, uh, but uh, still operating out of India. Uh, so we, are a, we have a SaaS platform, which I'll demo shortly, which allows you to do AI as a service on the cloud. The whole thing is running on AWS cloud and we are bundling almost four years of uh, you know advanced AI webinars and projects uh, work into this platform and have created an integrated runtime. So in some sense, uh, Dr. Abhishek mentioned uh, MATLAB, Colab, and you know uh, Anaconda. So we are actually competing in that space, if I, if you will. Uh, but uh, you know you can choose to use the editor. But I'll show you the editor we have, and and the uh, and the USB it has. And so we are very deep into AI R and D, uh, and that's how we drive the whole startup and the community and the platform. <clears throat> and I, my topic is uh, innovations in MLDL. So that's what I'll talk about first. So uh, I'll skip this. So our vision is to grow a massive developer ecosystem in AI and quantum computing and, you know, and create uh, enable global developers, which uh, today number around 30 million global developer population and enable them to develop breakthrough AI and quantum innovations for their end customer. So for our platform, the, or the, the typical audience is the global developer or AI learner and uh, which wants to uh, have easy to use tools to make end user application. So our, our audience is an AI developer or a quantum developer. So we are not trying to create healthcare apps, retail apps, financial services apps. Instead, we are creating developer tools and APIs, very similar to Anaconda or GitHub, right? Uh, or Stack Overflow kind of ecosystems. <clears throat> so I think uh, I'll just kind of skim through some of the basics, which uh, I think has been covered already. So uh, we already know AI is, uh, you know, about simulating human intelligence and machines. And ML refers to that set of uh, data science algorithms, which allow us to train AI agents. And ML is what makes AI intelligent. And DL is, of course, using neural networks, which are more advanced forms of machine learning, right? And lots of examples are shown at the bottom. So AI has uh, probably now lacks of uses and in almost every possible industry we can imagine. So this is how we uh, segregate it. It's an NVIDIA slide, by the way. So AI and ML in within that and deep learning, a specialized form of ML, right? So that's how we tend to see the hierarchy of the three techniques. Often people ask me what's the difference between data science and AI. So we use the term interchangeably, but in pure AI engineering terms or you know data engineering terms, there may be a slight difference, but we use AI data science machine uh, learning as loose terms nowadays or interchangeably, if you will. So uh, uh, we already know ML is also the art of, uh, you know, learning the, the relationship between X and Y. Let me use a marker here. So, so basically our customer has sent us X, Y data, right? Which uh, Sir Abhishek was also showing uh, shortly back. And we are trying to learn the relation using the ML discovery algorithms or ML algorithms, the relationship between X and Y, right? And that's the focus of the AI tra training process. And once we know the relationship between X and Y, we can use this equation or this trained algorithm to predict Y for any new input X, right? So first there is a data preparation step and there is a training step and then testing the hypothesis or the algorithm which has been trained and deploying it for production for inference purpose or actual usage of AI prediction, right? So the process of discovering this equation the exact relation between X and Y is called uh, is called as machine learning. And, and it could be something like if there are two features, so it could be something like uh, W1X1 plus W2X2, right? So those who know machine learning have seen this already multiple times. Those of you who are new to MLDL, uh, this may be useful. And of course, there could be thousands of input features, uh, which means that uh, I may have to write this in a vector notation, Y is equal to, W dot product X, which will encompass or be able to capture even thousands of input or independent variables X1 to X1000. And then Y could depend on lots of things such as a cancer prediction model, right? So I start with deep learning, a specialized form of machine learning. Uh, we use uh, interconnected networks, neural networks here, 
which is shown on the right. And uh, this allows us to uh, train more complex applications such as image processing, speech, uh, text processing, and so on. They, we are inspired by biological neural networks while developing these algorithms. And deep learning is referring to this area of ML where we use neural network. And it really broke out because of the innovations by Professor Geoffrey Hinton of a very famous AI prof from the University of Toronto. And, uh, and he was able to train an ImageNet model way back in the middle of 2000s. And also the availability of massive amounts of data through social media, ERP and, and, and sensors and whatnot. And so what here we do, we divide and conquer, right? If the relationship between X and Y is very complex, let's say, such as the case for object detection in an image, for simple linear models, uh, uh, you know, you can have classic machine learning like linear logistic regression decision tree. When the relationship between X and Y is very complex, such as the cases in image processing, then we need the power of a deep neural network, which is shown here. So it's a divide and conquer strategy. The first hidden layer may discover edges, right? So what is an edge here? An edge would be something like anything where there's a change, right? So anything like this is an edge, right? And then second hidden layer may discover corners and contours like this by combining the edges. This is a corner, this is a corner, right? And even this is a corner, right? Like this. And the third hidden layer will detect parts like eyes, nose, face, and the final layer will detect the whole object. I mean, this is just a simplified representation. Internally, these are all mathematical figures, right? So we can't really say the first layer is edges or second layer is corner. That is just to explain, but these are mathematical feature extraction, which a neural network does. And uh, machine learning, deep learning only work on numerical information or signals. So how do you convert an image into a numerical signal? Basically, we create a pixel vector. So if you know your digital graphics, that a, a, a graphics image is composed of pixel values of RGB, and we convert this into a pixel vector, right? And each pixel uh, it has an RGB value. So we just put that in a kind of a vector format and pixel one, pixel two, pixel three, and suddenly the image has now become a numerical vector representation. Red, green, blue uh, variation, right? And the same thing we can do with the grayscale image. Same thing we do with the text signal, right? We discretize a, a, as an MP4 or MP3 file into a vector or a text signal by numerical encoding uh, of the words into numerical uh, codes, right? So we are able to convert any kind of signal into a mathematical vector. And that becomes my input X vector. And the objective statement is to find the mapping from X to Y, the Y being the class determination, what is contained in this image, right? Or for speech, what is the sentiment of that speech? Something like that. Okay, so feel free to ask any questions. Otherwise, I'll keep moving here. Okay, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Basics of MLDL, uh, basic definition. There are those algos, there are quite a few and, and it does need extensive training. Uh, and, and there are courses at, at all, all your colleges and universities. And also with the uh, even actually we over an AI training company uh, from before, and uh, we now we have a platform to enable the process of learning and developing AI. I'll demonstrate that shortly. Any questions so far? So let's see some interesting AI applications, right? So of course uh, you know robotic concierge in front of a, in the in the front desk of a bank or a hotel, right? Robotic assistant which can do face recognition and then automatically uh, talk to you about, about your services you need and so on, right? And these, uh, so there are so many interesting applications like driving assistance, like for senior citizens or drunken driving interception, uh, where it will detect the, the person is drunk or senior citizen undergoing a arrhythmia heart attack, and it can, it can raise an alarm to the relevant authorities, right? Also driverless car, where it can automatically drive this car and you can sit in the passenger seat or a automatic vehicle damage assessment for insure, insure tech uh, apps, right? So you can take photos and it will automatically do damage assessment and an insurance underwriting without sending an insurance underwriter at the site or using a satellite photos to count the number of cars in a retail parking lot and being able to forecast you know, demand in, in that shopping mall based on number of cars or, or general shopping behavior. And of course, uh, footfall analysis where Big Brother is watching 
who all are there in the mall and so on, right? So a lot of interesting computer vision, NLP, uh, textual data, you know, speech uh, analytics, video analytics, and of course, tabular data, uh, you know, like we were seeing the iris flower data set in the previous uh, session. So all of that can be analyzed with AI for all kinds of predictive abilities. Everything will be converted into a mathematical vector. So at the end of the day, AI ML is a kind of a branch of applied mathematics, and you are, it is just doing certain mathematical algorithms underlying the code underneath the code. So a style transfer algorithm is shown here. You can see that I'm able to, you know, extract extract the content features from this image and style features from this image and create a resulting image, right? So AI is not only a predictive technology, AI also is a generator or creator. So we are seeing a lot of discussion around creator economy, right? There are a lot of platforms where you are able to create <coughs> right and and videos and art and other kinds of uh, so anything which has to do with creator aspect whether creating art movies writing novels uh, creating titles for multi articles or even writing the articles right producing uh, music you name it so uh, ai can also create all kinds of content in this case i am creating digital art uh, using an algorithm called style transfer protocol so i am extracting features from a content image and style from style image and combining and superimposing the two in the right side, right? So obviously there is some job displacement threat. I mean, AI is much too powerful. If, if we keep perfecting it over time, some of the jobs can get displaced, right? Whether they are truck dive drivers for self-driving trucks, uh, you know, or, or artists or even movie producers. And I often joke on a lighter note that one day, Karan Johar will call us AI scientists and say, well, I need help in movie production. Uh, or just I, I have a lighter though joke about that one. Okay, so stock market prediction, natural language processing, this is also called time series modeling, right? Wherever there is a sequential intelligence involved across a set of time steps, we apply time series modeling. In the old days, we were doing this with ARIMA, SARIMA statistical modeling techniques. Now we are doing it with a uh, neural network called recurrent neural network or its variation LSTM RNNs, right? So here what is happening is, so everything you need to be an X and Y, right? So the first, let's assume a Microsoft stock price. Uh, so if the first 20 days, so it is the X vector, right? And the Y vector is the same Microsoft stock price one time step shifted into the future, right? So that's, uh, the, those are the stars. So that's my Y. So now I got my X and Y. So I got uh, X from uh, day one to day 20. Uh, it's a closing price of Microsoft stock on New York Stock Exchange. And from, from day two to day 21 is my Y vector, right? The closing price of Microsoft stock on the stock exchange. So I got my X and Y information. And then I can develop a pattern between X and Y and create a stock trading bot. So in future, most of the financial services, you know, companies will be using such kind of quantitative trading or bots, or even for mutual fund allocation or stock market prediction. So in future, most of the warfare will be about algorithmic warfare, whether it's a warfare between JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, or it is a warfare between countries, you know, uh, tech, it will be a technological warfare. So whose algorithms, uh, whose technology is more superior, right? That's how it is going to be fought. And with the metaverse anyway, everything is going in the virtual world even we will just become a player in meta worse it seems at the moment there's some hype around it but there should be some interesting use cases coming out of metaverse evolution so this is text processing also called natural language processing one specific use case is depicted here which we call as extractive text summarization extractive text summarization so we are extracting some key words out of a set of text for creating a summarized output, right? So text summarization can be abstractive or extractive. So extractive means it is extracting some parts of the words, some of the words. Abstractive means it is intelligently creating a new summary. So this is very useful for compliance reporting, executive reporting, pharmaceutical research and whatnot, right? Because there's too much text and people don't have time to read it. So creating useful summaries is a very useful uh, you know, endeavor indeed. 
So driverless cars, of course, and buses, uh, and, and there are some experiments in US with Google Waymo and Tesla self-driving vehicle, right? So the so it's still under works. It's a very complex piece of software, hardware, and IoT. So it's not easy to create a highly or self-driving vehicle, but yes, a lot of research and work is going into it. And it uses almost so many areas of AI and IoT. <clears throat> you know, automatic inventory management. So this is a shelf in an inventory store and, and using a camera, it is doing real-time inventory management, right? It is predicting what items are being picked up so that it can automatically trigger, you know, purchase orders in the in the in the back end supply chain right all the way to the factory the the manufacturing factory and uh, so so the supply chain is going to get automated right supply chain forecasting and and retail demand forecasting everything is going the ai way and automatic uh, store checkout you see in the bottom left you know when you walk out uh, with a with a shopping cart with products in it it will automatically deduct the money from your wallet based on the items detected in your shopping cart, right? Already there are stores which are exper exper experimenting with cashierless checkout models. Even in India, we have seen some startups try this out. So pose estimation algorithm, where we are able to extract human pose, and this has interesting applications in augmented and virtual reality self-driving vehicles, cinematography or motion picture generation, gaming, fashion design. So companies like Mintra for their e-commerce website are also using pose estimation. Uh, this also feeds into AR, VR technology for you know virtual fashion shows without real human models, right? So uh, sports analytics folks uh, can use this for all kinds of analytical behavior, right? So very interesting applications of this computer vision techniques. And so we here we are showing some common vision AI tasks. Uh, so uh, on the left, we see what we call a semantic segmentation algorithm. Then in the second one is the classification and localization with a bounding box regression, right? So here I have uh, two tasks to identify <clears throat> not only the fact that this is a cat, which is the label here, but also do a bounding box regression to identify the four coordinates, right, of uh, where this these uh, these four coordinates of the bounding box are and they have multiple objects and i have to do it for multiple objects and i have to run uh, multiple classifiers right so is it a dog cat or something else dog cat or something else dog cat or something else right and then instant segmentation where even though there are two dogs but we are coloring coloring them in different colors so the le the leftmost and the rightmost is what we call as pixel level classification where we take each pixel of this image and classify it is belonging to the green zone, the yellow, the purple, or the blue, right? So this is this pixel would be classified as being the yellow, which means the cat body. This is the grass, and this is the background, and this is the sky, right? So pixel level classification. We classify each pixel as one of the four classes. And here also we are doing pixel level classification just for the three animals. So driverless car situation where we have Earlier, we used to have lidar and radar sensors on a driverless car, so that was uh, that was the way it started. But in recent years, we have seen computer vision AI being used, where there are a lot of cameras all around the car, and they are segmenting the the scenery around the car in real time. Right, so the cars are being colored with the pinkish hue, and 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 the buildings are with the bluish hue, and so on. And the pavement is in brown hue. Right, so of course the healthcare uh, imaging for chest X-ray and COVID detection and, and whatnot. I'll show you a healthcare stack we had created in fact, which is live on your AWS server. So this is like detecting, you know, uh, chest X-ray and the and the heart in between. So this is a robotic arm. Uh, you can find lots of YouTube examples. So where it is trained to pick up certain object from the shelf or an assembly line, right? So applications of AI are so remarkable that uh, we can keep working on it. And it's it doesn't feel like work. When I got my start in AI ML a few years back, I, I just got addicted to it. It's so interesting, right? It's almost like solving a puzzle, like a game. And the algos and their applications are so fascinating that it didn't feel like work. And I just got hooked to it, really. 
<clears throat> so here the here we are showing reinforcement learning so there are three major kinds of machine learning right supervised learning for the x uh, for the training data for every x sample the corresponding y label or the annotation has been provided by your customer or you're manually going to annotate it which uh, dr abhishek just did in the last example unsupervised learning would be when only x information is provided but you are still asked to do some kind of useful data mining from that right like clustering into high income group or low income group customers and the third kind is reinforcement learning which we are showing here so here we create we train uh, an agent policy based on action reward behavior so uh, agent is in state st and it can take uh, one among a bunch of actions and it chooses to take a certain action at and corresponding then it the agent system gives it a reward rt so these tuples are there and we set up the training environment with these tuples and and then after that the agent goes to a state t plus one and then again it has a bunch of actions to to take and it need to figure out which exact action it should take so by doing lots of episodes of this particular you know sort of a gaming kind of environment you are able to train an agent policy which knows what actions to take in what state to maximize the reward from here on right something like that like this for example being a mutual fund portfolio so if i have 100 stocks in my mutual fund portfolio which stock should be sold when and what price point right and which one should be what so that would need a rl kind of scenario it's also used for robotics gaming and self driving vehicles <clears throat> So some other applications of uh, RL are shown here, gaming, you know, energy management with that thermostat uh, right here and, and the game of Go and, and the robots, of course, and, and then the stock market uh, predictions. So uh, AI is being used for supply chain and demand forecasting. So we are showing uh, there are four kinds of, you know, demand which can exist. So if you notice in the left chart, this is static demand. This is 48 month behavior, so four year uh, behavior, and this is growing demand over four years. This is a static demand over four years, but with the seasonality pattern. So in Q4 of every year, the demand shoots up, which is the holiday festival season, right? When maximum shopping happens. And then of course, uh, growth plus the, the fourth quarter seasonality is being depicted here. So. So, so uh, AI can take care of all of these situations using recurrent neural network, other kind of sequential models uh, such as transformers. Uh, but, uh, but in the old days, we were using other techniques in Microsoft Excel and statistical tools, uh, which was being done for seasonality and growth patterns and demand forecasts. Right. So, uh, computer vision behavior, you know, checking your assembly line. Uh, you know, using cameras and, and really big brother monitoring of the employee workforce and avoiding pilferage and theft. And of course, uh, checking if everything is going smoothly. So the situation from a factory floor. And vision AI is automatically monitoring that instead of having human supervisors. So anyway, that was a, a couple of uh, ideas there, but I'm going to start doing some more demos. Uh, any questions so far? So, uh, yeah, okay, since there are no questions, let me show you one or two more interesting application. Then I'll go to the platform demo where you can see how we can develop AI solutions. So this is a driverless car scenario, right? And we are segmenting uh, the video being fed from the dashboard camera in real time. And it is figuring out uh, what is there in front of the car. Right. And then let me show you a, a gaming scenario as well. Uh, so this is a, we're trying to use reinforcement learning to train a, a, a car racing game. And our objective is to keep the car on the racing track while increasing its speed, right? So, but it's not perfectly trained. So it wears off the racing track periodically. So a lot of the modern gaming systems are new, now using various AI algorithms for you know creating some very intuitive gaming environments right recently we also had a session with indian air force engineering school and we were able to show them some interesting air force related applications let me see if i can pull them up
Yeah, check this out. So, this is a, a Chinese uh, war movie. It's a trailer actually, and we are doing pose estimation algorithm here. If you notice, right? So we are doing pose estimation on a, on the movie trailer here. The popular Chinese movie. It seems uh, we'll stop that there. See a couple of other things. Uh, Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, this one. So check this out. So we are doing what we call as image segmentation, right? So a, a car with a probability percentage and, and the person with the probability percentage. So there are some ready-made, you know, pre-trained algorithms which are able to do it, such as efficient net, efficient debt vision transformer from hugging face lab and so on they are able to do it outside out of the box but you can of course custom train it this is a, a you know indian sukhoi fighter aircraft and uh, so we are doing image segmentation on this video in real time right so so you can see it's able to identify the aircraft uh, uh, with some confidence score right and sometimes the pilot inside the cockpit as well Right, so very useful for defense and other scenarios. So there were some Air Force demos we were asked to do, so we did these. Uh, okay, all right. So if there are no questions, let me actually come to a platform demo. Uh, since we were talking about biomedical here, so we have created a uh, as part of our platform development, just as a, a you know a demonstration, we had created a healthcare stack of AI, and so this is a COVID nineteen X ray analyzer, and uh, so here we are using, you know, uh, uh, a pre-trained ResNet model on National Institute of Health. NIH has uh, published a data set with 110,000, you know, COVID and, and healthy chest X-ray images. So we trained that on that model using a ResNet uh, computer vision model. And we are predicting COVID pneumonia or normal with a confidence score, as you can see. And you can, of course, upload your custom images. And we are also showing a uh, uh, explainable viewpoint. So there is a concept in AI called explainable AI. So here we are using a, a technique called grad cam, which uh, analyzes the class activation maps of the CNN and is able to explain why it's doing what it's doing. Right. So this is a COVID-19 predictor on chest X-ray. We can also analyze the uh, you know retinal damage due to uh, due to the scan proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So using a, a retula scan from an ophthalmologist clinic, uh, we can we can analyze it uh, with the computer vision AI to predict the probability of you know uh, retinal damage, a proliferative diabetic retinopathy. So you know diabetes can actually make people blind because it damages the eye and by creating blood vessels on the retina of the eye. So when when somebody has diabetes, they are also sent for an eye checkup also apart from the diabetic control. So this is the same COVID-19 detection with help of CT scans as opposed to chest X-rays, right? So here we we are again we are able to do a, a sort of segmentation algorithm and basic classification algorithm. So we are assigning a probability score whether it's a COVID positive patient or normal patient, right? Based on a CT scan instead of a chest X-ray, right? So brain tumor classification. So this is all medical radiology. Uh, with AI, and uh, we are identifying three kinds of brain tumors here. Right. So again, there's a probability score. So AI is always an approximate science. It assigns probabilities for everything, and then you'll have to uh, kind of take a subjective sub SME call whether you are satisfied with that accuracy. This is a blood slide under the microscope for for detecting you know malarian parasite. So infected with malarian parasite or not infected. Right, from blood slide under the microscope. And of course, we can do text summarization, which we saw in the PPT before. So take a long form text and create a short form text automatically with natural language processing technique. This also comes under a branch of NLP called NLG or natural language generation. We can, of course, start the session 
upload custom data set, whatever we want to infer and then just start inference. So this was developed as a demonstration or academic solution, but we have not tried to take this as a startup model for us. We have instead mobbed into a developer tool startup. And this is a named entity recognition from a set of text, pharma text in this case, right? So, okay, so there are a couple of such things here, right, there's COVID-19. So this is like a Google search engine where it can basically, you know, find articles on the internet which match the search query which is given at the top. So it will do a semantic te textual search, semantic similarity algorithm where to try to find uh, papers on the internet by scraping the internet maybe or from a corpus of literature where that kind of query has some remote reference, right? So somewhat similar to Google search, if you will, but that does a more broader search. Uh, so, and then you can, of course, do drug safety compliance and reporting, which all the COVID companies had to go through before their vaccine was approved. So this was a, a demo of the healthcare platform, but our, in, in terms of my own startup, uh, uh, you know, our focus has been creating a AI development and learning platform, which is this one. So this is sort of our main focus domain now in my startup, but it is a very easy to platform to learn, develop and deploy AI. So you can also call it an ML ops or AI ops platform, but technically it's not full ML ops because we are missing the data engineering, which is a very big segment of ML ops, but it is partial ML ops. So you can easily learn, develop and deploy AI on it. And here we are competing with Colab and Aconda with PyCharm, right? And, and MATLAB ecosystems in effect. So anybody can create a free account here. And then once you create a free account, you can just simply log in here. And once you log in here, and then we are creating a, a growing marketplace of projects on this platform. If you want to learn Python or play with those projects, their Python projects, the ML projects, deep learning projects, and so on. So, uh, so we continue to grow this marketplace and we have a growing internship community. Uh, you know, so apart from our extended community of 15,000, we have a 200 people plus internship community and they help us keep making, they help us making more and more projects here. So we are here, we are bundling the project with runtime. Unlike the fact where you had to take the GitHub code, put it in your local Anaconda or Colab and try to make it run, which it won't run because it was not tested in that environment. Here, everything is tested and certified along with the runtime. So I've checked out these packs, so it's already showed owned and I can check out the remaining packs as well. And then once I've checked out the pack, I'll start the workspace and launch my Jupyter Lab Editor. <clears throat> the whole thing is running on cloud. So just you need internet, no local software installation needed. So here we support classic Jupyter Notebook interface, a Jupyter Lab interface, also a Unix shell command line interface. If you are a Linux, uh, if you like command line interface, so we also support, you know, a Linux bash shell here. Right, you can do uh, VI programming here. But if you want to use notebooks, all those packs will give you jumpstart projects. So let me demonstrate some of them. Let's say we are doing machine learning. So we'll, when I'm not trying to kind of pitch my platform here, but uh, just using it to demonstrate uh, some of the interesting application. So feel free to use a platform of your choice. Uh, so I'm just saying that, okay, here's, uh, you can, you, these are some of the areas we can focus on in terms of learning and research, right? So if you have a local Anaconda or Colab, by all means, and they also support, you know, different kernels like Python, PyTorch, TensorFlow, and you can install, uh, if it's not there, you can do a pip install, right? If you have been an ML developer. So once we have said, let's say you want to develop computer vision, so phase detection algorithm. Uh, so we have a project here, which you can customize or do incremental machine learning. Uh, by uploading your custom data sets using this upload command and have a predict function. Once you're satisfied with your uh, model accuracy, uh, then you can actually deploy it here. So this is something which is missing in most of the other editor systems. So this is different, definitely a huge uh, a USP we have here. Uh, so you can here actually deploy your AI model as a serverless API, okay? So if you have worked in DevOps or serverless API deployment, you can deploy this, your AI model, the predict function of it, 
as a serverless API. And uh, you can even test it right here with, uh, with your, uh, your, your particular API authorization key, your username in the account and the API name. So I'm testing the sentiment analyzer API here. And these API key are available in the, in the deploy models dashboard in my account. And so I have deployed three models already, image classifier, question and answer chatbot and sentiment analysis. And I've created an API gateway endpoint key. And I have connected this API gateway key to these three models. So it can call all of these models. So this is using what we call as the API gateway service of Amazon Web Service. And it allows you to publish you know, API serverless APIs, which get invoked at runtime. Right, so there's a difference between server oriented, uh, server, uh, you know, connected or asynchronous architecture and asynchronous client server architecture. So serverless API means asynchronous client server architecture. Uh, we, it only gets invoked when somebody calls the API, otherwise it is in sleeping mode. And it doesn't need to have a live web server running as in case of, you know, uh, you know, uh, server or uh, synchronous architecture. In most web servers, app servers, if you have done web development, the web server has to be running listening on a certain port to an incoming IP request, right? Uh, or socket request. But here a serverless API, it is resting till it gets called, you know, over the internet. So uh, that was a demo of this system. If you are a mobile and a web developer, but you don't want to do AI coding, but you still want to consume AI as a service, let's say you want to do some text classification on, sorry, image classification in your mobile or web app, uh, you're running a startup or project, whatever, you can call our ready-made image classifier using the REST API protocol, uh, which is a JSON web service request. And the spec of the REST API protocol is given here along with sample code, JavaScript sample code and Python sample code. So, uh, okay. So that's about it from my end, but I'll take any questions now. And, uh, and as I said, feel free to use whichever platform you like to use. And let me just check the questions here. Yeah, uh, so there are a couple of questions, Vivek. Uh, one yeah. of them is, uh, which data set was used to predict, uh, predict COVID-19 from chest X-rays? Yeah, so let me answer that. So. Uh, the so that was the NIH COVID data set. So NIH is the US healthcare body, NIH COVID data set, right? So it's a very popular data set. Uh, so for, for public benefit, National Institute of Health in the US government has published a very large, uh, you know, data set. And we were only using a mini version of it with 110,000 COVID chest X-ray images, but the huge amount of data set available. And this is also a Kaggle, uh, hackathon problem which is available on Kaggle. So we downloaded it from Kaggle source, I think, but there's huge amount of data now available. So lack of data has often been solved because governments and companies have been publishing huge data sets. So let me go to the next question. Yeah, the next question is any features to differentiate between COVID and pneumonia? So that is the art, that is the magic of AI, right? The magic of AI is Okay, so the how AI actually works. So let's say there are three images, right? In my training data set. So uh, this and the Y label is already marked, right? COVID positive, let's say. This is pneumonia, right? So let me just write P pneumonia. And this is normal, let me just write it as N. So let's say out of my 100,000 data set, they, I, I've taken out three images and the X is the image itself, the chest X-ray image. The Y is the, the, the label, whether it's COVID, pneumonia or normal, right? And, and uh, so all of these get converted into mathematical pixel vectors, right? Which I showed you before. And uh, so, so I have my X information here, I have the Y. So what the model does, it learns the exact relationship between X and Y. So what features it use, we can't really tell. In deep learning, you know, it does automatic feature discovery. We just feed the entire image at is it. Now it is able to find the internal mathematical mapping from the X vector to the Y label. So we can't name the feature. These are, uh, if you look at the neural network, 
you know, if you look at the neural network, the intermediate layers are the intermediate feature extraction, which are happening. If you know your neural networks, so the intermediate hidden layers are the, the internal feature vectors, which are being discovered. And these are merely mathematical values. For explanation, we say, well, this represents edges, this represents corners, this represents body parts, but really it's not like that. These are hidden mathematical features and we can't put a label on them. So we can't say which features are pneumonia centric, which features are COVID centric. It, it is, they are just internal mathematical figures. Okay. Uh, the next question is, uh, what's the difference between CNN and ANN? Okay, fair enough. So uh, that's, a, uh, that's a question around the basic ANN, CNN understanding. So in ANN, what happens? ANN is typically a fully connected neural network. So this is around, you know, now deep learning, you know, knowledge. So an ANN is a fully connected neural network, right? All the neurons are connected to all the neurons, right? And these intermediate layers are basically discovering the hidden features, which then uh, translate to the final Y label, right? So we'll run a softmax classifier to assign whether this is COVID or this is normal, something like that. So every layer, every neuron is connected to every neuron in the subsequent layer. In a CNN, this is not the case. In a CNN, only some neurons are connected to some subsequent neurons. And I'll show you that in, in, in terms of an image also shortly. So the reason is we are only interested in proximity intelligence. So this is upper one is CNN where everything is connected to everything. Lower one is, uh, upper one is ANN, lower one is CNN. Only some of the neurons are connected to some of the further neurons. Let me explain in terms of an image. CNN specialize in image processing because images have regional intelligence. So think of this, assume there's a person here with a face, right? Now, so there's a pixel here. So the pixel value itself is the input X feature, right? Pixel one, pixel two, pixel three. Now, this pixel, we want to find how this pixel is influenced by pixels around it. Because we want to discover the features around it, which will lead to the determination that this is an eye. This pixel is not influenced by the pixel here or the pixel here. So why to connect all the neurons? Connect only the proximity neurons because the proximity intelligence drives feature intelligence, right? This is how a CNN beats ANN in lo local uh, proximity feature discovery. Because the, the fact that this is an eye is only determined by the pixels in this neighborhood. And the, what this pixel value is, what this pixel value has no bearing on, on, on the fact or very little bearing on the fact that this is an eye, right? So that's why we only connect some of the neurons to some of the neuron, because what is the input layer in a neural network? It is the pixel one value for an image, pixel two value, pixel three value and so on. So these become uh, the number of pixels are the number of features in respect to that image. And so we only connect partially in a CNN. In a ANN, we connect everything, but ANN will underperform compared to a CNN when trying to do object detection in an image. I hope that roughly answers the question. Yeah. Uh, so the next question uh, is related to cell start. How mm. does a cell start platform compare with Google Auto ML? And then what is the subscription plan? Can the cell start code be run on mobile phone in native form? So there are three different questions here. So Auto ML is just a branch of AI where you do automated machine learning, right? So we don't have auto ML yet, but in future, maybe at some point we'll introduce a, a, a pack. If you see our pack portfolio here, right? So maybe we'll introduce a pack which will have auto ML projects. So far we don't have an auto ML. So we don't have auto ML up till now. And auto ML is just a branch of AI. In fact, we will also have an auto ML pack. So it is not our competitor in any way. We will have packs for everything. We will even have packs for Amazon algorithms, Google algorithm, open AI. So, for us, all of them are, you know, uh, sort of sources of algorithms, which we'll have. Like OpenAI is kind of a loose competitor and OpenAI is a very famous research lab in AI, but we have an OpenAI pack here. So in that way, whoever Hugging Face has APIs, but we'll also have Hugging Face. Already in the NLP and Vision pack, we have Hugging Face algorithms. 
like vision transformers and bird transformer uh, so that's the answer on the auto ml part it's a domain which we'll also work in we haven't gotten to it so there is no comparison in that way uh, it's a different kind of concept and uh, yes uh, we compete with google collab and vertex so google does have a similar system now called vertex ai and do we do compete in that they have a similar system as ours called vertex ai but obviously google will charge you a lot for google cloud so that's where we win our free tier is entirely free and for lifetime and what is the subscription plan so as i said our, we have a we have a, a free tier which is completely free uh, for developers and 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 the free tier is entirely free a very powerful tier we have more than 10000 users on this platform now in 7 months of product launch and more than 10000 or close to 11000 are now using this platform the free tier only and it is very powerful for learning and subscription only when you want to do commercial grade ai deployments then only you need the premium tiers right unlike in google cloud or as aws cloud you'll have to pay for their uh, they'll charge your credit card very quickly once you run out of that initial credits and uh, can self set code be run on mobile phone in native form so yeah so that's i mean it's ml code right so i mean there's nothing like self set code it produces an ml model and it it creates a wait file md5 file right or a pickle file so it, it so it has nothing to do with that being self set style code it's just ml code like any every other system that pickle file or md5 file can be deployed on the edge such as such as your mobile devices uh, you know uh, industrial iot devices or industrial sensors edge computing as we call it right so yes so there is nothing to do uh, saying that okay the model cannot run on mobile phone so uh, actually you know what happens when only when you are doing trainings you need large compute of a of a cloud or a super computer right so let me show you what i'm talking about so you see there are four steps in uh, you know mldl right so the four steps are data preparation data prep so let me just write dp data prep then there is a training step let me just write it as training using the training data set which is normally 80 90% of the available data then there's a test or uh, validation step which is use which uh, test the trained equation or the model so this equation is being fed to the testing step and we test if this equation is correctly predicting the correct y for the test samples if it is doing that then we predict put it in production so actually the cloud computing or high high degree computing is only needed till here when you want to deploy it to production you can deploy it on on as devices like a raspberry pi or you can deploy it on your mobile phone in the localized app and 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 the inference uh, doesn't need that much compute power right so this is called edge computing when you deploy ai on the edge in you know sensors or watches or mobile phones and what not where it doesn't have to do a round trip with a back end server okay let me see the next question here yeah Uh, so, what kind of data set is differentiate between COVID and X-ray? I'm not sure about this question. So, X-ray is the data set Modality. which determines COVID, right? So, X-ray is a is is a very popular and premium sort of primary way. Uh, so, when the doctor is confused if a patient has COVID, they will order either an X-ray scan or a CT scan. So, both of these are good predictor of COVID, right? so normally the radiologist will manually check the x-ray or ct scan and see if it is covid positive or pneumonia positive uh, so uh, so the comparison between covid and x-ray is not correct a covid prediction is done with help of x-ray rather yeah the last question it's on deployment so if we wish to uh, develop a portable embedded system using dedicated processor for any biomedical issues example ecg or eeg diagnosis how should we proceed with ai ml dl models on low end processor on user side so as i said that during training you need cloud capacity right you can use google collab you can have your own azure google cloud or amazon stack you can use self set up whichever system you prefer during training only you need high cloud capacity but during inference the the model can be deployed on lightweight hardware right so that hopefully answers that question that once the model is trained the weights will be deployed as as callable weights uh, for inference purposes in production environment and that production environment could be a sensor a lightweight uh, you know uh, processor during training depending on the amount of data you have and the complexity of your model you will need large compute 
at that point aws google cloud azure cloud are needed or systems like you know google collab or self setup which i just demonstrated or matlab commercial version maybe yeah uh, so the last question i guess uh, how to analyze medical data set like eeg sir and how to remove noisy signal so ai excels in, in anomaly or a data cleaning task also right so uh, so to clean data itself you can apply ai let's say you are getting i don't know how eeg signal looks like let's say it is a kind of a you know a wave some kind of energy wave right i am assuming and so so obviously as i said every kind of data can be discretized and converted into a numerical representation and basically it will become a vector whether it is speech whether it is mp4 mp3 video uh, you know image text anything audio uh, tabular data everything can be converted into a mathematical representation and i don't know that uh, i don't have the knowledge to say what kind of data set an eeg produces but whatever signaling or wave it is it can be converted into a discretized into a mathematical vector and it can be analyzed for ai uh, training an ai model and then be used for prediction in whichever environment you choose to deploy it in yeah maybe quickly what one more question uh, mm -hmm. how to reduce the time complexity for large data sets so time complexity for last uh, large data sets large large yeah okay so uh, you know that is tuning and optimizing your your model right so let's say your model is taking 3 days to train because you are dealing with 1 million images right so that can happen sometimes so you'll have to tune and optimize the model you can also use what we call as transfer learning algorithm so what we do there is a for example i'll give you a prime example so bert transformer algorithm uh, is a transformer algorithm from a company called hugging face and it is already trained on wikipedia which is capturing huge amount of global text right so it has already learned the features of english language because it was trained on entire wikipedia so what we'll do we'll use bert in incremental or transfer learning sense just for our limited uh, our specific uh, contextual data set let's say only 500 images we have sorry 500 textual sentences we have for nlp scenario or text scenario right so we'll use transfer or uh, learning or pre trained models we don't have to reinvent the wheel and train on 1 million textual samples again so that will allow me to reduce the time because i already use there is no need to reinvent the wheel when somebody has already done a, a monumental work on training on a large text corpus or a large image corpus because it has already learned the image features it has already learned the textual features english is english even in your custom case some custom english sentences can be fit for what we call as transfer machine learning or in, or incremental machine learning so we don't nowadays a lot of these problems are solved we don't need to run models for 3 days because i'll use a pre trained model and i just need to run for a couple of minutes and my model is now has incrementally learned my my custom uh, data set also there was another question about removing noise so anomaly detection is also a also a solution so we can remove noise from images uh, or or blurriness in images or videos so anomaly detection and cleaning is also one of the task which ai does we often use ai for cleaning images and videos and other kind of data signals yeah thanks a lot vivek uh, wonderful session and a lot of insights lot of demos and thank you uh, thank you one quick one quick thing for quick help from your side is if you can please uh, share the link of your uh, self start where people can register and use their free version that sure. would be really helpful for our audience they can go and explore so having said this uh, thanks a lot for your wonderful uh, uh, presentation and giving us uh, the insight about many spectrums not only healthcare even other things which we can do using ai ml uh, it was amazing session and uh, audience you can please feel free to reach out to vivek he is really helpful if you want any collaboration or any such kind of help if you are you can just uh, do it yeah that's i definitely agree with uh, ramlinge gowda who says excellent sessions from on each and every session we have lot of interaction and lot of powerful sessions we have and thanks a lot uh, vivek thank you uh, thank you so much yeah. i appreciate it thank you for having yeah. me here yeah so uh, next we'll go to the next speaker and i invite uh, uh, dr purna lata who is uh, chair of uh, mangalore subsection mm.
yeah mango subsection to please introduce our next speaker yeah good evening all uh, i'd like to present mr manjunath maya has this uh, b computer science and master diploma in business administration he works for Center Research Board Phillips in the area of healthcare uh, with about 20 years of experience in IT industry as well. Uh, together with Mahe Manipal, he has built various university industry platform to bring meaningful innovation activities covering collaborative PhD programs, co-creation projects, clinical research and prototype validation, clinical competency training in healthcare also. So established medical imaging research suit at KMC Manipal to drive clinically driven technical innovation in the area of healthcare. Some of his uh, accomplishments are successful exhibit of airdrop system maintenance simulator at Aero India 96 and its success highlighted in Economics Times and Times of India newspapers. He has designed a human machine interface system for GEDC tire to locomotive during this period. He also received excellence wow. for meeting business commitment of the launch of DC evolution locomotives. So with these few words, I present before you, Mr. Manjunath Maya. Okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, is it my audio is audible? Yes, yes, sir. Sir. yes, sir. Okay, yes, sir. but uh, I have some issues with the uh, this one, right? Sharing my screen. Okay, I think right now it is uh, able to uh, allow me also to share the screen. Let me start sharing the screen. Okay, I uh, hope uh, you are able to see my screen, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, good. Okay, good to start. Uh, good evening, everybody. I, and also, like, I just uh, be there for last half an hour. Hopefully, I think you are all uh, immersed with a uh, lot of uh, technology sessions, uh, specifically on the healthcare scenario. So, mine is actually uh, just to you are taking out from this uh, technical session into a uh, my own experience uh, at the Philips. Um, I think just as introduced uh, uh, by uh, Purnalata here and um, because I have been based out of Manipal University, Phyllis has been deputed me to this Manipal University almost uh, 15 years back to drive the healthcare innovation. So this is uh, the uh, it's real experience of what I have been gone through. I just want to share this experience because uh, as you know, um, uh, healthcare uh, is the multidisciplinary uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 this uh, domain. Uh, it is not even if I, I'm coming uh, days, you can realize even from the starting from this uh, end to end, uh, starting from this idea till the product, um, you have to like be involved in the multiple uh, uh, disciplines and the stakeholders uh, ensure that you no know, product is uh, uh, really reach the market in quick time and that is important um, as you uh, i think I, I, as i go through each uh, say, say i think because uh, half an hour is given to me so i will try to share my experience, uh, experience. at the same time i am more interested in this kind of interactions uh, because because of my experience on this uh, multidisciplinary area if anybody would like to uh, like looking for because my experience also looking about the clinical research and validation activities we also done uh, many kind of uh, um, uh, research programs called PhD programs, which is a unique way of uh, doing it in India, I can tell you. And uh, this kind of experience, I just want to ensure in this platform, if people take away this kind of messages, uh, this can be really good for uh, uh, in India because where we find uh, there, is a, uh, there is a drive right now and but how we can make sure that you know, the accelerate that drive of uh, healthcare solution, what we call. Um, so with this, uh, I will just uh, start my session. Um, yeah. So, okay. Let me. First of all, yeah, I have been uh, not been used much on the Zoom is concerned. So, pardon me if there is some kind of technical glitches huh, um, in this uh, uh, sessions. Uh, but otherwise, um, because uh, I saw, I think everybody able to see the uh, my video also and also the screen. Uh, that's what uh, is confirmed. 
so yeah, as you know like uh, many ways it is not only philips uh, uh, many places if you see there is a great innovation exist if it is in the healthcare is concerned um, we do have many such innovations but what is uh, needed at this moment of time how to move them into a market faster better and with more of them more of those innovation how we can reach to the market and that is what uh, the need. so that is what uh, will be driving regarding the uh, you are uh, whatever i call it regarding this uh, um, uh, multidisciplinary platform so again uh, it uh, requires for any healthcare solution we need to looking into the overall aspects of the healthcare value chain what you call them value in the healthcare is uh, determined by addressing the patient particular medical conditions uh, over the full cycle if you see the cycle here it is nothing but the starting from surveillance to prevention screening and diagnostics and treatment and management again this is the and every bit of this kind of uh, care cycle what we call you will be able to um, capture right now the, the, the clinical data uh, which is the center of uh, actually uh, driving force of value of value healthcare uh, when it comes to ai and data is concerned so this is so that's why like it is important for us to like uh, um, um, ensure the care cycle of the disease management uh, should be thought of when you are looking at the any kind of healthcare solution um, is uh, uh, you want to evolve is concerned so that's uh, uh, so right now if the uh, you know that the digital uh, uh, is uh, driving us at uh, this moment of time most of the this technology innovation is under the healthcare continuum uh, what we call the, it is uh, the continuum of healthcare uh, is i just mentioned the previously it is not only just uh, i diagnostic thing what is starting from the uh, starting from surveillance uh, till the ma maintenance uh, of this care cycle um, this um, we should have the continuous uh, kind of uh, digital connectivity and technology innovation along the healthcare continuum and developing again um, coming out with the new business model and financing solutions is also the key driver uh, uh, which is required for the new healthcare solution is uh, concerned and also the most important part of the things it is how to build a strong partnership because it is only the collaborate 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 unless we do this collaboration in the healthcare uh, um, uh, segment um, uh, the solution is uh, not going to happen uh, i think and it is not going to survive also and most of the healthcare i think company will survive in future based on their how exactly their um, partnership will be built how they are going to long term sustain about those partnership and how to build uh, this uh, ecosystem uh, uh, so in that context i will just uh, share some kind of our uh, experience at manipal uh, this is something the slide i just want to make uh, is, uh, exactly the journey um, what we did actually when we uh, because uh, we selected uh, manipal uh, way back in 2004 mainly because it is a multidisciplinary um, uh, institution exist in one place and where we can able to drive the innovation so what we did is we tried to bring all those discipline together in a single platform and started like having the workshop with them identify certain areas of the healthcare area where we would like to start some of the projects if you see here we have done quite a number of it is just a few snippet i have been showing here Uh, but uh, the journey which is uh, driving here we are now uh, like uh, started work uh, the, the new uh, kind of program which we started we called co creation uh, it is nothing but uh, we started developing together um, uh, with healthcare institution at uh, manipal tmc and uh, uh, where we want to co create because the, it is again um, identifying the exactly the uh, need of those healthcare and then started uh, coming out with the right healthcare solution Uh, to for that particular need and ensure no when uh, the partner clinical partner is along with our journey uh, till the till we reach uh, some solution to the market is concerned and that is what uh, 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 the kind of journey which you are having we did a couple of research project which you see uh, kind of one is called a dna methylation project also we called uh, like uh, there is also oral cancer study uh, hplc lif lif uh, setup uh, which is mentioned in the beginning of 2004 uh, where again uh, there is a technology which is developed in the lab, uh, lab laboratory uh, which is uh, well established telling that uh, uh, this technology can be really able to give some signature out of oral cancer but uh, how you can able to at least uh, uh, we can't take some a laboratory equipment to the uh, in the clinical setup so we have to make sure that uh, there is a, a clear uh, minimum viable prototype can be developed and that can be 
um, uh, with the clear uh, ethical consideration, we can able to start uh, evaluating such a product. Uh, in a setup uh, where Manipal itself has got uh, their own uh, kind of uh, dental uh, college, where we are able to test those uh, equipment. This is like, like uh, if you see many of such uh, programs has been developed with the close collaboration with the uh, clinical uh, collaborators. I didn't want to get into the depth of these things, but uh, definitely I will give certain uh, 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 things, uh, certain examples while going through the things. Uh, uh, this is what uh, I told uh, because uh, when we started uh, with the multidisciplinary platform, um, this is what uh, there is more than uh, 250 such ideas has been developed and there are many such kind of prototype has been uh, uh, developed. So here I want to bring it one uh, uh, point because I see here most of the people are in the biomedical and uh, signal processing areas. Especially on the biomedical, I see uh, they have the unique strength uh, because uh, I see um, most of the times uh, uh, we saw always uh, see that uh, biomedical is something left out in the engineering. But uh, I see um, they have the very good uh, unique strength if they we put it into the right ecosystem. Um, in Manipal, we did like uh, the biomedical engineer when he uh, started working together with the healthcare professionals or the any uh, the, in the, with the doctors. He is able to at least acquire that clinical knowledge quickly and coming out with the right uh, solutions. So most of our prototype, if you believe it or not, is has been developed with the biomedical engineers uh, who has been actually able to help us in developing this uh, concept. And because of the their knowledge build up during that uh, concept stage, they are able to absorb in the most of the healthcare industries. And um, so this uh, this is the uh, one uh, I think uh, learn uh, experience which I experienced, uh, I can tell you more than 100 plus such engineers has been uh, trained and they got uh, uh, got into the healthcare industries because of their uh, more clinical domain knowledge. Um, so we, uh, this is uh, because the, once we have build, uh, build up this kind of multidisciplinary platform, we are able to develop uh, such kind of ideas and mature that ideas and uh, also get those ideas into the funding agency in the much uh, uh, much earlier stage because otherwise typically uh, funding agency if you reach to funding and seek me for individuals or some technology institute to go along with the uh, going for the healthcare kind of solution may take long time but if you develop together uh, with them uh, this uh, multidisciplinary team then we can able to reach uh, such a stage much earlier so another uh, important uh, aspect so what we did uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, the lab. Uh, lab is here very unique why I am telling is it is inside the uh, what I call as a hospital uh, which we insisted as a Philips we told that uh, the lab should not be in a technology institute for us. The lab should be inside the hospital because uh, there is a norms uh, in uh, technology domain telling that uh, doctors are not available. Um, for us. Uh, that is actually the norms has been completely ruled out by establishing this kind of problem. Doctors have the time, but only thing, and they have the passion also. Only thing is, uh, uh, they will be like uh, given some kind of free hand to like at least uh, interaction. So this kind of space with inside the hospital, allowing them to like come to a, come and interact with the technologists in a very uh, quick and very rapid and also very continuous kind of uh, things. And that has uh, resulted uh, um, more number of engagement uh, with the Manipal University, the Philips is concerned because um, this ecosystem is, uh, even though it is a very uh, small, we may have some eight different servers or the uh, high-end PCs are available, but uh, this ecosystem has enabled us uh, to uh, drive most of the, our uh, healthcare activities uh, where I told even the PhD program. Um, I, will, I do mention about how exactly this uh, PhD programs in the next slide. Uh, but uh, this is what uh, the very unique uh, kind of thing no, which is uh, happened uh, with the Philips and uh, um, again uh, in this kind of uh, scenario uh, we have like uh, uh, each, each has its own roles to play here. Uh, as a Philips uh, we are a technology company we will do the technology and driving the technology is concerned but if you see the most of the things happening with the uh, KMC or the uh, clinical domain with the identifying the right problem statement and also validation of those problems and solutions. And um, only the and algorithms are sometimes development also they play a key role um, together with the uh, techno technologist, uh, um, whether with the Manipal or with the Philips. So this is the kind of ecosystem uh, which is uh, uh, driving a force for us uh, to on the, um, the uh, this healthcare solution. And because of that, if you see, there are. Uh, uh, I am not updated here. I think there is updated slide because there are more than five such PhD candidates 
there are more competency development kind of activities the more such trainings there are a lot of interns um, which has been uh, got placement uh, in the uh, industries uh, apart from the philips also so um, the ecosystem is uh, really good and uh, i i always prefer like uh, any uh, technology institute should always collaborate with the nearby hospital to ensure that you know, they collaborate together and coming out with a, a lab within the hospital and that is important because the student has to like anybody who who likes it is not the student who who wants passion about the healthcare he should be uh, be there, there in uh, in the system of healthcare at least uh, minimum of 3 to 6 months before he uh, at least uh, um, uh, start identifying the right problem statement for his uh, focus area um unless that happens you know that is uh, the maturity will not be there and uh, we take long time uh, for uh, identifying the maturity for certain problem statement is concerned so again uh, i talk about uh, the area of uh, some of the phd programs um just to give you a couple of examples i will start about uh, mr neurography uh, here we you talk about something on the um, brachial flexors uh, you know there is a orthopedic uh, like there is a um, injury in the shoulder called a brachial and uh, brachial flexus injury which is typically detected by mr scans and um, and typically it is identified in the three chest class scans if you go to any hospitals and uh, uh, talk to radiologists and they will tell that we have 1.5 mr uh, t and chest class mr scan mr mri uh, but um, they, they can't afford for the three chest class especially i can tell you this is almost uh, four five years back and what they told is uh, can i have something like similar to the uh, uh, this one right from pre tesla kind of quality uh, of uh, brachial flexus uh, things in uh, 1.5 tesla this is a challenge which is posed by us and we I, we identified this is the very good problem statement and because in india most of the hospital having this 1.5 mr tesla mri and why can't you develop this uh, new mr sequence uh, for uh, um, uh, identifying this you know, uh, brachial flexus injury optimization what we call the fact is after the 3d uh, mr sequence combined with the motion center uh, uh, pulse and imaging uh, peripheral nerve center in the 1.5 uh, especially uh, the test law in, in 1.5 tesla mri and this is uh, uh, why i'm telling is because this is very unique and uh, in this kind of unique program what we are doing is uh, the guide it is not from technology person the guide is from the uh, is doctor is a, a head of the radiology department uh, is uh, uh, driving this kind of things and technology there is a uh, support from the co guide uh, here so that is that is the very uniqueness of what philips has done because most of this uh, healthcare solution we need to we need we need to ensure this is driven by the doctors uh, then the actually the technologist uh, as per the um, uh, research or any kind of solution is concerned so this uh, that is what uh, we have done many such things if you see each one is very unique the other one is on the uh, predictive labor progress model again uh, low resource settings here also we are looking at uh, uh, some of the uh, signals and identify the how exactly we can uh, come up and uh, return especially the uh, you know that uh, fetal uh, birth or is concerned or it is the uh, labor uh, time uh, how it, uh, um, we need to ensure we can predict the um, uh, labor uh, it is a true labor or the false labor those kind of things again uh, there are something on the ai and data also we are doing um, especially if you see laryngeal cancer uh, machine learning and radiomix features identifying with the uh, ct and other uh, data also we are doing something on uh, head and neck cancer Uh, we also done couple of like um, there is a research we started on the kind of uh, stroke uh, where we used to like kind of volume estimation and um, uh, uh, intracranial emergent large vessel occlusion quantification. Uh, this is again using uh, CT and MR data. Uh, these are the couple because these are all problem statement uh, which I want to insist they came from the uh, clinical clinical domain and we picked up this uh, problem statement. and uh, and then you uh, uh, define those phd programs on each uh, problem statement and this is what uh, uh, the process is concerned um yeah this to like um, there are a couple of solutions i think most of you people uh, know about uh, how exactly uh, philips is uh, i think um, driving these kind of solutions uh, one of the things which you um, also already know so something a door to the room which is nothing but uh, uh the patient exactly you know when they he first identifies and uh, when he get the first uh, treatment uh, that is the door to uh, balloon of care cycle uh, especially when there is a heart attack uh, we call this is the 
um, ACS uh, kind of uh, things. Also, there is, uh, you know, that uh, there is a, uh, typically they called HTMI, HTMI or uh, a myocardial infarction. And the general term, we can call it as a heart attack. And uh, this is again uh, something uh, which Philips has uh, done um, uh, with connecting uh, each one. Uh, that's what I told about the uh, care cycle ap approach, where we like uh, first. You, uh, here we are not for the uh, screening portion, but the once it has been uh, used uh, like uh, this uh, uh, 20D uh, ACG, once it has been, uh, because Philips has got its own uh, um, uh, defibrillator and uh, where it is available uh, in uh, emergency responder and it can transmit this ACG um, wirelessly in, uh, into the hospital and hospital uh, when they receive and they can able to immediately take this patient to the um, uh, um, uh, this one cat lab and then do the uh, kind of uh, immediately because uh, there is also a lot of things are involved in between scheduling those kind of things all has been done uh, by connecting each dot and uh, ensure that you know, the healthcare solution uh, can be found for this uh, heart attack uh, patients and uh, there is a small and uh, this uh, give you as you know this provides uh, the you know, better outcomes for the especially if it is if you see the overall those uh, uh, improved patient outcomes will be there and again uh, for different stakeholders uh, because uh, the stakeholders um, like hospital administration has uh, different benefits he gets the improved revenue cycle and equipment utilization will be more and all those uh, include competition uh, position and also the uh, satisfaction of his staff staff because uh, staff has got empowered with the technology solutions and for the doctor, he's, he is increased job satisfaction and because he's getting the right patient, he will not wasting time on uh, something no, which is uh, unnecessary. It takes his time because that is getting re reduced. And also as a patient, uh, because he got the uh, right uh, treatment at the right time and uh, because of that, uh, uh, it has uh, like, uh, uh, given him the more uh, kind of uh, satisfaction. So again, the cost also will come down. These are some three pillar, four pillar. We typically evaluate whenever there is a healthcare idea or the solution is uh, concerned. Yeah, in Manipal also we did a similar kind of uh, study uh, where we actually what we did. Uh, we'll just go to the next one um, because here, uh, if you see uh, this in uh, Manipal, uh, we do have like we connected uh, this KNC hospital with the uh, five uh, different uh, centers. Uh, not only centers with the hospitals, but also some of the um, government uh, centers, the CSU means the community health centers, and also we connected with the primary health care centers, Ayurvedic clinics, and where all this we given the handheld uh, ECG, and they are able to do the ECG and uh, send that immediate ECG um, yeah, to the Manipal, and where Manipal uh, there is a, a technicians who sits and uh, who uh, at uh, that moment of time it is almost uh, three four years back where the analysis of A and other things to take place. But uh, yeah, we are able to like uh, analyze those things and then uh, immediately report and ensure you know, that uh, patient, if there is a um, serious uh, complications or the cardiac kind of things can be shifted immediately uh, through the um, uh, medical emergency ambulance. And uh, we, do, we, do, we do save almost uh, like uh, uh, it is uh, and three years of patient has been saved. Uh, during uh, um, six uh, months of our uh, final study is concerned. Uh, this is a nice project we have done. And uh, there is also a project uh, which we are uh, um, uh, also working. Um, uh, this is uh, something on, you know, the maternal uh, um, uh, health is concerned, um, where uh, um, especially um, uh, if on the maternal mortality rate is uh, concerned worldwide, how exactly it is, uh, um, it has been now, uh, because uh, what are related is, uh, which is the one still there is a concern here and um, uh, with the India specific also it is something like uh, needs to be I uh, still we are there is a lot of solution but still there is a uh, lot of uh, things needs to be uh, done there and um, typically in the labor uh, period I think uh, I will just uh, see exactly there is a yeah there is one slide I want to show okay no problem uh, but uh, you know that it is uh, uh, the a solution typically required uh, during the uh, labor uh, uh, period where actually this okay yeah. 
uh, where actually the last, uh, last uh, maybe like during the labor progression is concerned, um, uh, the, the decision is to be made. And uh, typically, this is the photograph, uh, is, uh, which is right now uh, is available for the doctor to take a decision. But decision, uh, again, it is uh, right now um, because most of the hospitals, they are in the manual uh, kind of things. Now, because of that, uh, it, uh, yeah, it is the poor outcomes are things. But uh, what uh, we made uh, in this uh, particular scenario is uh, uh, developed uh, yeah, um, uh, a smartphone based, tablet based uh, digital photograph for easy sharing of intrapartum uh, uh, this uh, information and quick analysis. And uh, yeah, uh, just to give you the uh, 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 just to uh, tell you the kind of thing. So, see, if you start to work, uh, talk to the uh, midwife in the working labor room, they, she talks about what is exactly her pain point. That's what we collected. And then uh, if you go and talk to the uh, doctors, uh, senior obstetrician, and uh, um, he or she can able to tell you the, exactly the, um, the current uh, uh, problem exists. Uh, in the labor room, it is typically the nurse has high workload extensive documentation and because of the uh, collection of this, uh, uh, doing this uh, photograph, there is also a lot of uh, I, uh, data collection is required. And this data collection and uh, I think is, uh, is always uh, the time consuming part is concerned. And uh, that's what uh, she is talking about, the solution for easy monitoring for progress of labor with the minimum training. For the doctors, he wants the information. Uh, we, he's talked about the, there is a way to remotely monitor the progress of the labor using photograph in a manner which helped the quick analysis and effective decision making. So with all that kind of things, and we start like developing a simple, uh, 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 especially the based digital cartograph, which can able to uh, collect uh, this data and able to provide the quick analysis and uh, uh, information, uh, which can able to give the right solution. While giving this kind of example is to like, uh, in the healthcare, I think uh, the most uh, uh, critical part is to develop such a solution along with the stakeholders. So then only you can able to identify the right uh, solution which is required in the healthcare segment. So this is again uh, one of the important steps which everybody wants to know about the overall workflow you sh should know about the things. So whenever you develop any kind of uh, uh, develop the idea or any, but you should know about the overall uh, system uh, in the healthcare uh, on the what we call it the workflow scenario. If you under unless you know this kind of things because if you see here there is a uh, starting from the registration initial check for the when the uh, labor comes to a pregnant woman visit the hospital it start from registration and initial checkups and then we the kind of like uh, you know, the high uh, this uh, FHR this heart rate kind of things will be done cervical dilation and uh, all these kind of things will be uh, they will be like uh, understand about this workflow and then you see exactly where exactly your solution will play a role and how exactly this your solution will interact with the other system because that is very much important unless it interacts with the uh, other system only you can able to oh, at least develop the right solution uh, is concerned so this is uh, comes to an, uh, another example which i think uh, uh, solution workflow so mainly like um, uh, this, I will not uh, give you much, but uh, this is very uh, something, the experience which I just want to share uh, because uh, you should, uh, whenever you have an idea, you think you might uh, solve real problem, but you are not entirely sure, you have to find out exactly if it is not. Then valuation of existing product or the ways the problem is currently addressed also if you develop and then a contact, uh, and contact prospective end users uh, because uh, uh, eventually uh, for eventual device or your solution uh, end user must uh, provide the tons of insights on the values you are identifying the right end user at the beginning also is very important for the healthcare solution is and uh, knowing the regulation is very critical uh, which uh, for the medical uh, device for intended to use general purpose uh, what we call that what you claim the device for what uh, what the device does and this, uh, again, you should understand the disease condition uh, that device will diagnose and treat and prevent and cure. And these are all is possible if you have the multiple stakeholders in your team, uh, whenever there is a healthcare solution, I uh, would like to do that. And prepare for a minimal viable uh, MEP, we ought to call that for the medic biomedical experiment is uh, very much required because uh, there we actually experience regarding the uh, various aspects, uh, whether it is the protocol, regulations, data, privacy, ethics, which uh, safety, everything is uh, something uh, which is uh, uh, very, very much required whenever you want to like uh, take that uh, solution onto the market is concerned. 
So again, uh, the design also will play very much a critical role here. And uh, for design also, it is required, required how you uh, work with the end users, uh, end users uh, in this context. So uh, I didn't want to like, uh, I told you, we also done some co-creation aspects. I think there is also some talk uh, right now I, I, in your IEEE today regarding uh, uh, contactless uh, cameras. We also like when Philips has contactless camera, we use this for the COVID kiosk, uh, which is again developed using the multidisciplinary team at both Manipal and uh, uh, Philips together. Uh, uh, right now, like um, we are, we are developed, the, we are in the development stage, stage three and uh, uh, at this moment of time uh, but uh, uh, i i think i i uh, just mentioned regarding the uh, main kind of things to like how you were going to like exactly evaluate those uh, kind of claims and uh, ensure that you no know, those uh, uh, testing of the and validation of those technology um, for the very specific claim claims are uh, necessary for healthcare solution is concerned and again marketing uh, things are very much important so I think with this, uh, because I told like, I would like to have some specific, uh, um, uh, what I mentioned about this, any questions I can take and uh, if anybody has got the right questions, I can answer right now. But otherwise, uh, it is a wonderful opportunity and uh, hope uh, you'll see um, more such a kind of, uh, what I call this um, uh, healthcare solution uh, with the biomedical society uh, working together with the doctors and also like establishing some good, uh, uh, what I call it, a lab inside the hospital for technologies, uh, which can able to drive this healthcare solution. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, sir. It was really amazing session we had. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions which has come over through your presentation. Uh, so one of them is, Okay, one common question which many of them are asking, the, I mean, this is really a perfect example of how uh, an industry can collaborate with academic institute and come up with a lot of innovations which you have been doing for over a decade. So mm -hmm. sir, uh, there are a couple of questions which is repeated saying how to collaborate if, if Philips wanted to come to their campus, how can we do that? Okay, uh, yeah. it is very simple. Like I think I told again, the multidisciplinary. So if there is a technology campus which is looking for uh, Philips collaboration, we want to see how best they are working together with the hospital and um, the, what is the kind of uh, solution or the so ideas which they are able to, uh, right now they are working uh, with their clinical partner. I think that's, that's that inspires us to like uh, talk to the campus uh, because uh, uh, again, um, yeah, we, we are not, uh, we, are, we are right now the solution company. At the same moment of time, I, I beginning of the slide, I think I mentioned, there are many innovations. So, right for us to drive this kind of uh, uh, innovation, it is required how the best we can able to collaborate. For the collaboration, any technology campuses for us, uh, it is how they are going to be able to. If there is a strong collaboration with the clinical partners, I think those uh, institute we are really uh, like uh, looking for such a collaborations, um, which 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 uh, actually is a win-win for us. For us. Uh, it is some solution which is already uh, some kind of preliminary evaluation has been done uh, by the clinical uh, and collaborators. Then that is, uh, I think, uh, the next stage. Uh, Philips is uh, really interested uh, to try those kinds. Yes, sir. Perfectly said. Yeah, we need definitely need uh, doctors and clinician collaboration, especially in this uh, biomedical space. So next yes. question we have is: uh, Please elaborate a bit about computer aided detection for laryngeal cancer that you mentioned in one of your slides. What mm -hmm. kind of data is used and what modeling you have used? Yeah, this is uh, typically like it is an AI based uh, project, um, uh, which is right now working on uh, the things. It, here we used uh, uh, CT um, uh, data, um, uh, which is a CT when they do the uh, CT uh, uh, screen, uh, this one, right, uh, before detection. And this uh, CT has got all the radiomics uh, features and other things. And students here to collect this uh, CT data and do kind of all uh, your AA-based uh, uh, the modeling uh, aspect. They will use uh, uh, because I'm not uh, experts in the AA, but uh, um, if uh, they are if they are really interested, I can they can contact me. I can share a couple of uh, like at least uh, information if, if they really if they are also working on the same area. So we would like to like. Uh, to know more about the, their area also and they can we can also share what we are doing at this moment of time but it is typically the data uh, a, a modeling of uh, laryngeal cancer early detection 
where we want to like uh, because right now i understand that there is no such uh, uh, solution exist and that's what we came to know when when we talked to the um, ent uh, doctors who actually are driving this uh, research and then he told about the who exactly the different uh, workflows which has been done uh, to collect uh, and analyzing the data uh, in the uh, kind of typically the it's about the tumor board session and other things and then uh, we what we are doing right now if you will we use that data to coming out with the uh, real the kind of prediction early detection of this uh, laryngeal cancer yeah. yes sir and uh, the next question is from shiva prasad dr shiva prasad which protocol stack were used for developing application a protocol because they um, see we have the typically the projects have been in different areas uh, it is not that uh, that philips has its own platform or especially if you talk about the an data we have our own research data lake which has got um, and also the federated learning and this has got all tools necessary for us to like able to like uh, drive this ai and data uh, solution and it, which internally has got all the related technology platform uh, which is required so that it can talk to the uh, our, our own devices uh, when uh, when uh, really requires the data and those uh, data even it can uh, talk to the multiple other devices and which will we can uh, use those uh, platform uh, which is called a research data lake uh, which is philips own uh, proprietary uh, data lake which we and work on and whenever there is a uh, collaboration happens we also bring those uh, research data like platform to the our partner institutions we are able to like open up uh, those kind of stacks to the um, uh, uh, to our partners for doing the research yes sir they wanted your email id it would be good if you can put it on the chat window sir yeah yeah sir yeah please ketan Uh, sir actually arun balodi is actually raising his hand oh yeah no, no, no. yeah yeah arun yeah please i'm audible yeah, yeah yeah please thank you so it was uh, wonderful to uh, listen to you sir uh, i have seen all the application that you people have uh, done with the manipal but my question is very simple uh, Manipal is a big setup where you have already mentioned that all the type of things are there, like medical colleges they have, and engineering they have, the researchers are there. We people are like uh, we either uh, not that great setup, and the challenge is uh, as an uh, individual independent uh, researcher in the bi biomedical field particularly, mm -hmm. we face the challenge uh, to tie up with the medical. Uh, opportunities particularly because the biggest challenge in biomedical imaging is to get that uh, ethical clearance from the medical institutes for the data collection mm -hmm. mean uh, being being the alumni of iit i know that uh, we had the mou with the medical uh, hospitals like pgi chandigarh aims mm -hmm. even though it becomes sometimes difficult to get the data because most of the time we used to wait for the problem statement related data because if the statement itself problem is new yeah. we need to wait for the data so uh, is there any possibility like as you mentioned that you all have you have your own database uh, is there any possibility to collaborate with you people uh, to get the data access yeah I'll, i will answer because i understand this is the i think the right problem to be most of us uh, they're facing across or anybody if you go and talk to the technologies that's why i asked about uh, the collaboration is important uh, even for your whatever the solution is uh, you developing want to develop it is required you identify at least the one the clinical if you don't need to require the hospital but you should have the kind of at least one doctors no who at least buy your idea your solution i think you that is i think effort needed from the any individual who passion is to work on the healthcare domain unless uh, you, you not you, you identify that kind of expertise suppose you want to work in the obg area you should have an obg as expert or one doctor with you because he is also passionate about your idea then you have to collaborate with him that is because healthcare is the solution i understand it is it is the collaboration it is not an individual cup of coffee here unless uh, we uh, we open up our idea to the collaborators uh, like our clinicians and he should participation uh, starting from the idea or if it is the proof of, because you told about the ethical committee i see there are uh, there is a specific uh, things called investigator ethical uh, studies which can only happen if the doctor is involved and he can able to as a pi you know he can able to drive and then then he has um, got like uh, getting those kind of ethical clearance for such solutions is possible 
because then uh, because he himself can able to participate in your study and he is one of the collaborator for your uh, particular uh, solution is concerned and regarding the data uh, yeah data is something you know, which is always um, uh, very uh, hot topic right now i think that's why uh, technology has been challenged and now synthetic data something which i think uh, in the world over they are working on to coming out with that challenges na right? because this data privacy and other things will have more challenges uh, whether it to go to europe and even india also they will immediately let me start but uh, the synthetic data can able to generate and give such kind of uh, for the researchers to do some kind of uh, validation kind of things and um, philips uh, but yeah, again philips uh, like we you know there are uh, i even i think i shared my email id i can share one uh, because recently i got one particular uh, site uh, it is a world war site where i think uh, university of i think london some i think they have done wonderful i think uh, ai data database which is a public database and uh, it is a real time one they keep on updating there are lot of collaborators and you see i think thousands of that models also they have been put already thousands i can tell you i think i will share that one and it is open so open source kind of environment and uh, and that will be really good for the researchers uh, who want to do on the medical research is concerned hope this clarifies yeah thank you thank you sir okay. yeah thanks a lot sir yeah uh, this was really amazing session and uh, ketan yeah this is a small token of appreciation virtual one but uh, physical one will send it soon sir to your address oh, thank you. Thank you. yeah thanks a lot for wonderful session sir. yeah okay thank you yeah. and thank the team for giving this opportunity yeah. thank you sir thank you uh, i will take you okay thank you sir thank you yeah so uh, participants uh, thanks a lot we are done with the session today and uh, we still have couple of things to wind up uh, this uh, i didn't know i didn't expect that that uh, entire event will go on such a wonderful way and we had amazing set of speakers and it was really really wonderful to have very good set of speakers more than speakers i am also impressed with the audience the amount of uh, dedication what uh, audience have uh, plus uh, the if we uh, see here uh, we started with almost 120 130 people and we still have most of them intact we almost have 100 people 100 audience uh, uh, here so uh, soon uh, i want to summarize what we have done in one minute uh, is that we started with dr deepa shanai and uh, shailesh who is chair of itp sps and dr deepa shanai chair of itp bangalore section who told about uh, uh, in uh, Who, to, who spoke about importance of this workshop and what are the initiatives then we started with uh, dr pavan kaushik who is uh, uh, from dozi who spoke about the vital sensing device which is a contactless license non intrusive device which they have manufacturing and how uh, what are the analytics they are doing then we had dr shivateja from niramai about x ray c2 and we also had uh, uh, about a uh, wonderful session from many uh, about uh, fire i mean uh, fever fever uh, detection tool and other things especially for covid 19 and then we had manoj sarkar who spoke manoj shankar who spoke about garbage in will be garbage out about machine learning models they are using for pneuma care and then we had shrinivas kudavelli from samsung r&d who spoke about the evolution of 1d 2d 3d to 4d uh, ultrasound images how it was quantified and right now what they are doing and then i took over to talk about some of the tutorial on uh, Uh, biomedical signal and image processing and then later vivek spoke about the cell stat how are they doing it what are the evolution how innovations disruptive innovations are happening in machine learning and deep learning nevertheless end of it we had Dr. manjunath maya who is uh, from philips who spoke about multidisciplinary clinical innovation platform how academia as well as uh, uh, industry can collaborate and set up a wonderful environment with a uh, uh, lot of uh, such uh, amazing uh, things which uh, you saw uh we would also like to thank all the speakers who have been there and uh, uh, uh additional thanks to our sponsor signal processing society as well as dozy health who is our annual sponsor and then of course the speakers we have already thanked and thanks to once again and we had wonderful organizing team uh starting with dr deepa shanai chair and shailesh from sps uh, signal processing society and then you can see and uh, behind uh, this entire work ago i am the front face but i have a wonderful team Chengappa, who is our uh, program chair, he uh, he's from HP, and Ketan Keshav, who was uh, 
uh, showing the slides and who was doing everything. Uh, he's a webmaster and web analyst of IT Bangalore section from Credit B. And of course, Dr. Poonalata, who got Manjunath Maya on board, uh, chair of Bangalore subsection. Dr. Parmesh Achari, who did wonderful publicity and got uh, got us this wonderful audience whom we are seeing today, uh, who are very hyperactive audience, I should say. Thanks, Parmesh Achari. And then we had Dr. Basra Janami, uh, who is the chair of North Karnataka subsection. And you were seeing in the WhatsApp group, we were getting multiple images. That's Naglekar Amish, who's also doing the uh, post, uh, who will be also reporting the entire event, coming up with a white paper we'll be sharing with all of you. And of course, uh, she's working with Kir, uh, Kir USA, uh, software engineer and Rashi, who also helped us as uh, part of ECIM team. This is a wonderful team what we had. So with this, uh, let's have a group photo. And thanks a lot for uh, all your uh, uh, support, especially the audience. I should say you should clap for yourself. There's an emoji of clap. I would say definitely please clap for yourself. It's very important because uh, all of you have really set the record. I mean, first time I'm seeing so much of enthusiasm starting uh, not only now, from start till end, we have such a great enthusiasm from all of you and the wonderful uh, questions what you have asked, even the people all over uh, speakers, they are messaging me saying we had wonderful audience, they had very valid questions. And thanks for engaging for almost uh, five to six hours. With this, I want all of you to open up your cameras and we'll have uh, one group photo. As many of them possible, please have your cameras set up wherever you are you can use the virtual background or yeah it was a wonderful republic day celebration also yeah i can see you you are there everywhere I, I can see people from different different places yeah please switch on your cameras and we'll take a screenshot of that Uh, Chengapa, can you also take a couple of them, please? Yeah, I can see most of you have open cameras. Let me take one more. Yeah, all of you smile, smile to your cameras. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. So last thing which all of us are waiting more than anything. I mean, thanks a lot for wonderful participants. So as a token of appreciation, we want to give the uh, certificates to all of you for attending so long and here is the feedback link which I'll be posting to everyone present here on the chat box. Uh, so use this feedback link and please fill the feedback link and we want to develop a community especially for biomedical engineering uh, for signal and image processing so please uh, stay on WhatsApp we want to grow the WhatsApp group to more people so that uh, you are with us uh, even for longer time. We have PhD students, we have PhD supervisors, we have industry people in the group. So please be intact in the group and we want to bring some different kinds of such forums, especially for biomedical engineers uh, in this country so that we can serve on this Republic Day. With us, thanks a lot. And if you have any questions, we'll stay back for some more time and uh, please fill the feedback form if you have not. Thank you and uh, bye. See you in next Signal Processing Society Forum.